Chapter One of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rachel. Chapter One Writing Herself Out. Emily Bird Starr was alone in her room in the old New Moon farmhouse at Blairwater one stormy night in a february of the olden years before the world turned upside down she was at that moment as perfectly happy as any human being is ever permitted to be aunt elizabeth in consideration of the coldness of the night had allowed her to have a fire in her little fireplace a rare favor it was burning brightly and showering a red golden light over the small immaculate room with its old-time furniture and deep-set wide-silled windows to whose frosted blue-white panes the snowflakes clung in little wreaths it lent depth and mystery to the mirror on the wall which reflected emily as she sat coiled on the ottoman before the fire writing by the light of two tall white candles which were the only approved means of illumination at new moon in a brand new glossy black jimmy book which cousin jimmy had given her that day emily had been very glad to get it for she had filled the one he had given her the preceding autumn and for over a week she had suffered acute pangs of suppression because she could not write in a non-existent diary her diary had become a dominant factor in her young vivid life it had taken the place of certain letters she had written in her childhood to her dead father in which she had been wont to write out her problems and worries for even in the magic years when one is almost fourteen one has problems and worries especially when one is under the strict and well-meant but not over tender governance of an aunt elizabeth murray sometimes emily felt that if it were not for her diary she would have flown into little bits by reason of consuming her own smoke the fat black jimmy book seemed to her like a personal friend and a safe confidant for certain matters which burned for expression and yet were too combustible to be trusted to the ears of any living being now blank books of any sort were not easy to come by at new moon and if it had not been for cousin jimmy emily might never have had one certainly aunt elizabeth would not give her one aunt elizabeth thought emily wasted far too much time over her scribbling nonsense as it was and aunt laura did not dare to go contrary to aunt elizabeth in this more by token that laura herself really thought emily might be better employed aunt laura was a jewel of a woman but certain things were holden from her eyes. Now Cousin Jimmy was never in the least frightened of Aunt Elizabeth, and when the notion occurred to him that Emily probably wanted another blank book, that blank book materialized straight away in defense of Aunt Elizabeth's scornful glances. He had gone to Shrewsbury that very day, in the teeth of the rising storm, for no other reason than to get it. So Emily was happy in her subtle and friendly firelight, while the wind howled and shrieked through the great old trees to the north of New Moon, sent huge spectral wreaths of snow whirling across Cousin Jimmy's famous garden, drifted the sundial completely over, and whistled eerily through the three princesses, as Emily always called the three tall Lombardies in the corner of the garden. I love a storm like this at night when I don't have to go out in it, wrote emily cousin jimmy and i had a splendid evening planning out our garden and choosing our seeds and plants in the catalogue just where the biggest drift is making behind the summer-house we are going to have a bed of pink asters and we are going to give the golden ones who are dreaming under four feet of snow a background of flowering almond i love to plan out summer days like this in the midst of a storm it makes me feel as if I were winning a victory over something ever so much bigger than myself, just because I have a brain and the storm is nothing but blind white force, terrible but blind. I have the same feeling when I sit here cosily by my own dear fire and hear it raging all around me and laugh at it. 
and that is just because over a hundred years ago great-great-grandfather murray built this house and built it well i wonder if a hundred years from now anybody will win a victory over anything because of something i left or did it is an inspiring thought i drew that line of italics before i thought mr carpenter says i use far too many italics he says it is an early victorian obsession and i must strive to cast it off i concluded i would when i looked in the dictionary for it is evidently not a nice thing to be obsessed though it doesn't seem to be quite so bad as to be possessed there i go again but i think the italics are all right this time i read the dictionary for a whole hour till aunt elizabeth got suspicious and suggested that it would be much better for me to be knitting my ribbed stockings she couldn't see exactly why it was wrong for me to be poring over the dictionary but she felt sure it must be because she never wants to do it i love reading the dictionary yes those italics are necessary mr carpenter an ordinary love wouldn't express my feeling at all words are such fascinating things i caught myself at the first syllable that time the very sound of them haunted mystic for example gives me the flash oh dear but i have to italicize the flash it isn't ordinary it's the most extraordinary and wonderful thing in my whole life when it comes i feel as if a door had swung open in a wall before me and given me a glimpse of yes of heaven more italics oh i see why mr carpenter scolds i must break myself of the habit big words are never beautiful incriminating obstreperous international unconstitutional they make me think of those horrible big dahlias and chrysanthemums cousin jimmy took me to see at the exhibition in charlottetown last fall we couldn't see anything lovely in them though some people thought them wonderful cousin jimmy's little yellow mums like pale fairy-like stars shining against the fir copse in the northwest corner of the garden were ten times more beautiful but i am wandering from my subject also a bad habit of mine according to mr carpenter he says i must the italics are his this time learn to concentrate another big word and a very ugly one but i had a good time over that dictionary much better than i had over the ribbed stockings i wish i could have a pair just one pair of silk stockings ilsa has three her father gives her everything she wants now that he has learned to love her but aunt elizabeth says silk stockings are immoral i wonder why any more than silk dresses speaking of silk dresses aunt janey milburn at dairy pond she isn't any relation really but everybody calls her that has made a vow that she will never wear a silk dress until the whole heathen world is converted to christianity that is very fine i wish i could be as good as that but i couldn't i love silk too much it is so rich and sheeny i would like to dress in it all the time and if i could afford to i would though i suppose every time i thought of dear old aunt janey and the unconverted heathen i would feel conscience-stricken however it will be years if ever before i can afford to buy even one silk dress and meanwhile i give some of my egg money every month to missions i have five hens of my own now all descended from the gray pullet perry gave me on my twelfth birthday if ever i can buy that one silk dress i know what it's going to be like not black or brown or navy blue sensible serviceable colors such as new moon murray's always wear oh dear no it is to be of shot silk blue in one light silver in others like a twilight sky glimpsed through a frosted window-pane with a bit of lace foam here and there like those little feathers of snow clinging to my window-pane teddy says he will paint me in it and call it the ice maiden and aunt laura smiles and says sweetly and condescendingly in a way i hate even in dear aunt laura what use would such a dress be to you emily it mightn't be of any use 
but I would feel in it as if it were a part of me, that it grew on me and wasn't just bought and put on. I want one dress like that in my lifetime, and a silk petticoat underneath it, and silk stockings. Elsa has a silk dress now, a bright pink one. Aunt Elizabeth says Dr. Burnley dresses Ilsa far too old and rich for a child, but he wants to make up for all the years he didn't dress her at all. I don't mean she went naked, but she might have as far as Dr. Burnley was concerned. Other people had to see to her clothes. He does everything she wants him to do now, and gives her her own way in everything. Aunt Elizabeth says it is very bad for her, but there are times when I envy Ilsa a little bit. I know it is wicked, but I cannot help it. Dr. Burnley is going to send Elsa to Shrewsbury High School next fall, and after that to Montreal to study elocution. That is why I envy her, not because of the silk dress. I wish Aunt Elizabeth would let me go to Shrewsbury, but I fear she never will. She feels she can't trust me out of her sight because my mother eloped. But she need not be afraid that I will ever elope. I have made up my mind that I will never marry. I shall be wedded to my art. Teddy wants to go to Shrewsbury next fall, but his mother won't let him go either. Not that she's afraid of his eloping, but because she loves him so much she can't part with him. Teddy wants to be an artist, and Mr. Carpenter says he has genius and should have his chance, but everybody is afraid to say anything to Mrs. Kent. She's a little bit of a woman, no taller than I am, really, quiet and shy, and yet everyone is afraid of her. I am dreadfully afraid. I've always known she didn't like me, ever since those days long ago when Elsa and I first went up to the tansy patch to play with Teddy. But now she hates me, I feel sure of it, just because Teddy likes me. She can't bear to have him like anybody or anything but her. She is even jealous of his pictures, so there is not much chance of his getting to Shrewsbury. Perry is going. He hasn't a cent, but he is going to work his way through. That is why he thinks he will go to Shrewsbury in place of Queen's Academy. He thinks it will be easier to get work to do in Shrewsbury, and board is cheaper there. My old beast of an Aunt Tom has a little money, he told me, but she won't give me any of it unless, unless... Then he looked at me significantly. I blushed because I couldn't help it, and then I was furious with myself for blushing, and with Perry, because he referred to something I didn't want to hear about, that time ever so long ago, when his Aunt Tom met me in Lofty John's bush, and nearly frightened me to death by demanding that I promise to marry Perry when we grew up, in which case she would educate him. I never told anybody about it, being ashamed, except Elsa, as she said, The idea of old Aunt Tom aspiring to a Murray for Perry. But then, Ilsa is awfully hard on Perry and quarrels with him half the time over things I only smile at. Perry never likes to be outdone by anyone in anything. When we were at Amy Moore's party last week, her uncle told us a story of some remarkable freak calf he had seen with three legs, and Perry said, Oh, that's nothing to a duck I saw once in Norway. Perry really was in Norway. He used to sail everywhere with his father when he was little. But I don't believe one word about that duck. He wasn't lying. He was just romancing. Dear Mr. Carpenter, I can't get along without italics. Perry's duck had four legs, according to him two where a proper duck's leg should be, and two sprouting from its back. And when it got tired of walking on its ordinary pair, it flopped over on its back and walked on the other pair. Perry told this yarn with a sober face, and everybody laughed, and Amy's uncle said, Go up head, Perry. But Ilsa was furious and wouldn't speak to him all the way home. She said he had made a fool of himself, trying to show off with a silly story like that, and that no gentleman would act so. Perry said, I'm no gentleman yet, only a hired boy, but some day, Miss Elsa, I'll be a finer gentleman than anyone you know. Gentlemen, Elsa said in a nasty voice, have to be born. 
They can't be made, you know. Ilsa has almost given up calling names, as she used to do when she quarrelled with Perry or me, and has taken to saying cruel cutting things. They hurt far worse than the names used to, but I don't really mind them much or long, because I know Ilsa doesn't mean them, and really loves me as much as I love her. But Perry says they stick in his crop. They didn't speak to each other the rest of the way home, but next day Ilsa was at him again about using bad grammar and not standing up when a lady enters the room. Of course you wouldn't be expected to know that, she said in her nastiest voice, but I am sure Mr. Carpenter has done his best to teach you grammar. Perry didn't say one word to Ilsa, but he turned to me. Will you tell me my faults, he said. I don't mind you doing it. It will be you that will have to put up with me when we're grown up, not Ilsa. He said that to make Ilsa angry, but it made me angrier still, for it was an allusion to a forbidden topic. So we neither of us spoke to him for two days, and he said it was a good rest from Ilsa's slams anyway. Perry is not the only one who gets into disgrace at New Moon. I said something silly yesterday evening, which makes me blush to recall it. The ladies' aid met here, and Aunt Elizabeth gave them a supper, and the husbands of the aid came to it. Elsa and I waited on the table, which was set in the kitchen because the dining-room table wasn't long enough. It was exciting at first, and then, when everyone was served, it was a little dull, and I began to compose some poetry in my mind as I stood by the window looking out on the garden. It was so interesting that I soon forgot everything else, until suddenly I heard Aunt Elizabeth say, Emily, very sharply, and then she looked significantly at Mr. Johnson, our new minister. I was confused, and I snatched up the teapot and exclaimed, Oh, Mr. Cup, will you have your Johnson filled? Everybody roared, and Aunt Elizabeth looked disgusted, and Aunt Laura ashamed, and I felt as if I would sink through the floor. I couldn't sleep half the night for thinking over it. The strange thing was that I do believe I felt worse and more ashamed than I would have felt if I had done something really wrong. This is the Murray pride, of course, and I suppose it is very wicked. Sometimes I am afraid Aunt Ruth Dutton is right in her opinion of me after all. No, she isn't. But it is a tradition of New Moon that its women should be equal to any situation and always be graceful and dignified. Now, there was nothing graceful or dignified in asking such a question of the new minister. I am sure he will never see me again without thinking of it, and I will always writhe when I catch his eye upon me. But now that I have written it out in my diary, I don't feel so badly over it. Nothing seems as big or as terrible. Oh, nor as beautiful and grand either, alas, when it is written out as it does when you are thinking or feeling about it. It seems to shrink directly you put it into words. Even the line of poetry I had made just before I asked that absurd question won't seem half as fine when I write it down. Where the velvet feet of darkness softly go. It doesn't. Some bloom seems gone from it. And yet, while I was standing there, behind all those chattering, eating people, and saw darkness stealing so softly over the garden and the hills, like a beautiful woman robed in shadows, with stars for eyes, the flash came, and I forgot everything but that I wanted to put something of the beauty I felt into the words of my poem. When that line came into my mind, it didn't seem to me that I composed it at all. It seemed as if something else were trying to speak through me, and it was that something else that made the line seem wonderful. And now when it is gone, the words seem flat and foolish, and the picture I tried to draw in them not so wonderful after all. Oh, if I could only put things into words as I see them! Mr. Carpenter says, Strive, strive, keep on. Words are your medium. Make them your slaves until they will say for you what you want them to say. That is true, and I do try, but it seems to me there is something beyond words, any words, all words. 
something that always escapes you when you try to grasp it, and yet leaves something in your hand which you wouldn't have had if you hadn't reached for it. I remember one day last fall, when Dean and I walked over the delectable mansion to the woods beyond it, fir woods mostly, but with one corner of splendid old pines. We sat under them, and Dean read Peveril of the Peak and some of Scott's poems to me, and then he looked up into the big plumy boughs and said, The gods are talking in the pines, gods of the old Northland, of the Viking sagas. Star, do you know Emerson's lines? And then he quoted them. I've remembered and loved them ever since. The gods talk in the breath of the wold, they talk in the shaken pine, and they fill the reach of the old seashore with dialogue divine. And the poet who overhears one random word they say is the faded man of men whom the ages must obey. Oh, that random word, that is the something that escapes me. I'm always listening for it. I know I can never hear it. My ear isn't attuned to it but I am sure I hear at times a little faint, far-off echo of it, and it makes me feel a delight that is like pain and a despair of ever being able to translate its beauty into any words I know. Still, it is a pity I made such a goose of myself immediately after that wonderful experience. If I had just floated up behind Mr. Johnson, as velvet-footedly as darkness herself, and poured his tea gracefully from great-grandmother Murray's silver teapot, like my shadow woman, pouring night into the white cup of Blair Valley, Aunt Elizabeth would be far better pleased with me than if I could write the most wonderful poem in the world. Cousin Jimmy is so different. I recited my poem to him this evening, after we had finished with the catalogue, and he thought it was beautiful. He couldn't know how far it fell short of what I had seen in my mind. Cousin Jimmy composes poetry himself. He is very clever in spots, and in other spots, where his brain was hurt when Aunt Elizabeth pushed him into our new moon well, he isn't anything. There's just blankness there. So people call him simple, and Aunt Ruth dares to say he hasn't enough sense to shoe a cap from cream. And yet, if you put all his clever spots together, there isn't anybody in Blairwater has half as much real cleverness as he has, not even Mr. Carpenter. The trouble is, you can't put his clever spots together. There are always those gaps between. But I love Cousin Jimmy, and I'm never in the least afraid of him when his queer spells come on him. Everybody else is, even Aunt Elizabeth, though perhaps it is remorse with her instead of fear except Perry. Perry always brags that he is never afraid of anything, doesn't know what fear is. I think that is very wonderful. I wish I could be so fearless. Mr. Carpenter says fear is a vile thing, and it is at the bottom of almost every wrong and hatred of the world. Cast it out, Jade, he says. Cast it out of your heart. Fear is a confession of weakness. What you fear is stronger than you or you think it is, else you wouldn't be afraid of it. Remember your Emerson. Always do what you're afraid to do. But that is a counsel of perfection, as Dean says, and I don't believe I'll ever be able to attain to it. To be honest, I am afraid of a good many things, but there are only two people in the world I'm truly afraid of. One is Mrs. Kent, and the other is mad Mr. Morrison. I'm terribly afraid of him, and I think almost everyone is. His home is in Derry Pond, but he hardly ever stays there. He roams over the country looking for his lost bride. He was married only a few weeks when his young wife died, many years ago, and he has never been right in his mind since. He insists she is not dead, only lost, and that he will find her some time. He has grown old and bent looking for her, but to him she is still young and fair. He was here one day last summer, but would not come in, just peered into the kitchen wistfully and said, Is Annie here? He was quite gentle that day, but sometimes he is very wild and violent. He declares he always hears Annie calling to him, 
that her voice flits on before him, always before him like my random word. His face is wrinkled and shriveled, and he looks like an old, old monkey. But the thing I hate most about him is his right hand. It is a deep blood red all over, birthmarked. I can't tell why, but that hand fills me with horror. I cannot bear to touch it, and sometimes he laughs to himself very horribly. The only thing he seems to care for is his old black dog that always is with him. They say he will never ask for a bite of food for himself. If people do not offer it to him, he goes hungry, but he will beg for his dog. Oh, I am terribly afraid of him, and I was so glad he didn't come into the house that day. Aunt Elizabeth looked after him as he went away with his long gray hair streaming in the wind, and said, Fairfax Morrison was once a fine, clever young man, with excellent prospects. Well, God's ways are very mysterious. That is why they are interesting, I said. But Aunt Elizabeth frowned and told me not to be irreverent, as she always does when I say anything about God. I wonder why. She won't let Perry and me talk about him either, though Perry is really very much interested in him and wants to find out all about him. Aunt Elizabeth overheard me telling Perry one Sunday afternoon what I thought God was like, and she said it was scandalous. It wasn't. The trouble is, Aunt Elizabeth and I have different gods, that is all. Everybody has a different god, I think. Aunt Ruth's, for instance, is one that punishes her enemies, sends judgments on them. That seems to be about all the use he really is to her. Jim Cosgrain uses his to swear by, but Aunt Janie Milburn walks in the light of her god's countenance every day and shines with it. I have written myself out for tonight, and I am going to bed. I know I have wasted words in this diary, another of my literary faults, according to Mr. Carpenter. You waste words, Jade. You spill them about too lavishly. Economy and restraint, that's what you need. He's right, of course, and in my essays and stories I try to practice what he preaches. But in my diary, which nobody sees but myself, or ever will see until after I'm dead. I like to just let myself go. Emily looked at her candle. It, too, was almost burnt out. She knew she could not have another that night. Aunt Elizabeth's rules were as those of Mede and Persian. She put away her diary in the little right-hand cupboard above the mantel, covered her dying fire, undressed, and blew out her candle. The room slowly filled with the faint ghostly snow light of a night when a full moon is behind the driving storm clouds. And just as Emily was ready to slip into her high black bedstead, a sudden inspiration came, a splendid new idea for a story. For a minute she shivered reluctantly. The room was getting cold, but the idea would not be denied. Emily slipped her hand between the feather tick of her bed and the chaff mattress and produced a half-burned candle secreted there for just such an emergency. It was not, of course, a proper thing to do. But then, I have never pretended, nor ever will pretend, that Emily was a proper child. Books are not written about proper children. They would be so dull nobody would read them. She lighted her candle put on her stockings and a heavy coat, got out another half-filled jimmy book, and began to write by the single uncertain candle which made a pale oasis of light in the shadows of the room. In that oasis Emily wrote, her black head bent over her book, as the hours of night crept away and the other occupants of New Moon slumbered sadly. She grew chill and cramped, but she was quite unconscious of it. Her eyes burned, her cheeks glowed, her words came like troops of obedient genii to the call of her pen. When at last her candle went out with a splutter and a hiss and its little pool of melted tallow, she came back to reality with a sigh and a shiver. It was two by the clock, and she was very tired and very cold, but she had finished her story, and it was the best she had ever written. She crept into her cold nest with a sense of completion and victory, 
born of the working out of her creative impulse, and fell asleep to the lullaby of the waning storm. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two Salad Days Part One This book is not going to be wholly or even mainly made up of extracts from Emily's diary, but by way of linking up matters unimportant enough for a chapter in themselves and yet necessary for a proper understanding of her personality and environment, I am going to include some more of them. Besides, when one has material ready to hand, why not use it? Emily's diary, with all its youthful crudities and italics, really gives a better interpretation of her and her imaginative and introspective mind, in that her fourteenth spring, than any biographer, however sympathetic, could do. So let us take another peep into the yellowed pages of that old Jimmy book, written long ago in the lookout of New Moon. February 15th, 19-something. I have decided that I will write down in this journal, every day, all my good deeds and all my bad ones. I got the idea out of a book, and it appeals to me. I mean to be as honest about it as I can. It will be easy, of course, to write down the good deeds, but not so easy to record the bad ones. I did only one bad thing today, only one thing that I think bad, that is. I was impertinent to Aunt Elizabeth. She thought I took too long washing the dishes. I didn't suppose there was any hurry, and I was composing a story called The Secret of the Mill. Aunt Elizabeth looked at me and then at the clock, and said in her most disagreeable way, Is the snail your sister, Emily? No, snails are no relation to me, I said haughtily. It was not what I said, but the way I said it that was impertinent, and I meant it to be. I was very angry. Sarcastic speeches always aggravate me. Afterwards, I was very sorry that I had been in a temper, but I was sorry because it was foolish and undignified, not because it was wicked so I suppose that was not true repentance. As for my good deeds, I did two today. I saved two little lives. Saucy Sal had caught a poor snowbird, and I took it from her. It flew off quite briskly, and I am sure it felt wonderfully happy. Later on, I went down to the cellar cupboard and found a mouse caught in a trap by its foot. The poor thing lay there, almost exhausted from struggling, with such a look in its black eyes. I couldn't endure it, so I set it free, and it managed to get away quite smartly in spite of its foot. I do not feel sure about this deed. I know it was a good one from the mouse's point of view, but what about Aunt Elizabeth's? This evening Aunt Laura and Aunt Elizabeth read and burned a box full of old letters. They read them aloud and commented on them, while I sat in a corner and knitted my stockings. The letters were very interesting, and I learned a great deal about the Murrays I had never known before. I feel that it is quite wonderful to belong to a family like this. No wonder the Blairwater folks call us the chosen people, though they don't mean it as a compliment. I feel that I must live up to the traditions of my family. I had a long letter from Dean Priest today. He is spending the winter in Algiers. He says he is coming home in April and is going to take rooms with his sister, Mrs. Fred Evans, for the summer. I am so glad. It will be splendid to have him in Blairwater all summer. Nobody ever talks to me as Dean does. He is the nicest and most interesting old person I know. Aunt Elizabeth says he is selfish, as all the priests are. But then she does not like the priests, and she always calls him Jarback, which somehow sets my teeth on edge. One of Dean's shoulders is a little higher than the other, but that is not his fault. I told Aunt Elizabeth once that I wished she would not call my friend that, but she only said, I did not nickname your friend, Emily. His own clan have always called him Jarback. The priests are not noted for delicacy. Teddy had a letter from Dean, too, and a book, The Lives of Great Artists, 
Michelangelo, Raphael, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Titian. He says he dare not let his mother see him reading it. She would burn it. I am sure Teddy could only have his chance. He would be as great an artist as any of them. February 18th, 19-something. I had a lovely time with myself this evening after school, walking on the brook road in Lofty John's bush. The sun was low and creamy, and the snow so white and the shadows so slender and blue. I think there is nothing so beautiful as tree shadows. And when I came out into the garden my own shadow looked so funny, so long that it stretched right across the garden. I immediately made a poem, of which two lines were, If we were as tall as our shadows, how tall our shadows would be. I think there is such a good deal of philosophy in that. Tonight I wrote a story, and Aunt Elizabeth knew what I was doing, and was very much annoyed. She scolded me for wasting time. But it wasn't wasted time. I grew in it. I know I did. And there was something about one of the sentences I liked. I am afraid of the gray wood. That pleased me very much. And white and stately she walked the dark wood like a moonbeam. I think that is rather fine. Yet Mr. Carpenter tells me that whenever I think a thing especially fine, I am to cut it out. But, oh, I can't cut that out, not yet at least. The strange part is that about three months after Mr. Carpenter tells me to cut a thing out, I come round to his point of view and feel ashamed of it. Mr. Carpenter was quite merciless over my essay today. Nothing about it suited him. Three alas is in one paragraph, Emily. One would have been too many in this year of grace. More irresistible! Emily, for heaven's sake, write English. That is unpardonable. It was, too. I saw it for myself, and I felt shame going all over me from head to foot like a red wave. Then, after Mr. Carpenter had penciled almost every sentence and sneered at all my fine phrases and found fault with most of my constructions and told me, I was too fond of putting cleverisms into everything I wrote. He flung my exercise book down, tore at his hair, and said, You write! Jade, get a spoon and learn to cook. Then he strode off, muttering maledictions, not loud but deep. I picked up my poor essay, and didn't feel very badly. I can cook already, and I have learned a thing or two about Mr. Carpenter. The better my essays are, the more he rages over them. This one must have been quite good. But it makes him so angry and impatient to see where I might have made it still better and didn't, through carelessness or laziness or indifference, as he thinks. And he can't tolerate a person who could do better and doesn't. And he wouldn't bother with me at all if he didn't think I may amount to something by and by. Aunt Elizabeth does not approve of Mr. Johnson. She thinks his theology is not sound. He said in his sermon last Sunday that there was some good in Buddhism. He will be saying that there is some good in popery next, said Aunt Elizabeth indignantly at the dinner table. There may be some good in Buddhism. I must ask Dean about it when he comes home. March 2nd, 19-something. We were all at a funeral today, old Mrs. Sarah Paul. I have always liked going to funerals. When I said that, Aunt Elizabeth looked shocked, and Aunt Laura said, Oh, Emily, dear! I rather like to shock Aunt Elizabeth, but I never feel comfortable if I worry Aunt Laura. She's such a darling. So I explained, or tried to explain to. It is sometimes very hard to explain things to Aunt Elizabeth. Funerals are interesting, I said, and humorous, too. I think I only made matters worse by saying that. And yet Aunt Elizabeth knew as well as I did that it was funny to see some of those relatives of Mrs. Paul, who have fought with her and hated her for years, she wasn't amiable if she is dead, sitting there, holding their handkerchiefs to their faces and pretending to cry. I knew quite well what each and every one was thinking in his heart. Jake Paul was wondering if the old harridan had by any chance left him anything in her will, and Alice Paul, who knew she wouldn't get anything, was hoping Jake Paul wouldn't either. That would satisfy her. And Mrs. Charles Paul was wondering how soon it would be decent to do the house over the way she had always wanted it and Mrs. Paul hadn't. And Auntie Min was worrying for fear there wouldn't be enough baked meats, 
for such a mob of fourth cousins that they never expected and didn't want. And Lisette, Paul, was counting the people and feeling vexed because there wasn't as large an attendance as there was at Mrs. Henry Lister's funeral last week. When I told Aunt Laura this, she said gravely, All this may be true, Emily. She knew it was. But somehow it doesn't seem quite right for so young a girl as you to, to, to be able to see these things, in short. However, I can't help seeing them. Darling Aunt Laura is always so sorry for people that she can't see their humorous side. But I saw other things, too. I saw that little Zack Fritz, whom Mrs. Paul adopted and was very kind to, was almost broken-hearted, and I saw that Martha Paul was feeling sorry and ashamed to think of her bitter old quarrel with Mrs. Paul, and I saw that Mrs. Paul's face, that looked so discontented and thwarted in life, looked peaceful and majestic and even beautiful, as if death had satisfied her at last. Yes, funerals are interesting. March 5th, 19-something it is snowing a little tonight. I love to see the snow coming down in slanting lines across the dark trees. I think I did a good deed today. Jason Merrowby was here helping Cousin Jimmy saw wood, and I saw him sneak into the pig house and take a swig from a whiskey bottle. But I did not say one word about it to anyone. That is my good deed. Perhaps I ought to tell Aunt Elizabeth. But if I did, she would never have him again, and he needs all the work he can get for his poor wife's and children's sakes. I find it is not always easy to be sure whether your deeds are good or bad. March 20th, 19-something Yesterday Aunt Elizabeth was very angry because I would not write an obituary poem for old Peter de Geer, who died last week. Mrs. de Geer came here and asked me to do it. I wouldn't. I felt very indignant at such a request. I felt it would be a desecration of my art to do such a thing, though of course I didn't say that to Mrs. de Geer. For one thing it would have hurt her feelings, and for another she wouldn't have had the faintest idea what I meant. Even Aunt Elizabeth hadn't when I told her my reasons for refusing, after Mrs. de Geer had gone. "'You are always writing yards of trash that nobody wants,' she said. I think you might write something that is wanted. It would have pleased poor old Mary de Geer. Desecration of your art, indeed. If you must talk, Emily, why not talk sense? I proceeded to talk sense. Aunt Elizabeth, I said seriously, how could I write that obituary poem for her? I couldn't write an untruthful one to please anybody. And you know yourself that nothing good and truthful could be said about Peter de Geer. Aunt Elizabeth did know it, and it posed her, but she was all the more displeased with me for that. She vexed me so much that I came up to my room and wrote an obituary poem about Peter, just for my own satisfaction. It is certainly great fun to write a truthful obituary of someone you don't like. Not that I disliked Peter de Geer, I just despised him as everybody did. But Aunt Elizabeth had annoyed me, and when I am annoyed I can write very sarcastically and again I felt that something was writing through me, but a very different something from the usual one, a malicious, mocking something that enjoyed making fun of poor, lazy, shiftless, lying, silly, hypocritical old Peter de Geer. Ideas, words, rhymed, all seemed to drop into place while that something chuckled. I thought the poem was so clever that I couldn't resist the temptation to take it to school today and show it to Mr. Carpenter. I thought he would enjoy it, and I think he did, too, in a way. But after he had read it, he laid it down and looked at me. I suppose there is a pleasure in satirizing a failure, he said. Poor old Peter was a failure, and he is dead, and his maker may be merciful to him, but his fellow creatures will not. When I am dead, Emily, will you write like this about me? You have the power. Oh, yes, it's all here. This is very clever." You can paint the weakness and foolishness and wickedness of a character in a way that is positively uncanny in a girl of your age. But is it worth while, Emily? No, no, I said. I was so ashamed and sorry that I wanted to get away and cry. It was terrible to think Mr. Carpenter imagined I would ever write so about him after all he has done for me. 
"'It isn't,' said Mr. Carpenter. "'There is a place for satire. "'There are gangrenes that can only be burned out. "'But leave the burning to the great geniuses. "'It's better to heal than hurt. "'We failures know that.' "'Oh, Mr. Carpenter!' I began. "'I wanted to say he wasn't a failure. "'I wanted to say a hundred things, but he wouldn't let me. "'There, there, we won't talk of it, Emily. "'When I am dead, say, he was a failure, "'and none knew it more truly or felt it more bitterly than himself. "'Be merciful to the failures, Emily. "'Satirize wickedness if you must, but pity weakness.' "'He stalked off then and called school in, I felt wretched ever since, and I won't sleep tonight. But here and now I record this vow most solemnly in my diary. My pen shall heal, not hurt. And I write it in italics, early Victorian or not, because I am tremendously in earnest. I didn't tear that poem up, though. I couldn't. It really was too good to destroy. I put it away in my literary cupboard to read over once in a while for my own enjoyment but I will never show it to anybody. Oh, how I wish I hadn't hurt Mr. Carpenter! April 1st, 19-something Something I heard a visitor in Blairwater say today annoyed me very much. Mr. and Mrs. Alex Sawyer, who live in Charlottetown, were in the post office when I was there. Mrs. Sawyer is very handsome and fashionable and condescending. I heard her say to her husband, how do the natives of this sleepy place continue to live here year in and year out i should go mad nothing ever happens here i would dearly have liked to tell her a few things about blairwater i could have been sarcastic with a vengeance but of course new moon people do not make scenes in public so i contented myself with bowing very coldly when she spoke to me and sweeping past her I heard Mr. Sawyer say, Who is that girl? And Mrs. Sawyer said, She must be that star puss. She has the Murray trick of holding her head all right. The idea of saying nothing ever happens here. Why, things are happening right along. Thrilling things. I think life here is extremely wonderful. We have always so much to laugh and cry and talk about. Look at all the things that have happened in Blairwater in just the last three weeks comedy and tragedy all mixed up together james baxter has suddenly stopped speaking to his wife and nobody knows why she doesn't poor soul and she is breaking her heart about it old adam jillian who hated pretense of any sort died two weeks ago and his last words were see that there isn't any howling and sniffling at my funeral so nobody howled or sniffled nobody wanted to and since he had forbidden it, nobody pretended to. There was never such a cheerful funeral in Blairwater. I've seen weddings that were more melancholy, Ella Bryce's, for instance. What cast a cloud over hers was that she forgot to put on her white slippers when she dressed, and went down to the parlor in a pair of old faded bedroom shoes with holes in the toes. Really, people couldn't have talked more about it if she had gone down without anything on. Poor Ella cried all through the wedding supper about it. Old Robert Scobie and his half-sister have quarreled, after living together for thirty years without a fuss, although she is said to be a very aggravating woman. Nothing she did or said ever provoked Robert into an outburst, but it seems that there was just one doughnut left from supper one evening recently, and Robert is very fond of doughnuts. He put it away in the pantry for a bedtime snack, and when he went to get it he found that Matilda had eaten it. He went into a terrible rage, pulled her nose, called her a she devilish, and ordered her out of his house. She has gone to live with her sister at Derry Pond, and Robert is going to batch it. Neither of them will ever forgive the other, Scobie-like, and neither will ever be happy or contented again. George Lake was walking home from Derry Pond one moonlit evening two weeks ago, and all at once he saw another very black shadow going along beside his on the moonlit snow and there was nothing to cast that shadow he rushed to the nearest house nearly dead with fright and they say he will never be the same man again this is the most dramatic thing that has happened it makes me shiver as i write of it of course george must have been mistaken but he is a truthful man and he doesn't drink 
I don't know what to think about it. Arnimus Scobie is a very mean man, and always buys his wife's hats for her, lest she pay too much for them. They know this in the Shrewsbury stores, and laugh at him. One day last week he was in Jones and McCallum's buying her a hat, and Mr. Jones told him that if he would wear the hat from the store to the station, he would let him have it for nothing. Arminius did. It was a quarter of a mile to the station, and all the small boys in Shrewsbury ran after him and hooted him. But Arnimus didn't care. He had saved three dollars and forty-nine cents. And one evening, right here at New Moon, I dropped a soft-boiled egg on Aunt Elizabeth's second-best cashmere dress. That was a happening. A kingdom might have been upset in Europe, and it wouldn't have made such a commotion at New Moon. So, Mistress Sawyer, you are vastly mistaken. Besides, apart from all happenings, the folks here are interesting in themselves. I don't like everyone, but I find everyone interesting. Miss Maddie Small, who is forty and wears outrageous colors, she wore an old rose dress and a scarlet hat to church all last summer. Old Uncle Reuben Bascombe, who is so lazy that he held an umbrella over himself all one rainy night in bed when the roof began to leak, rather than get out and move the bed. Elder McCloskey, who thought it wouldn't do to say pants in a story he was telling about a missionary at prayer meeting, so always said politely the clothes of his lower parts. Amaza Derry, who carried off four prizes at the exhibition last fall, with vegetables he stole from Ronnie Bascom's field, while Ronnie didn't get one prize. Jimmy Joe Bell, who came here from Derry Pond yesterday to get some lumber to build a hen house for my little dog. Old Luke Elliot, who is such a systematic fiend that he even draws up a schedule of the year on New Year's Day and charts down all the days he means to get drunk on and sticks to it. They're all interesting and amusing and delightful. There, I've proved Mrs. Alex Sawyer to be so completely wrong that I feel quite kindly towards her, even though she did call me a puss. Why don't I like being called a puss, when cats are such nice things? And I like being called pussy. End of Chapter 2, Part 1《Chapter Two, Part Two of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Salad Days, Part Two. April twenty eighth, nineteen something. Two weeks ago, I sent my very best poem, Wind Song, to a magazine in New York, and today it came back with just a little printed slip, saying we regret we cannot use this contribution. I feel dreadfully. I suppose I can't really write anything that is any good. I can. That magazine will be glad to print my pieces some day. I didn't tell Mr. Carpenter I sent it. I wouldn't get any sympathy from him. He says that five years from now will be time enough to begin pestering editors. But I know that some poems I've read in that very magazine were not a bit better than Windsong. I feel more like writing poetry in spring than at any other time. Mr. Carpenter tells me to fight against the urge. He says spring has been responsible for more trash than anything else in the universe of God. Mr. Carpenter's way of talking has a tang to it. May 1st, 19-something. Dean is home. He came to his sister's yesterday, and this evening he was here, and we walked in the garden, up and down the sundial walk, and talked. It was splendid to have him back, with his mysterious green eyes and his nice mouth. We had a long conversation. We talked of Algiers, and the transmigration of souls, and of being cremated, and of profiles. Dean says I have a good profile. Pure Greek. I always like Dean's compliments. Star a morning! How you have grown, he said. I left child last autumn, and I find a woman. I will be fourteen in three weeks, and I am tall for my age. Dean seems to be glad of this, quite unlike Aunt Laura, who always sighs when she lengthens my dresses and thinks children grow up too fast. So goes time by, I said, quoting the motto on the sundial and feeling quite sophisticated. You are almost as tall as I am, he said and then added bitterly, 
to be sure jarback priest is of no very stately height i have always shrunk from referring to his shoulder in any way but now i said dean please don't sneer at yourself like that not with me at least i never think of you as jarback dean took my hand and looked right into my eyes as if he were trying to read my very soul are you sure of that emily don't you often wish that i wasn't lame and crooked for your sake i do i answered but as far as i am concerned it doesn't make a bit of difference and never will and never will dean repeated the words emphatically if i were sure of that emily if i were only sure of that you can be sure of it i declared quite warmly i was vexed because he seemed to doubt it and yet something in his expression made me feel a little uncomfortable it suddenly made me think of the time he rescued me from the cliff on malvern bay and told me my life belonged to him since he had saved it i don't like the thought of my life belonging to any one but myself not any one even dean much as i like him and in some ways i like dean better than any one in the world when it got darker the stars came out and we studied them through dean's splendid new field glasses it was very fascinating dean knows all about the stars it seems to me he knows all about everything but when i said so he said there is one secret i do not know i would give everything else i do know for it one secret perhaps i shall never know it the way to win the way to win what i asked curiously my heart's desire said dean dreamily looking at a shimmering star that seemed to be hung on the very tip of one of the three princesses it seems now as desirable and unobtainable as that gem-like star emily but who knows i wonder what it is dean wants so much may fourth nineteen something dean brought me a lovely portfolio from paris and i have copied my favorite verse from the fringed gentian on the inside of the cover i will read it over every day and remember my vow to climb the alpine path i begin to see that i will have to do a good bit of scrambling though i once expected i think to soar right up to that far-off goal on shining wings mr carpenter has banished that fond dream dig in your toes and hang on with your teeth that's the only way he says last night in bed i thought out some lovely titles for the books i'm going to write in the future a lady of high degree true to faith and vow o oh, rare pale margaret i got that from tennyson the case of vere de vere ditto and a kingdom by the sea now if i can only get ideas to match the titles i am writing a story called the house among the rowans also a very good title i think but the love talk still bothers me everything of the kind i write seems so stiff and silly the minute i write it down that it infuriates me i asked dean if he could teach me how to write it properly because he promised long ago that he would but he said i was too young yet he said that in a mysterious way of his which always seems to convey the idea that there is so much more in his words than the mere sound of them expresses i wish i could speak so significantly because it makes you so very interesting this evening after school dean and i began to read the alhambra over again sitting on the stone bench in the garden that book always makes me feel as if i had opened a little door and stepped straight into fairyland how i would love to see the alhambra i said we will go to see it some time together said dean oh that would be lovely i cried do you think we can ever manage it dean before dean could answer i heard teddy's whistle in lofty john's bush the dear little whistle of two short high notes and one long low one that is our signal excuse me i must go teddy's calling me i said must you always go when teddy calls asked dean i nodded and explained he only calls like that when he wants me especially, and I have promised I will always go if I possibly can. "'I want you especially,' said Dean. "'I came up this evening on purpose to read the Alhambra with you.' Suddenly I felt very unhappy. I wanted to stay with Dean dreadfully, and yet I felt as if I must go to Teddy. Dean looked at me piercingly. Then he shut up the Alhambra. 
Go, he said. I went, but things seemed spoiled somehow. May 10th, 19-something I have been reading three books Dean lent me this week. One was like a rose garden, very pleasant but just a little too sweet. And one was like a pine wood on a mountain, full of balsam and tang. I loved it, and yet it filled me with a sort of despair. It was written so beautifully. I can never write like that, I feel sure. Edward, it was just like a pigsty. Dean gave me that one by mistake. He was very angry with himself when he found it out, angry and distressed. Star, star, I would never have given you a book like that, my confounded carelessness. Forgive me. That book is a faithful picture of one world, but not your world, thank God, or any world you will ever be a citizen of. Star, promise me you will forget that book. I'll forget it if I can, I said. But I don't know if I can. It was so ugly. I have not been so happy since I read it. I feel as if my hands were soiled somehow, and I couldn't wash them clean. And I have another queer feeling, as if some gate had been shut behind me, shutting me into a new world I don't quite understand or like, but through which I must travel. Tonight I tried to write a description of Dean in my Jimmy book of character sketches, but I didn't succeed. What I wrote seemed like a photograph, not a portrait. There is something in Dean that is beyond me. Dean took a picture of me the other day with his new camera, but he wasn't pleased with it. It doesn't look like you, he said, but of course one can never photograph starlight. Then he added, quite sharply, I thought, tell that young imp of a Teddy Kent to keep your face out of his pictures. He has no business to put you in every one he draws. He doesn't, I cried. Why, Teddy never made but the one picture of me, the one Aunt Nancy stole. I said it quite viciously and unashamed, for I've never forgiven Aunt Nancy for keeping that picture. He's got something of you in every picture, said Dean stubbornly. Your eyes, the curve of your neck, the tilt of your head, your personality. That's the worst. I don't mind your eyes and curves so much, but I won't have that cub putting a bit of your soul into everything he draws. Probably he doesn't know he's doing it, which makes it all the worse. I don't understand you, I said, quite haughtily. But Teddy is wonderful. Mr. Carpenter says so. And Emily of New Moon echoes it. Oh, the kid has talent. He'll do something some day if his morbid mother doesn't ruin his life. But let him keep his pencil and brush off my property. Dean laughed as he said it. But I held my head high. I am not anybody's property, not even in fun. And I never will be. May 12th, 19-something. Aunt Ruth and Uncle Wallace and Uncle Oliver were all here this afternoon. I like Uncle Oliver, but I am not much fonder of Aunt Ruth and Uncle Wallace than I ever was. They held some kind of family conclave in the parlor with Aunt Elizabeth and Aunt Laura. Cousin Jimmy was allowed in, but I was excluded, although I feel perfectly certain that it had something to do with me. I think Aunt Ruth didn't get her own way either, for she snubbed me continually all through supper, and said I was growing weedy. Aunt Ruth generally snubs me, and Uncle Wallace patronizes me. I prefer Aunt Ruth's snubs because I don't have to look as if I liked them. I endured them to a certain point, and then the lid flew off. Aunt Ruth said to me, Emily, don't contradict, just as she might have spoken to a mere child. I looked her right in the eyes and said coldly, Aunt Ruth, I think I am too old to be spoken to in that fashion now. You are not too old to be very rude and impertinent, said Aunt Ruth with a sniff, and if I were in Elizabeth's place, I would give you a sound box on the ear, miss. I hate to be emlied and missed and sniffed at. It seems to me that Aunt Ruth has all the Murray faults and none of their virtues. Uncle Oliver's son Andrew came with him and is going to stay for a week. He is four years older than I am. May 19th, 19-something. This is my birthday. I am 14 years old today. I wrote a letter from myself at fourteen to myself at twenty-four, sealed it up and put it away in my cupboard to be opened on my twenty-fourth birthday. I made some predictions in it. I wonder if they will have come to pass when I open it. Aunt Elizabeth gave me back all Father's books today. I was so glad. It seems to me that a part of Father is in those books. 
His name is in each one in his own handwriting, and the notes he made on the margins. They seem like little bits of letters from him. I have been looking over them all the evening, and father seems so near to me again, and I feel both happy and sad. One thing spoiled the day for me. In school, when I went up to the blackboard to work at a problem, everybody suddenly began to titter. I could not imagine why. Then I discovered that someone had pinned a sheet of foolscap to my back, on which was printed in big black letters, Emily Bird Star, authoress of The Four-Legged Duck. They laughed more than ever when I snatched it off and threw it in the coal scuttle. It infuriates me when anyone ridicules my ambitions like that. I came home angry and sore. But when I had sat on the steps of the summer house and looked at one of Cousin Jimmy's big purple pansies for five minutes, all my anger went away. Nobody can keep on being angry if she looks into the heart of a pansy for a little while. Besides, the time will come when they will not laugh at me. Andrew went home yesterday. Aunt Elizabeth asked me how I liked him. She never asked me how I liked anyone before. My likings were not important enough. I suppose she is beginning to realize that I am no longer a child. I said I thought he was good and kind and stupid and uninteresting. Aunt Elizabeth was so annoyed she would not speak to me the whole evening. Why? I had to tell the truth. And Andrew is. May 21, 19 something. Old Kelly was here today for the first time this spring with a load of shining new tins. He brought me a bag of candies as usual and teased me about getting married also as usual. But he seemed to have something on his mind and when I went to the dairy to get him the drink of milk he had asked for, he followed me. Girl, dear, he said mysteriously. I met Jarback Priest in the lane. Does he be coming here much? I cocked my head at the Murray angle. If you mean Mr. Dean Priest, I said, he comes often. He is a particular friend of mine. Old Kelly shook his head. Girl, dear, I warned ye, never be after saying I didn't warn ye. I told ye the day I took ye to Priest Pond never to marry a priest. Didn't I now? Mr. Kelly, you're too ridiculous, I said, angry, and yet feeling it was absurd to be angry with old Jock Kelly. I'm not going to marry anybody. Mr. Priest is old enough to be my father, and I am just a little girl he helps in her studies. Old Kelly gave his head another shake. I know the priests, girl, dear, and when they do be after setting their minds on a thing, ye might as well try to turn the wind. This Jarback now, they tell me he's had his eye on ye ever since he fished ye up from the Malvern Rocks. He's just biding his time till ye get old enough for courting. They tell me he's an infidel, and it's well known that when he was being christened he reached up and clawed the spectacles off of the minister. So what would ye expect? I needn't be telling ye he's lame and crooked. Ye can see that for yourself. Take foolish old Kelly's advice and cut loose all this time. Now don't be looking at me like the Murray's girl, dear. Sure, and it's for your own good I do be spakin'. I walked off and left him. One couldn't argue with him over such a thing. I wish people wouldn't put such ideas into my mind. They stick there like burrs. I won't feel as comfortable with Dean for weeks now, though I know perfectly well every word old Kelly said was nonsense. After old Kelly went away, I came up to my room and wrote a full description of him in a jimmy book. Elsa has got a new hat trimmed with clouds of blue tulle and red cherries, with big blue tulle bows under the chin. I did not like it and told her so. She was furious, and said I was jealous, and hasn't spoken to me for two days. I thought it all over. I knew I was not jealous, but I concluded I had made a mistake. I will never again tell anyone a thing like that. It was true, but it was not tactful. I hope Ilsa will have forgiven me by tomorrow. I miss her horribly when she is offended with me. She is such a dear thing, and so jolly and splendid when she isn't vexed. Teddy is a little squiffy with me, too, just now. I think it is because Geoff North walked home with me from prayer meeting last Wednesday night. I hope that is the reason. I like to feel that I have that much power over Teddy. I wonder if I ought to have written that down. But it's true. If Teddy only knew it, I have been very unhappy and ashamed over that affair. At first, when Geoff singled me out from all the girls, I was quite proud of it. It was the very first time I had had an escort home, 
and Geoff is a town boy, very handsome and polished, and all the older girls in Blairwater are quite foolish about him. So I sailed away from the church door with him, feeling as if I had grown up all at once. But we hadn't gone far before I was hating him. He was so condescending. He seemed to think I was a simple little country girl who must be quite overwhelmed with the honor of his company. And that was true at first. That was what stung me, to think I had been such a little fool. He kept saying, Really, you surprise me, in an affected, drawling kind of way, whenever I made a remark. And he bored me. He couldn't talk sensibly about anything, or else he wouldn't try to with me. I was quite savage by the time we got to New Moon, and then that insufferable creature asked me to kiss him. I drew myself up. Oh, I was Murray clear through at that moment, all right. I felt I was looking exactly like Aunt Elizabeth. I do not kiss young men, I said disdainfully. G.F. laughed and caught my hand. Why, you little goose, what do you suppose I came home with you for, he said. I pulled my hand away from him and walked into the house. But before I did that, I did something else. I slapped his face. Then I came up to my room and cried with shame over being insulted, and having been so undignified in resenting it. Dignity is a tradition of new moon, and I felt that I had been false to it. But I think I surprised G.F. North in right good earnest. May 24th, 19-something Jenny Strang told me today that G.F. North told her brother, that I was a regular spitfire, and he had had enough of me. Aunt Elizabeth has found out that G.F. came home with me, and told me today that I would not be trusted to go alone to prayer meeting again. May 25th, 19-something. I'm sitting here in my room at twilight. The window is open, and the frogs are singing of something that happened very long ago. All along the middle garden walk the gay folk are holding up great fluted cups of ruby and gold and pearl. It is not raining now, but it rained all day, a rain scented with lilacs. I like all kinds of weather, and I like rainy days. Soft, misty, rainy days, when the wind-woman just shakes the tops of the spruces gently, and wild, tempestuous, streaming rainy days. I like being shut in by the rain. I like to hear it thudding on the roof, and beating on the panes, and pouring off the eaves, while the wind-woman skirls like a mad old witch in the woods and through the garden. Still, if it rains when I want to go anywhere, I growl just as much as anybody. An evening like this always makes me think of that spring father died three years ago, and that dear little old house down at Maywood. I've never been back since. I wonder if anyone is living in it now and if Adam and Eve and the rooster pine and the praying tree are just the same, and who is sleeping in my old room there, and if any one is loving the little birches and playing with the wind woman in the spruce barrens. Just as I wrote the word spruce barrens, an old memory came back to me. One spring evening, when I was eight years old, I was running about the barrens playing hide-and-seek with the wind woman, and I found a little hollow between two spruces, that was just carpeted with tiny bright green leaves, when everything else was still brown and faded. They were so beautiful that the flash came as I looked at them. It was the very first time it ever came to me. I suppose that is why I remember those little green leaves so distinctly. No one else remembers them, perhaps no one else ever saw them. I have forgotten other leaves, but I remember them every spring, and with each remembrance I feel again the wonder moment they gave me. End of chapter 2, part 2 Chapter 3, part 1 of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3, In the Watches of the Night, part 1 some of us can recall the exact time in which we reached certain milestones on life's road, the wonderful hour when we passed from childhood to girlhood, the enchanted, beautiful, or perhaps the shattering and horrible, hour when girlhood was suddenly womanhood, the chilling hour when we faced the fact that youth was definitely behind us, 
the peaceful, sorrowful hour of the realization of age. Emily Starr never forgot the night when she passed the first milestone, and left childhood behind her forever. Every experience enriches life, and the deeper such an experience, the greater the richness it brings. That night of horror and mystery and strange delight ripened her mind and heart like the passage of years. It was a night early in July. The day had been one of intense heat. Aunt Elizabeth had suffered so much from it that she had decided she would not go to prayer meeting. Aunt Laura and Cousin Jimmy and Emily went. Before leaving, Emily asked and obtained Aunt Elizabeth's permission to go home with Elsa Burnley after meeting, to spend the night. This was a rare treat. Aunt Elizabeth did not at all approve of all-night absences as a general thing. But Dr. Burnley had to be away, and his housekeeper was temporarily laid up with a broken ankle. Ilsa had asked Emily to come over for the night, and Emily was to be permitted to go. Ilsa did not know this, hardly hoped for it, in fact, but was to be informed at prayer meeting. If Ilsa had not been late, Emily would have told her before meeting went in, and the mischances of the night would probably have been averted. But Ilsa, as usual, was late, and everything else followed in course. Emily sat in the Murray pew near the top of the church by the window that looked out into the grove of fir and maple that surrounded the little white church. This prayer meeting was not the ordinary weekly sprinkling of a faithful few. It was a special meeting, held in view of the approaching Communion Sunday, and the speaker was not young, earnest Mr. Johnson, to whom Emily always liked to listen, in spite of her blunder at the ladies' aid supper, but an itinerant evangelist lent by Shrewsbury for one night. His fame brought out a church full of people, but most of the audience declared afterwards they would much rather have heard their own Mr. Johnson. Emily looked at him with her level, critical gaze, and decided that he was oily and unspiritual. She heard him through a prayer and thought, "'Giving God good advice and abusing the devil isn't praying.' She listened to his discourse for a few minutes, and made up her mind that he was blatant and illogical and sensational, and then proceeded, coolly, to shut mind and ears to him and disappear into dreamland, something which she could generally do at will when anxious to escape from discordant realities. Outside moonlight was still sifting in a rain of silver through the firs and maples, though an ominous bank of cloud was making up in the northwest and repeated rumblings of thunder came on the silent air of the hot summer night, a windless night for the most part, though occasionally a sudden breath that seemed more like sigh than a breeze brushed through the trees and set their shadows dancing in weird companies. There was something strange about the night in its mingling of placid accustomed beauty with the omens of rising storm that intrigued Emily, and she spent half the time of the evangelist's address in composing a mental description of it for her jimmy book. The rest of the time she studied such of the audience as were within her range of vision. This was something Emily never wearied of, in public assemblages, and the older she grew the more she liked it. It was fascinating to study those varied faces, and speculate on the histories written in mysterious hieroglyphics over them. They had all their inner secret lives, those men and women, known to no one but themselves and God. Others could only guess at them, and Emily loved this game of guessing. At times it seemed veritably to her that it was more than guessing, that in some intense moments she could pass into their souls and read therein hidden motives and passions that were, perhaps, a mystery even to their possessors. It was never easy for Emily to resist the temptation to do this when the power came, although she never yielded to it without an uneasy feeling that she was committing trespass. It was quite a different thing from soaring on the wings of fancy into an ideal world of creation, quite different from the exquisite unearthly beauty of the flash. Neither of these gave her any moments of pause or doubt. But to slip on tiptoe through some momentarily unlatched door, as it were, and catch a glimpse of masked, unuttered, unutterable things in the hearts and souls of others was something that always brought, along with its sense of power, a sense of the forbidden, a sense even of sacrilege. Yet Emily did not know if she would ever be able to resist the allure of it. She had always peered through the door and seen the things before she realized that she was doing it. They were nearly always terrible things, 
Secrets are generally terrible. Beauty is not often hidden, only ugliness and deformity. Elder Forsyth would have been a persecutor in old times, she thought. He has the face of one. This very minute he is loving the preacher because he is describing hell, and Elder Forsyth thinks all his enemies will go there. Yes, that is why he is looking pleased. I think Mrs. Bowes flies off on a broomstick a nights. She looks it. Four hundred years ago she would have been a witch, and Elder Forsyth would have burned her at the stake. She hates everybody. It must be terrible to hate everybody, to have your soul full of hatred. I must try to describe such a person in my Jimmy book. I wonder if hate has driven all love out of her soul, or if there is a little bit left in it for any one or anything. If there is, it might save her. That would be a good idea for a story. I must jot it down before I go to bed. I'll borrow a bit of paper from Ilsa. No, here's a bit in my hymn book. I'll write it now. I wonder what all these people would say if they were suddenly asked what they wanted most, and had to answer truthfully. I wonder how many of these husbands and wives would like a change. Chris Farrar and Mrs. Chris would. Everybody knows that. I can't think why I feel so sure that James Beatty and his wife would, too. They seem to be quite contented with each other. But once I saw her look at him when she did not know anyone was watching. Oh, it seemed to me that I saw right into her soul, through her eyes, and she hated him and feared him. She is sitting there now beside him, little and thin and dowdy, and her face is gray and her hair is faded but she herself is one red flame of rebellion. What she wants most is to be free from him, or just to strike back once. That would satisfy her. There's Dean. I wonder what brought him to prayer meeting. His face is very solemn, but his eyes are mocking Mr. Sampson. What's that Mr. Sampson saying? Oh, something about the wise virgins. I hate the wise virgins. I think they were horribly selfish. They might have given the poor foolish ones a little oil. I don't believe Jesus meant to praise them any more than he meant to praise the unjust steward. I think he was just trying to warn foolish people that they must not be careless and foolish, because if they were, prudent, selfish folks would never help them out. I wonder if it's very wicked to feel that I'd rather be outside with the foolish ones trying to help and comfort them than inside feasting with the wise ones. It would be more interesting, too. There is Mrs. Kent and Teddy. Oh, she wants something terribly. I don't know what it is, but it's something she can never get, and the hunger for it goads her night and day. That is why she holds Teddy so closely, I know. But I don't know what it is that makes her so different from other women. I can never get a peep into her soul. She shuts everyone out. The door is never unlatched. What do I want most? It is to climb the alpine path to the very top, and write upon its shining scroll a woman's humble name. We're all hungry. We all want some bread of life, but Mr. Sampson can't give it to us. I wonder what he wants most. His soul is so muggy I can't see into it. He has a lot of sordid wants. He doesn't want anything enough to dominate him. Mr. Johnson wants to help people and preach truth. He really does. And Aunt Janey wants most of all to see the whole heathen world Christianized. Her soul hasn't any dark wishes in it. I know what Mr. Carpenter wants, his one lost chance again. Catherine Morris wants her youth back. She hates us younger girls because we are young. Old Malcolm Strang just wants to live, just one more year, always just one more year, just to live, just not to die. It must be horrible to have nothing to live for except just to escape dying. Yet he believes in heaven. He thinks he will go there. If he could see my flash just once, he wouldn't hate the thought of dying so, poor old man. And Mary Strang wants to die, before something terrible she is afraid of tortures her to death. They say it's cancer. There's mad Mr. Morrison up in the gallery. We all know what he wants, to find his Annie. Tom Sibley wants the moon, I think, and knows he can never get it. That's why people say he's not all there. Amy Crabb wants Max Terry to come back to her. Nothing else matters to her. I must write all these things down in my Jimmy book tomorrow. They are fascinating. But after all, I think I like writing of beautiful things better. Only these things have a tang beautiful things don't have in some way. Those woods out there, 
How wonderful they are in their silver and shadow! The moonlight is doing strange things to the tombstones. It makes even the ugly ones beautiful. But it's terribly hot. It is smothering here, and those thunder growls are coming near. I hope Ilsa and I will get home before the storm breaks. Oh, Mr. Samson, Mr. Samson, God isn't an angry God. You don't know anything about him if you say that. He's sorrowful, I'm sure, when we're foolish and wicked, but he doesn't fly into tantrums. Your God and Ellen Green's God are exactly alike. I'd like to get up and tell you so, but it isn't a Murray tradition to sass back in church. You make God ugly, and he's beautiful. I hate you for making God ugly, you fat little man. Whereupon Mr. Sampson, who had several times noticed Emily's intent, probing gaze, and thought he was impressing her tremendously with a sense of her unsaved condition, finished with a final urgent whoop of entreaty, and sat down. The audience, in the close, oppressive atmosphere of the crowded, lamp-lit church, gave an audible sigh of relief, and scarcely waited for the hymn and benediction before crowding out to purer air. Emily, caught in the current and parted from Aunt Laura, was swept out by way of the choir door to the left of the pulpit. It was some time before she could disentangle herself from the throng and hurry around to the front, where she expected to meet Ilsa. Here was another dense, though rapidly thinning crowd, in which she found no trace of Ilsa. Suddenly Emily noticed that she did not have her hymn-book. Hastily she dashed back to the choir door. She must have left her hymn-book in the pew, and it would never do to leave it there. In it she had placed for safekeeping a slip of paper on which she had furtively jotted down some fragmentary notes during the last hymn, a rather biting description of scrawny Miss Potter in the choir, a couple of satiric sentences regarding Mr. Sampson himself, and a few random fancies which she had desired most of all to hide, because there was in them something of dream and vision which would have made the reading of them by alien eyes a sacrilege. Old Jacob Banks, the sexton, a little blind and more than a little deaf, was turning out the lamps as she went in. He had reached the two on the wall behind the pulpit. Emily caught her hymn-book from the rack. Her slip of paper was not in it. By the faint gleam of light, as Jacob Banks turned out the last lamp, she saw it on the floor, under the seat of the pew in front. She kneeled down and reached after it. As she did so, Jacob went out and locked the choir door. Emily did not notice his going. The church was still faintly illuminated by the moon that as yet outrode the rapidly climbing thunderheads. That was not the right slip of paper after all. Where could it be? Oh, here at last. She caught it up and ran to the door which would not open. End of chapter 3, part 1《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》《ハッピーバースデ As she did so, she heard the last buggy turn grindingly at the gate and drive away. At the same time the moon was suddenly swallowed up by the black clouds, and the church was engulfed in darkness, close, hot, smothering, almost tangible darkness. Emily screamed in sudden panic, beat on the door, frantically twisted the handle, screamed again. Oh, everybody could not have gone. Surely somebody would hear her. Aunt Laura! Cousin Jimmy! Elsa! Then finally, in a wail of despair, Oh, Teddy! Teddy! A blue white stream of lightning swept the porch, followed by a crash of thunder. One of the worst storms in Blairwater Annals had begun, and Emily Starr was locked alone in the dark church in the maple woods, she who had always been afraid of thunderstorms with a reasonless, instinctive fear which she could never banish and only partially control. She sank, quivering, on a step of the galley stairs, and huddled there in a heap. Surely someone would come back when it was discovered she was missing. But would it be discovered? Who would miss her? Aunt Laura and Cousin Jimmy would suppose she was with Elsa, as had been arranged. Elsa, who had evidently gone, believing that Emily was not coming with her, would suppose that she had gone home to New Moon. 
Nobody knew where she was, nobody would come back for her. She must stay here in this horrible, lonely, black, echoing place, for now the church she knew so well and loved for its old associations of Sunday school and song and homely faces of dear friends had become a ghostly, alien place full of haunting terrors. There was no escape. The windows could not be opened. The church was ventilated by transom-like panes near the top of them, which were opened and shut by pulling a wire. She could not get up to them, and she could not have got through them if she had. She cowered down on the step, shuddering from head to foot. By now the thunder and lightning were almost incessant. Rain blew against the windows, not in drops, but sheets, and intermittent volleys of hail bombarded them. The wind had risen suddenly with the storm and shrieked around the church. It was not her old dear friend of childhood, the bat-winged, misty wind-woman, but a legion of yelling witches. The prince of the power of the air rules the wind she had heard mad mr morrison say once why should she think of mad mr morrison now how the windows rattled as if demon riders of the storm were shaking them she had heard a wild tale of someone hearing the organ play in the empty church one night several years ago suppose it began playing now no fancy seemed too grotesque or horrible to come true didn't the stairs creak the blackness between the lightnings was so intense that it looked thick. Emily was frightened of it touching her and buried her face in her lap. Presently, however, she got a grip on herself and began to reflect that she was not living up to Murray traditions. Murray's were not supposed to go to pieces like this. Murray's were not foolishly panicky in thunderstorms. Those old Murrays sleeping in the private graveyard across the pond would have scorned her as a degenerate descendant. Aunt Elizabeth would have said that it was the star coming out in her. She must be brave, after all. She had lived through worse hours than this. The night she had eaten of Lofty John's poisoned apple. The afternoon she had fallen over the rocks of Malvern Bay. This had come so suddenly on her that she had been in the throes of terror before she could brace herself against it she must pick up. Nothing dreadful was going to happen to her, nothing worse than staying all night in the church. In the morning she could attract the attention of someone passing. She had been here over an hour now, and nothing had happened to her, unless, indeed, her hair had turned white, as she understood hair sometimes did. There had been such a funny, crinkly, crawly feeling at the roots of it at times. Emily held out her long braid, ready for the next flash. When it came she saw that her hair was still black. She sighed with relief and began to chirk up. The storm was passing. The thunder peals were growing fainter and fewer, though the rain continued to fall and the wind drive and shriek around the church, whining through the big keyhole eerily. Emily straightened her shoulders and cautiously let down her feet to a lower step. She thought she had better try to get back into the church. If another cloud came up, the steeple might be struck. Steeples were always getting struck, she remembered. It might come crashing down on the porch right over her. She would go in and sit down in the Murray pew. She would be cool and sensible and collected. She was ashamed of her panic, but it had been terrible. All around her was a soft, heavy darkness, still with that same eerie sensation of something you could touch, born, perhaps, of the heat and humidity of the July night. The porch was so small and narrow, she would not feel so smothered and oppressed in the church. She put out her hand to grasp a stair-rail and pull herself to her cramped feet. Her hand touched, not the stair-rail. Merciful heavens, what was it? Something hairy! Emily's shriek of terror froze on her lips. Padding footsteps passed down the steps beside her, a flash of lightning came, and at the bottom of the steps was a huge black dog, which had turned and was looking up at her, before he was blotted out in the returning darkness. Even then, for a moment, she saw his eyes blazing redly at her, like a fiend's. Emily's hair roots began to crawl and crinkle again. A very large, very cold caterpillar began to creep slowly up her spine. She could not have moved a muscle had life depended on it. She could not even cry out. The only thing she could think of at first 
was the horrible demon hound of the Manx castle in Peveril of the Peak. For a few minutes her terror was so great that it turned her physically sick. Then, with an effort which was unchildlike in determination, I think it was at that moment Emily wholly ceased to be a child. She recovered her self-control. She would not yield to fear. She set her teeth and clenched her trembling hands. She would be brave, sensible. That was only a commonplace Blairwater dog which had followed its owner, some rapscallion boy, into the gallery and got itself left behind. The thing had happened before. A flash of lightning showed her that the porch was empty. Evidently the dog had gone into the church. Emily decided that she would stay where she was. She had recovered from her panic, but she did not want to feel the sudden touch of a cold nose or a hairy flank in the darkness. She could never forget the awfulness of the moment when she had touched the creature. It must be all of twelve o'clock now. It had been ten when the meeting came out. The noise of the storm had for the most part died away. The drive and shriek of the wind came occasionally, but between its gusts there was a silence, broken only by the diminishing raindrops. Thunder still muttered faintly, and lightning came at frequent intervals, but of a paler, gentler flame, not the rending glare that had seemed to wrap the very building in intolerable blue radiance, and scorch her eye. Gradually her heart began to beat normally. The power of rational thought returned. She did not like her predicament, but she began to find dramatic possibilities in it. Oh, what a chapter for her diary, or her jimmy book! and beyond it for that novel she would write some day. It was a situation expressly shaped for the heroine, who must, of course, be rescued by the hero. Emily began constructing the scene, adding to it, intensifying it, hunting for words to express it. This was rather interesting, after all. Only she wished she knew just where the dog was. How weirdly the pale lightning gleamed on the gravestones which she could see, through the porch window opposite her. How strange the familiar valley looked in the recurrent illuminations. How the wind moaned and sighed and complained, but it was her own wind-woman again. The wind-woman was one of her childish fancies that she had carried over into maturity, and it comforted her now with a sense of ancient companionship. The wild riders of the storm were gone. Her fairy friend had come back. Emily gave a sigh that was almost of contentment. The worst was over, and really, hadn't she behaved pretty well? She began to feel quite self-respecting again. All at once Emily knew she was not alone. How she knew it she could not have told. She had heard nothing, seen nothing, felt nothing, and yet she knew, beyond all doubt or dispute, that there was a presence in the darkness above her on the stairs. She turned and looked up. It was horrible to look but it was less horrible to feel that something was in front of you than it was behind you. She stared with wildly dilated eyes into the darkness, but she could see nothing. Then she heard a low laugh above her, a laugh that almost made her heart stop beating, the very dreadful inhuman laughter of the unsound in mind. She did not need the lightning flash that came then, to tell her that mad Mr. Morrison was somewhere on the stairs above her. But it came, she saw him, she felt as if she were sinking in some icy gulf of coldness. She could not even scream. The picture of him, etched on her brain by the lightning, never left her. He was crouched five steps above her with his grey head thrust forward. She saw the frenzied gleam of his eyes, the fang-like yellow teeth exposed in a horrible smile the long, thin, blood-red, outstretched hand toward her, almost touching her shoulder. Sheer panic shattered Emily's trance. She bounded to her feet with a piercing scream of terror. "'Teddy! Teddy! Save me!' she shrieked madly. She did not know why she had called for Teddy. She did not even realize that she had called him. She only remembered it afterwards, as one might recall the waking shriek in a nightmare. She only knew that she must have help, that she would die if that awful hand touched her. It must not touch her. She made a mad spring down the steps, rushed into the church, and up the aisle. She must hide before the next flash came, 
but not in the Murray pew. He might look for her there. She dived into one of the middle pews and crouched down in its corner on the floor. Her body was bathed in an ice-cold perspiration. She was wholly in the grip of uncontrollable terror. All she could think of was that it must not touch her, that blood-red hand of the mad old man. Moments passed that seemed like years. Presently she heard footsteps, footsteps that came and went yet seemed to approach her slowly. Suddenly she knew what he was doing. He was going into every pew, not waiting for the lightning, to feel about for her. He was looking for her then. She had heard that sometimes he followed young girls, thinking they were Annie. If he caught them he held them with one hand and stroked their hair and faces fondly with the other, mumbling foolish, senile endearments. He had never harmed anyone, but he had never let anyone go until she was rescued by some other person. It was said that Mary Paxton of Derry Pond had never been quite the same again. Her nerves never recovered from the shock. Emily knew that it was only a question of time before he would reach the pew, where she crouched, feeling about with those hands. All that kept her senses in her frozen body was the thought that if she lost consciousness those hands would touch her, hold her, caress her. The next lightning flash showed him entering the adjoining pew. Emily sprang up and rushed to the other side of the church. She hid again. He would search her out, but she could again elude him. This might go on all night. A madman's strength would outlast hers. At last she might fall exhausted, and he would pounce on her. For what seemed hours to Emily, this mad game of hide-and-seek lasted. It was in reality about half an hour. She was hardly a rational creature at all, any more than her demented pursuer. She was merely a crouching, springing, shrieking thing of horror. Time after time he hunted her out with his cunning, implacable patience. The last time she was near one of the porch doors, and in desperation she sprang through it and slammed it in his face. With the last ounce of her strength, she tried to hold the knob from turning in his grasp. And as she strove, she heard, Was she dreaming? Teddy's voice calling to her from the steps outside the outer door. Emily! Emily, are you there? She did not know how he had come. She did not wonder. She only knew he was there. Teddy! I'm locked in the church! she shrieked. And mad Mr. Morrison is here. Oh, quick! Quick! Save me! Save me! The key of the door is hanging up in there on a nail at the right side, shouted Teddy. Can you get it and unlock the door? If you can't, I'll smash the porch window. The clouds broke at that moment, and the porch was filled with moonlight. In it she saw plainly the big key hanging high on the wall beside the front door. She dashed at it and caught it as mad Mr. Morrison wrenched upon the door and sprang into the porch, his dog behind him. Emily unlocked the outer door and stumbled out into Teddy's arms, just in time to elude that outstretched, blood-red hand. She heard mad Mr. Morrison give a wild, eerie shriek of despair as she escaped him. Sobbing, shaking, she clung to Teddy. Oh, Teddy, take me away! Take me quick! Oh, don't let him touch me! Teddy, don't let him touch me! Teddy swung her behind him and faced mad Mr. Morrison on the stone step. How dare you frighten her so? he demanded angrily. Mad Mr. Morrison smiled depreciatingly in the moonlight. All at once he was not wild or violent, only a heartbroken old man who sought his own. I want Annie, he mumbled. Where is Annie? I thought I had found her in there. I only wanted to find my beautiful Annie. Annie isn't here, said Teddy, tightening his hold on Emily's cold little hand. Can you tell me where Annie is? entreated mad Mr. Morrison wistfully. Can you tell me where my dark-haired Annie is? Teddy was furious with mad Mr. Morrison for frightening Emily, but the old man's piteous entreaty touched him, and the artist in him responded to the values of the picture presented against the background of the white moonlit church. He thought he would like to paint mad Mr. Morrison as he stood there, tall and gaunt, in his grey duster coat, with his long white hair and beard, and the ageless quest in his hollow sunken eyes. No, no, 
I don't know where she is, he said gently, but I think you will find her some time. Mad Mr. Morrison sighed. Oh, yes, some time I will overtake her. Come, my dog, we will seek her. Followed by his old black dog, he went down the steps, across the green, and down the long, wet, tree-shattered road. So going, he passed out of Emily's life. She never saw mad Mr. Morrison again. But she looked after him understandingly, and forgave him. To himself he was not the repulsive old man he seemed to her. He was a gallant young lover seeking his lost and lovely bride. The pitiful beauty of his quest intrigued her, even in the shaking reaction from her hour of agony. "'Poor Mr. Morrison!' she sobbed as Teddy half-led, half-carried her to one of the old flat gravestones at the side of the church. They sat there until Emily recovered composure and managed to tell her tale, or the outlines of it. She felt she could never tell, perhaps not even write in a jimmy book, the whole of its racking horror. That was beyond words. "'And to think,' she sobbed, "'that the key was there all the time. I never knew it!' Old Jacob Banks always locks the front door with its big key on the inside, and then hangs it up on that nail, said Teddy. He locks the choir door with a little key, which he takes home. He has always done that since the time three years ago, when he lost the big key and was weeks before he found it. Suddenly Emily awoke to the strangeness of Teddy's coming. How did you happen to come, Teddy? Why, I heard you call me, he said. You did call me, didn't you? "'Yes,' said Emily, slowly. "'I called for you when I saw mad Mr. Morrison first. "'But, Teddy, you couldn't have heard me. "'You couldn't. "'The Tansy Patch is a mile from here.' "'I did hear you,' said Teddy, stubbornly. "'I was asleep, and it woke me up. "'You called, Teddy, Teddy, save me. "'It was your voice as plain as I ever heard it in my life. "'I got right up and hurried on my clothes "'and came here as fast as I could.' "'How did you know I was here?' "'Why, I don't know,' said Teddy, confusedly. "'I didn't stop to think. "'I just seemed to know you were in the church "'when I heard you calling me, "'and I must get here as quick as I could. "'It's, it's all funny,' he concluded lamely. "'It's, it, it, it frightens me a little,' Emily shivered. "'Aunt Elizabeth says I have second sight. "'You remember Ilse's mother? "'Mr. Carpenter says I'm psychic.' I don't know just what that means, but I think I'd rather not be it. She shivered again. Teddy thought she was cold, and having nothing else to put around her, put his arm, somewhat tentatively, since Murray pride and Murray dignity might be outraged. Emily was not cold in body, but a little chill had blown over her soul. Something supernatural, some mystery she could not understand, had brushed too near her in that strange summoning. Involuntarily she nestled a little closer to Teddy, acutely conscious of the boyish tenderness she sensed behind the aloofness of his boyish shyness. Suddenly she knew that she liked Teddy better than anybody, better even than Aunt Laura or Elsa or Dean. Teddy's arm tightened a little. "'Anyhow, I'm glad I got here in time,' he said. "'If I hadn't, that crazy old man might have frightened you to death. They sat so for a few minutes in silence. Everything seemed very wonderful and beautiful, and a little unreal. Emily thought she must be in a dream, or in one of her own wonder tales. The storm had passed, and the moon was shining clearly once more. The cool, fresh air was threaded with beguiling voices, the fitful voice of raindrops falling from the shaken boughs of the maple woods behind them, the freakish voice of the wind-woman around the white church, the far-off, intriguing voice of the sea, and, still finer and rarer, the little remote, detached voices of the night. Emily heard them all, more with the ears of her soul than of her body. It seemed as she had never heard them before. Beyond were fields and groves and roads, pleasantly suggestive and elusive, as if brooding over elfish secrets in the moonlight. Silver-white daisies were nodding and swaying all over the graveyard, above graves remembered and graves forgotten. An owl laughed delightfully to itself in the old pine. At the magical sound Emily's mystic flash swept over her, swaying her like a strong wind. 
she felt as if she and teddy were all alone in a wonderful new world created for themselves only out of youth and mystery and delight they seemed themselves to be part of the faint cool fragrance of the night of the owl's laughter of the daisies blowing in the shadowy air as for teddy he was thinking that emily looked very sweet in the pale moonshine with her fringed mysterious eyes and the little dark love curls clinging to her ivory neck he tightened his arm a little more and still murray pride and murray dignity made not a particle of protest emily whispered teddy you're the sweetest girl in the world the words had been said so often by so many millions of lads to so many millions of lasses that they ought to be worn to tatters but when you hear them for the first time in some magic hour of your teens they are as new and fresh and wondrous as if they had just drifted over the hedges of eden madame whoever you are and however old you are be honest and admit that the first time you heard those words on the lips of some shy sweetheart was the great moment of your life emily thrilled from the crown of her head to the toes of her slippered feet with a sensation of hitherto unknown and almost terrifying sweetness a sensation that was to sense but her flash was to spirit it is quite conceivable and not totally reprehensible that the next thing that happened might have been a kiss emily thought teddy was going to kiss her teddy knew he was and the odds are that he wouldn't have had his face slapped as g f north had had but it was not to be a shadow that had slipped in at the gate and drifted across the wet grass halted beside them and touched teddy's shoulder just as he bent his glossy black head he looked up startled <laughs> emily looked up mrs kent was standing there bareheaded her scarred face clear in the moonlight looking at them tragically emily and teddy both stood up so suddenly that they seemed veritably to have been jerked to their feet emily's fairy world vanished like a dissolving bubble she was in a different world altogether an absurd ridiculous one yes ridiculous everything had suddenly become ridiculous could anything be more ridiculous than to be caught here with teddy by his mother at two o'clock at night what was that horrid word she had lately heard for the first time oh yes spooning that was it spooning on george horton's eighty-year-old tombstone that was how other people would look at it how could a thing be so beautiful one moment and so absurd the next she was one horrible scorch of shame from head to feet and teddy she knew teddy was feeling like a fool to mrs kent it was not ridiculous it was dreadful to her abnormal jealousy the incident had the most sinister significance she looked at emily with her hollow hungry eyes so you are trying to steal my son from me she said he is all i have and you are trying to steal him oh mother for goodness sake be sensible muttered teddy he he tells me to be sensible mrs kent echoed tragically to the moon sensible yes sensible said teddy angrily there's nothing to make such a fuss about emily was locked in the church by accident and mad mr morrison was there too and nearly frightened her to death i came to let her out and we were sitting here for a few minutes until she got over her fright and was able to walk home that's all how did you know she was here demanded mrs kent how indeed this was a hard question to answer the truth sounded like a silly stupid invention nevertheless teddy told it she called me he said bluntly and you heard her a mile away do you expect me to believe that said mrs kent laughing wildly emily had by this time recovered her poise at no time in her life was emily bird star ever disconcerted for long she drew herself up proudly and in the dim light in spite of her star features she looked much as elizabeth murray must have looked thirty years before whether you believe it or not it is true mrs kent she said haughtily i am not stealing your son i do not want him he can go i'm going to take you home first emily said teddy 
he folded his arms and threw back his head, and tried to look as stately as Emily. He felt that he was a dismal failure at it, but it imposed on Mrs. Kent. She began to cry. "'Go, go,' she said. "'Go to her. Desert me.' Emily was thoroughly angry now. If this irrational woman persisted in making a scene, very well, a scene she should have. "'I won't let him take me home,' she said freezingly. "'Teddy, go with your mother.' "'Oh, you command him, do you? He must do as you tell him, must he?' cried Mrs. Kent, who now seemed to lose all control of herself. Her tiny form was shaken with violent sobs. She wrung her hands. "'He shall choose for himself,' she cried. "'He shall go with you, or come with me. Choose, Teddy, for yourself. You shall not do her bidding. Choose!' She was fiercely dramatic again as she lifted her hand and pointed it at poor teddy teddy was feeling as miserable and impotently angry as any male creature does when two women are quarrelling about him in his presence he wished himself a thousand miles away what a mess to be in and to be made ridiculous like this before emily why on earth couldn't his mother behave like other boys mothers why must she be so intense and exacting he knew Blairwater gossip said she was a little touched. He did not believe that. But, but, well, in short, here was a mess. You came back to that every time. What on earth was he to do? If he took Emily home, he knew his mother would cry and pray for days. On the other hand, to desert Emily after her dreadful experience in the church, and leave her to traverse that lonely road alone, was unthinkable but emily now dominated the situation she was very angry with the icy anger of old hugh murray that did not dissipate itself in idle bluster but went straight to the point you are a foolish selfish woman she said and you will make your son hate you selfish you call me selfish sobbed mrs kent i live only for teddy he is all i have to live for you are selfish Emily was standing straight. Her eyes had gone black, her voice was cutting, the murray look was on her face, and in the pale moonlight it was a rather fearsome thing. She wondered, as she spoke, how she knew certain things. But she did know them. You think you love him. It is only yourself you love. You are determined to spoil his life. You won't let him go to Shrewsbury because it will hurt you to let him go away from you. You have let your jealousy of everything he cares for eat your heart out and master you. You won't bear a little pain for his sake. You are not a mother at all. Teddy has great talent. Everyone says so. You ought to be proud of him. You ought to give him his chance. But you won't, and some day he will hate you for it. Yes, he will. Oh, no, no, moaned Mrs. Kent. She held up her hands as if to ward off the blow and shrank back against Teddy. Oh, you are cruel, cruel. You don't know what I've suffered. You don't know what ache is always at my heart. He is all I have, all. I have nothing else, not even a memory. You don't understand. I can't, I can't give him up. If you let your jealousy ruin his life, you will lose him, said Emily, inexorably. She had always been afraid of Mrs. Kent. Now she was suddenly no longer afraid of her. She knew she would never be afraid of her again. You hate everything he cares for. You hate his friends and his dog and his drawing. You know you do, but you can't keep him that way, Mrs. Kent, and you will find out when it is too late. Good night, Teddy. Thank you again for coming to my rescue. Good night, Mrs. Kent. Emily's good night was very final. She turned and stalked across the green without another glance, holding her head high. Down the wet road she marched, at first very angry, then as anger ebbed, very tired oh horribly tired she discovered that she was fairly shaking with weariness the emotions of the night had exhausted her and now what to do she did not like the idea of going home to new moon emily felt that she could never face outraged aunt elizabeth if the various scandalous doings of the night should be discovered she turned in at the gate of dr burnley's house his doors were never locked emily slipped into the front hall as the dawn began to whiten in the sky and curled up on the lounge behind the staircase. There was no use in waking Ilsa. 
she would tell her the whole story in the morning and bind her to secrecy all at least except one thing teddy had said and the episode of mrs kent one was too beautiful and the other too disagreeable to be talked about of course mrs kent wasn't like other women and there was no use in feeling too badly about it nevertheless she had wrecked and spoiled a frail beautiful something she had blotched with absurdity a moment that should have been eternally lovely and she had of course made poor teddy feel like an ass that in the last analysis was what emily really could not forgive as she drifted off to sleep she recalled drowsily the events of that bewildering night her imprisonment in the lonely church the horror of touching the dog the worse horror of mad mr morrison's pursuit her rapture of relief at teddy's voice the brief little moonlit idol in the graveyard of all places for an idol the tragic comic advent of poor morbid jealous mrs kent i hope i wasn't too hard on her thought emily as she drifted into slumber if i was i'm sorry i'll have to write it down as a bad deed in my diary i feel somehow as if i'd grown up all at once to-night yesterday seems years away but what a chapter it will make for my diary i'll write it all down all but teddy's saying i was the sweetest girl in the world that's too dear to write i'll just remember it end of chapter three part two chapter four of emily climbs by lucy maud montgomery this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four as others see us emily had finished mopping up the kitchen floor at new moon and was absorbed in sanding it in the beautiful and complicated herringbone pattern which was one of the new moon traditions having been invented so it was said by great-great-grandmother of here i stay fame aunt laura had taught emily how to do it and emily was proud of her skill even aunt elizabeth had condescended to say that emily sanded the famous pattern very well and when aunt elizabeth praised further comment was superfluous new moon was the only place in blairwater where the old custom of sanding the floor was kept up other housewives have long ago begun to use the new-fangled devices and patent cleaners for making their floors white but dame elizabeth murray would none of such as long as she reigned at new moon so long should candles burn and sanded floors gleam whitely aunt elizabeth had exasperated emily somewhat by insisting that the latter should put on aunt laura's old mother hubbard while she was scrubbing the floor a mother hubbard it may be necessary to explain to those of this generation was a loose and shapeless garment which served principally as a sort of morning gown and was liked in its day because it was cool and easily put on aunt elizabeth it is quite unnecessary to say disapproved entirely of mother hubbard's she considered them the last word in slovenliness and laura was never permitted to have another one but the old one though its original pretty lilac tint had faded to a dingy white was still too good to be banished to the rag bag and it was this which emily had been told to put on emily detested mother hubbard's as heartily as aunt elizabeth herself did they were worse she considered even than the hated baby aprons of her first summer at new moon she knew she looked ridiculous in aunt laura's mother hubbard which came to her feet and hung in loose unbeautiful lines from her thin young shoulders and emily had a horror of being ridiculous she had once shocked aunt elizabeth by coolly telling her that she would rather be bad than ridiculous emily had scrubbed and sanded with one eye on the door ready to run if any stranger loomed up while she had on that hideous wrapper it was not as emily very well knew a murray tradition to run at new moon you stood your ground no matter what you had on the presupposition being that you were always neatly and properly habited for the occupation of the moment emily recognized the propriety of this yet was nevertheless foolish and young enough to feel that she would die of shame if seen by any one in aunt laura's mother hubbard it was neat it was clean but it was ridiculous there you were just as emily finished sanding and turned to place her can of sand in the niche under the kitchen mantel where it had been kept from time immemorial she heard strange voices in the kitchen yard 
a hasty glimpse through the window revealed to her the owners of the voices miss beulah potter and mrs anne cyrilla potter calling no doubt in regard to the projected ladies aid social they were coming to the back door as was the blairwater custom when running in to see your neighbors informally or on business they were already past the gay platoons of hollyhocks with which cousin jimmy had flanked the stone path to the dairy and of all the people in blairwater and out of it they were the two whom emily would least want to see her in any ridiculous plight whatever without stopping to think she darted into the boot closet and shut the door mrs anne cyrilla knocked twice at the kitchen door but emily did not budge she knew aunt laura was weaving in the garret she could hear the dull thud of the treadles overhead but she thought aunt elizabeth was concocting pies in the cookhouse and would see or hear the callers she would take them into the sitting-room and then emily could make her escape and on one thing she was determined they should not see her in that mother hubbard miss potter was a thin venomous ediculated gossip who seemed to dislike everybody in general and emily in particular and mrs anne cyrilla was a plump pretty smooth amiable gossip who by very reason of her smoothness and amiability did more real harm in a week than miss potter did in a year emily distrusted her even while she could not help liking her she had so often heard mrs anne cyrilla make smiling fun of people to whose faces she had been very sweet and charming and mrs anne cyrilla who had been one of the dressy wallaces from dairy pond was especially fond of laughing over the peculiarities of other people's clothes again the knock came miss potter's this time as emily knew by the staccato raps they were getting impatient well they might knock there till the cows came home vowed emily she would not go to the door in the mother hubbard then she heard perry's voice outside explaining that miss elizabeth was away in the stumps behind the barn picking raspberries but that he would go and get her if they would walk in and make themselves at home to emily's despair this was just what they did miss potter sat down with a creak and mrs anne cyrilla with a puff and perry's retreating footsteps died away in the yard emily realized that she was by way of being in a plight it was very hot and stuffy in the tiny boot closet where cousin jimmy's working clothes were kept as well as boots she hoped earnestly that perry would not be long in finding aunt elizabeth my but it's awful hot said mrs anne cyrilla with a large groan poor emily no no we must not call her poor emily she does not deserve pity she has been very silly and has served exactly right emily then already violently perspiring in her close quarters agreed wholly with her i don't feel the heat as fat people do said miss potter i hope elizabeth won't keep us waiting long laura's weaving i hear the loom going in the garret but there would be no use in seeing her elizabeth would override anything laura might promise just because it wasn't her arrangement i see somebody has just finished sanding the floor look at those worn boards will you you'd think elizabeth murray would have a new floor laid down but she is too mean of course look at that row of candles on the chimney-piece all that trouble and poor light because of the little extra coal oil would cost well she can't take her money with her she'll have to leave it all behind at the golden gate even if she is a murray emily experienced a shock she realized that not only was she being half suffocated in the boot closet but that she was an eavesdropper something she had never been since the evening at maywood when she had hidden under the table to hear her aunts and uncles discussing her fate to be sure that had been voluntary while this was compulsory at least the mother hubbard had made it compulsory but that would not make miss potter's comments any pleasanter to her what business had she to call aunt elizabeth mean aunt elizabeth wasn't mean emily was suddenly very angry with miss potter she herself often criticized aunt elizabeth in secret but it was intolerable that an outsider should do it and that little sneer at the murrays emily could imagine the shrewish glint in miss potter's eye as she uttered it as for the candles the murrays can see further by candlelight than you can by sunlight miss potter thought emily disdainfully or at least as disdainfully as it is possible to think when a river of perspiration is running down your back and you have nothing to breathe but the aroma of old leather i suppose it's because of the expense that she won't send emily to school any longer than this year said mrs anne cyrilla 
Most folks think she ought to give her a year at Shrewsbury anyhow. You'd think she would for pride's sake, if nothing else. But I am told she has decided against it. Emily's heart sank. She hadn't been quite sure till now that Aunt Elizabeth wouldn't send her to Shrewsbury. The tears sprang to her eyes, burning, stinging tears of disappointment. Emily ought to be taught something to earn a living by, said Miss Potter. Her father left nothing. He left me, said Emily below her breath, clenching her fists. Anger dried up her tears. Oh, said Mrs. Anne Cirilla, laughing with tolerant derision, I hear that Emily is going to make a living by writing stories. Not only a living, but a fortune, I believe. <laughs> she laughed again. The idea was so exquisitely ridiculous. Mrs. Anne Cirilla hadn't heard anything so funny for a long time. They say she wastes half her time scribbling trash, agreed Miss Potter. If I was Aunt Elizabeth, I would soon cure her of that nonsense. You mightn't find it so easy. I understand she has always been a difficult girl to manage, so very pig-headed, Murray-like. The whole clam jam of them are as stubborn as mules. Emily, wrathfully, what a disrespectful way to speak of us. Oh, if only I hadn't on this Mother Hubbard, I'd fling this door open and confront them. She needs a tight rein if I know anything of human nature, said Miss Potter. She's going to be a flirt. Anyone can see that. She'll be Juliet over again. You'll see. She makes eyes at everyone, and her only fourteen. Emily, sarcastically, I do not. And Mother wasn't a flirt. She could have been, but she wasn't. You couldn't flirt, even if you wanted to, you respectable old female. She isn't as pretty as poor Juliet was, and she's very sly, sly and deep. Mrs. Dutton says she's the slyest child she ever saw. But still, there are things I like about poor Emily. Mrs. Anne Cirilla's tone was very patronizing. Poor Emily writhed among the boots. The thing I don't like in her is that she is always trying to be smart, said Miss Potter decidedly. She says clever things she has read in books and passes them off as her own. Emily, outraged, I don't. And she's very sarcastic and touchy, and of course as proud as Lucifer concluded Miss Potter. Mrs. Anne Cirilla laughed pleasantly and tolerantly again. Oh, that goes without saying in a Murray. But their worst fault is that they think nobody can do anything right but themselves, and Emily is full of it. Why, she even thinks she can preach better than Mr. Johnson. Emily, that is because I said he contradicted himself in one of his sermons, and he did. And I have heard you criticize dozens of sermons, Mrs. Anne Cirilla. She's jealous, too, continued Mrs. Anne Cirilla. She can't bear to be beaten. She wants to be first in everything. I understand she actually shed tears of mortification the night of the concert because Ilsa Burnley carried off the honors in the dialogue. Emily did very poorly. She was a perfect stick. And she contradicts older people continually. It would be funny if it weren't so ill-bred. It's odd Elizabeth doesn't cure her of that. The Murrays think their breeding is a little above the common, said Miss Potter. Emily, wrathfully, to the boots. It is, too. Of course, said Mrs. Anne Cirilla. I think a great many of Emily's faults come from her intimacy with Ilsa Burnley. She shouldn't be allowed to run about with Ilsa as she does. Why, they say Ilsa is as much an infidel as her father. I have always understood she doesn't believe in God at all or the devil either emily which is a far worse thing in your eyes oh the doctor's trained her a little better now since he found out his precious wife didn't elope with leo mitchell sniffed miss potter he makes her go to sunday school but she's no fit associate for emily she swears like a trooper i'm told mrs mark burns was in the doctor's office one day and heard ilsa in the parlor say distinctly out damned spot probably to the dog "'Dear, dear,' moaned Mrs. Anne Cirilla. "'Do you know what I saw her do one day last week? "'Saw her with my own eyes?' "'Miss Potter was very emphatic over this. "'Anne Cirilla need not suppose "'that she had been using any other person's eyes. "'You couldn't surprise me,' gurgled Mrs. Anne Cirilla. "'Why, they say she was at the Sherivery at Johnson's last Tuesday night "'dressed as a boy. "'Quite likely.' 
but this happened in my own front yard. She was there with Jen Strang, who had come to get a root of my Persian rose bush for her mother. I asked Elsa if she could sew and bake and a few other things that I thought she ought to be reminded of. Elsa said no to them all, quite brazenly, and then she said, What do you think that girl said? Oh, what? breathed Mrs. Anne Cirilla eagerly. She said, Can you stand on one foot and lift your other to a level with your eyes, Miss Potter? I can. And, Miss Potter hushed her tone, to the proper pitch of horror, she did it the listener in the closet stifled a spasm of laughter in cousin jimmy's gray jumper how madcap ilsa did love to shock miss potter good gracious were there any men around entreated mrs anne cirilla no fortunately but it's my belief she would have done it just the same no matter who was there we were close to the road anybody might have been passing i felt so ashamed in my time a young girl would have died before she would have done a thing like that. It's no worse than her and Emily bathing by moonlight up on the sands, without a stitch on, said Mrs. Ansarilla. That was the most scandalous thing. Did you hear about it? Oh, yes, that story's all over Blairwater. Everybody's heard it but Elizabeth and Laura. I can't find out how it started. Were they seen? oh dear no not so bad as that ilsa told it herself she seemed to think it was quite a matter of course i think someone ought to tell laura and elizabeth tell them yourself suggested miss potter oh no i don't want to get in wrong with my neighbors i am not responsible for emily starr's training thank goodness if i were i wouldn't let her have so much to do with jarback priest either he's the queerest of all those queer priests i'm sure he must have a bad influence over her those green eyes of his positively give me the creeps. I can't find out that he believes in anything. Emily, sarcastically again, not even the devil. There's a queer story going around about him and Emily, said Miss Potter. I can't make head or tail of it. They were seen on the big hill last Wednesday evening at sunset, behaving in a most extraordinary fashion. They would walk along with their eyes fixed on the sky, then suddenly stop, grasp each other by the arm, and point upward. They did it time and again. Mrs. Price was watching them from the window, and she can't imagine what they were up to. It was too early for stars, and she couldn't see a solitary thing in the sky. She laid awake all night wondering about it. Well, it all comes to this, Emily Starney's looking after, said Mrs. Anne Cervilla. I sometimes feel that it would be wiser to stop Muriel and Gladys from going about so much with her. Emily, devoutly, I wish you would. They are so stupid and silly, and they just stick around Ilsa and me all the time. When all is said and done, I pity her, said Miss Potter. She's so foolish and high-minded that she'll get in wrong with everyone, and no decent, sensible man will ever be bothered with her. G.F. North says he went home with her once, and that was enough for him. Emily, emphatically, I believe you. Geoff showed almost human intelligence in that remark. "'but then she probably won't live through her teens. "'She looks very consumptive. "'Really, Anne Cirilla, I do feel sorry for the poor thing.' "'This was the proverbial last straw for Emily. "'She, whole star and half Murray, "'to be pitied by Beulah Potter. "'Mother Hubbard or no Mother Hubbard, "'it could not be borne. "'The closet door suddenly opened wide, "'and Emily stood revealed, "'Mother Hubbard and all, "'against a background of boots and jumpers.' Her cheeks were crimson, her eyes black. The mouths of Mrs. Anne Cirilla and Miss Beulah Potter fell open and stayed open. Their faces turned dull red. They were dumb. Emily looked at them steadily for a minute of scornful, eloquent silence. Then, with the air of a queen, she swept across the kitchen and vanished through the sitting-room door, just as Aunt Elizabeth came up the sandstone steps with dignified apologies for keeping them waiting. Miss Potter and Mrs. Anne Cirilla were so dumbfounded that they were hardly able to talk about the ladies' aid, and got themselves confusedly away after a few jerky questions and answers. Aunt Elizabeth did not know what to make of them, and thought they must have been unreasonably offended over having to wait. Then she dismissed the matter from her mind, and Murray did not care what Potters thought or did. The open closet door told no tales, 
and she did not know that up in the lookout chamber Emily was lying face down across the bed, crying passionately for shame and anger and humiliation. She felt degraded and hurt. It had all been the outcome of her own silly vanity in the beginning. She acknowledged that, but her punishment had been too severe. She did not mind so much what Miss Potter had said, but Mrs. Anne Cirilla's tiny barbs of malice did sting. She had liked pretty, pleasant Mrs. Anne Cirilla, who had always seemed kind and friendly and had paid her many compliments. She had thought Mrs. Anne Cirilla had really liked her, and now to find out that she would talk about her like this. "'Couldn't they have said one good thing of me?' she sobbed. "'Oh, I feel soiled somehow between my own silliness and their malice and all dirty and messed up mentally. Will I ever feel clean again? She did not feel clean until she had written it all out in her diary. Then she took a less distorted view of it, and summoned philosophy to her aid. Mr. Carpenter says we should make every experience teach us something, she wrote. He says every experience, no matter whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, has something for us if we are able to view it dispassionately. That, he added bitterly, is one of the pieces of good advice I have kept by me all my life and never been able to make any use of myself. Very well, I shall try to view this dispassionately. I suppose the way to do it is to consider all that was said of me, and decide just what was true and what false, and what merely distorted, which is worse than the false, I think. To begin with, hiding in the closet at all, just out of vanity, comes under my heading of bad deeds. And I suppose that appearing as I did, after I had stayed there so long, and covering them with confusion, was another. But if so, I can't feel it dispassionately yet, because I am sinfully glad I did it. Yes, even if they did see me in the Mother Hubbard, I shall never forget their faces. Especially Mrs. Anne Cirilla's. Miss Potter won't worry over it long. She will say it served me right. But Mrs. Anne Cirilla will never, to her dying day, get over being found out like that. Now for a review of their criticisms of Emily Bird Star and the decision as to whether said Emily Bird Star deserved the said criticisms wholly or in part. Be honest now, Emily. Look then into thy heart and try to see yourself not as Miss Potter sees you, or as you see yourself, but as you really are. I think I'm going to find this interesting. In the first place, Mrs. Anne Cirilla said I was pig-headed. Am I pig-headed? I know I am determined, and Aunt Elizabeth says I am stubborn. But pig-headedness is worse than either of those. Determination is a good quality, and even stubbornness has a saving grace in it if you have a little gumption as well. But a pig-headed person is one who is too stupid to see or understand the foolishness of a certain course, and insists on taking it, insists, in short, on running full tilt into a stone wall. No, I am not pig-headed. I accept stone walls. But I take a good deal of convincing that they are stone walls and not cardboard imitations. Therefore I am a little stubborn. Miss Potter said I was a flirt. This is wholly untrue, so I won't discuss it. But she also said I made eyes. Now do I? I don't mean to, I know that. But it seems you can make eyes without being conscious of it, so how am I going to prevent that? I can't go about all the days of my life with my eyes dropped down. Dean said the other day, When you look at me like that, Star, there is nothing for me but to do as you ask. And Aunt Elizabeth was quite annoyed last week because she said I was looking improperly at Perry when I was coaxing him to go to the Sunday school picnic. Perry hates Sunday school picnics. Now in both cases I thought I was only looking beseechingly. Mrs. Ann Cirilla said I wasn't pretty. Is that true? Emily laid down her pen, went over to the mirror, and took a dispassionate stock of her looks. Black of hair, smoke purple of eye, crimson of lip. So far not bad. Her forehead was too high, but the new way of doing her hair obviated that defect. Her skin was very white, and her cheeks, which had been so pale in childhood, 
were now as delicately hued as a pink pearl. Her mouth was too large, but her teeth were good. Her slightly pointed ears gave her a fawn-like charm. Her neck had lines that she could not help liking. Her slender, immature figure was graceful, she knew, for Aunt Nancy had told her that she had the shipley ankle and instep. Emily looked very earnestly at Emily in the glass, from several angles, and returned to her diary. "'I have decided that I am not pretty,' she wrote. "'I think I look quite pretty when my hair is done in a certain way, but a really pretty girl would be pretty no matter how her hair was done. So Mrs. Ansarilla was right. But I feel sure that I am not so plain as she implied, either. Then she said I was sly and deep.' I don't think it is any fault to be deep, though she spoke as if she thought it was. I would rather be deep than shallow. But am I sly? No, I am not. Then what is it about me that makes people think I am sly? Aunt Ruth always insists that I am. I think it is because I have a habit, when I am bored or disgusted with people, of stepping suddenly into my own world and shutting the door. People resent this. I suppose it is only natural to resent a door being shut in your face. They call it slyness when it is only self-defense, so I won't worry over that. Miss Potter said an abominable thing, that I passed off clever speeches I had read in books as my own, trying to be smart. That is utterly false. Honestly, I never try to be smart. But... I do try often to see how a certain thing I've thought out sounds when it is put into words. Perhaps this is a kind of showing off. I must be careful about it. Jealous? No, I'm not that. I do like to be first, I admit. But I'm proud. Well, yes, I am a little proud. But not nearly as proud as people think me. I can't help carrying my head at a certain angle and I can't help feeling it is a great thing to have a century of good upright people with fine traditions and considerable brains behind you, not like the potters, upstarts of yesterday. Oh, how those women garbled things about poor Elsa! We couldn't, I suppose, expect a potter or the wife of a potter to recognize the sleepwalking scene from Lady Macbeth. I have told Ilsa repeatedly that she ought to see that all doors are shut when she tries it over. She is quite wonderful in it. She never was at that charivari. She only said she'd like to go. And as for the moonlight bathing, that was true enough, except that we had some stitches on. There was nothing dreadful about it. It was perfectly beautiful, though now it is all spoiled and degraded by being dragged about in common gossip. I wish Ilsa hadn't told about it. We had gone away up the sand shore for a walk. It was a moonlit night, and the sand shore was wonderful. The wind woman was rustling in the grasses on the dunes, and there was a long, gentle wash of little gleaming waves on the shore. We wanted to bathe, but at first we thought we couldn't because we didn't have our bathing dresses. So we sat on the sands, and we just talked. The great gulf stretched out before us, silvery, gleaming, alluring, going farther and farther into the mists of the northern sky. It was like an ocean in fairylands forlorn. I said, I would like to get into a ship and sail straight out there. Out, out, where would I land? Anticosti, I expect, said Elsa, a bit too prosaically, I thought. No, no, Ultima Thule, I think, I said dreamily. Some beautiful unknown shore, where the rain never falls and the wind never blows. Perhaps the country back, it was all my fault, but of course he vexed me by his boasting. I wish I could control my temper. I don't mind Elsa's rages one bit now. I know she never means anything she says in them. I never say anything back. I just smile at her, and if I've a bit of paper handy, I jot down the things she says. This infuriates her, so that she chokes with anger and can't say anything more. At all other times, Elsa is a darling and such good fun. You can't control your rages because you like going into them, I said. Elsa stared at me. I don't, I don't. You do, you enjoy them, I insisted. 
Well, of course, said Elsa, grinning. I do have a good time while they last. It's awfully satisfying to say the most insulting things and call the worst names. I believe you're right, Emily. I do enjoy them. Queer I never thought of it. I suppose if I really were unhappy in them, I wouldn't go into them. But after they're over, I'm so remorseful. I cried for an hour yesterday after fighting with Perry. Yes, and you enjoyed that too, didn't you? Ilsa reflected. I guess so, Emily. You're an uncanny thing. I won't talk about it any more. Let's go bathing. No dresses? What does it matter? There isn't a soul for miles. I can't resist those waves. They're calling me. I felt just as she did, and bathing by moonlight seemed such a lovely romantic thing. And it is, when the potters of the world don't know of it. When they do, they smudge it. We undressed in a little hollow among the dunes, that was like a bowl of silver in the moonlight, but we kept our petticoats on. We had the loveliest time splashing and swimming about in that silver-blue water, and those creamy little waves, like mermaids or sea nymphs. It was like living in a poem or a fairy tale. And when we came out, I held up my hands to Ilsa and said, Come unto these yellow sands, curtsied, pale shining sky, and carrying a baby in its arms. There was a filmy blue veil over its head, with a faint first star gleaming through it. Its wings were tipped with gold, and its white robe flecked with crimson. There goes the angel of the evening star with tomorrow in its arms, said Dean. It was so beautiful that it gave me one of my wonder moments. But ten seconds later it had changed into something that looked like a camel with an exaggerated hump. We had a wonderful half-hour, even if Mrs. Price, who couldn't see anything in the sky, did think us quite mad. Well, it all comes to this. There's no use trying to live in other people's opinions. The only thing to do is live in your own. After all, I believe in myself. I'm not so bad and silly as they think me, and I'm not consumptive, and I can write. Now that I've written it all out, I feel differently about it. The only thing that still aggravates me is that Miss Potter pitied me, pitied by a potter. I looked out of my window just now and saw Cousin Jimmy's nasturtium bed, and suddenly the flash came, and Miss Potter and her pity and her malicious tongue seemed to matter not at all. Nasturtiums, who colored you, you wonderful glowing things? You must have been fashioned out of summer sunsets. I help Cousin Jimmy a great deal with his garden this summer. I think I love it as much as he does. Every day we make new discoveries of bud and blossom. So Aunt Elizabeth won't send me to Shrewsbury. Oh, I feel as disappointed as if I'd really hoped she would. Every door in life seems shut to me. Still, after all, I've lots to be thankful for. Aunt Elizabeth will let me go to school another year here, I think. And Mr. Carpenter can teach me heaps yet. I'm not hideous. Moonlight is still a fair thing. I'm going to do something with my pen some day. And I've got a lovely gray moon-faced cat who has jumped up on my table and poked my pen with his nose as a signal that I've written enough for one sitting. The only real cat is a gray cat. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five Half a Loaf. One late August evening, Emily heard Teddy's signal whistle from the tomorrow road and slipped out to join him. He had news that was evident from his shining eyes. Emily he cried excitedly, "I'm going to Shrewsbury after all." Mother told me this evening she had made up her mind to let me go. Emily was glad, with a queer soreness underneath, for which she reproached herself. How lonesome it would be at New Moon with her three old pals were gone. She had not realized until that moment how much she had counted on Teddy's companionship. He had always been there in the background of her thoughts of the coming year. She had always taken Teddy for granted. Now there would be nobody, 
not even Dean, for Dean was going away for the winter as usual, to Egypt or Japan, as he might decide at the last moment. What would she do? Would all the Jimmy books in the world take place of her flesh and blood chums? If you were only going too, said Teddy, as they walked along the tomorrow road, which was almost a today road now, so fast and tall had the leafy young maples grown. There's no use wishing it. Don't speak of it. It makes me unhappy, said Emily jerkily. Well, we'll have weekends anyhow, and it's you I have to thank for going. It was what you said to Mother that night in the graveyard that made her let me go. I know she's been thinking of it ever since, by things she would say every once in a while. One day last week I heard her muttering, It's awful to be a mother, awful to be a mother and suffer like this. Yet she called me selfish. And another time she said, Is it selfish to want to keep the only thing you have left in the world? But she was lovely tonight when she told me I could go. I know folks say Mother isn't quite right in her mind, and sometimes she is a little queer. But it's only when other people are around. You've no idea, Emily, how nice and dear she is when we're alone. I hate to leave her, but I must get some education. I'm very glad if what I said has made her change her mind, but she will never forgive me for it. She has hated me ever since. You know she has. You know how she looks at me whenever I'm at the tansy patch, Oh, she's very polite to me. But her eyes, Teddy. I know, said Teddy uncomfortably. But don't be hard on Mother, Emily. I'm sure she wasn't always like that, though she has been ever since I can remember. I don't know anything of her before that. She never tells me anything. I don't know a thing about my father. She won't talk about him. I don't even know how she got that scar on her face. I don't think there's anything the matter with your mother's mind, really, said Emily slowly. But I think there's something troubling it, always troubling it, something she can't forget or throw off. Teddy, I'm sure your mother is haunted. Of course I don't mean by a ghost or anything silly like that, but by some terrible thought. She isn't happy, I know, said Teddy, and of course we're poor. Mother said tonight she could only send me to Shrewsbury for three years. That was all she could afford. But that will give me a start. I'll get on somehow after that. I know I can. I'll make it up to her yet. You will be a great artist some day, said Emily dreamily. They had come to the end of the tomorrow road. Before them was the pond pasture, whitened over with a drift of daisies. Farmers hate the daisies as a pestiferous weed but a field white with them on a summer twilight is a vision from the land of lost delight. Beneath them Blair water shone like a great golden lily. Up on the eastern hill the little disappointed house crouched amid its shadows, dreaming, perhaps, of the false bride that had never come to it. There was no light at the tansy patch. Was lonely Mrs. Kent crying there in the darkness, with only her secret tormenting heart hunger for companion? Emily was looking at the sunset sky, her eyes rapt, her face pale and seeking. She felt no longer blue or depressed. Somehow she never could feel that way long in Teddy's company. In all the world there was no music like his voice. All good things seemed suddenly possible with him. She could not go to Shrewsbury, but she could work and study at New Moon. Oh, how she would work and study! Another year with Mr. Carpenter would do a great deal for her, as much as Shrewsbury, perhaps. She, too, had her alpine path to climb. She would climb it, no matter what the obstacles in the way, no matter whether there was anyone to help her or not. "'When I am, I'll paint you just as you're looking now,' said Teddy, and call it Joan of Arc, with a face all spirit, listening to her voices." In spite of her voices, Emily went to bed that night, feeling rather downhearted, and woke in the morning with an unaccountable conviction that some good news was coming to her that day, a conviction that did not lessen as the hours passed by in the commonplace fashion of Saturday hours at New Moon, busy hours in which the house was made immaculate for Sunday, and the pantry replenished. It was a cool, damp day when the fogs were coming up from the shore on the east wind, 
and new moon and its old garden were veiled in mist. At twilight a thin gray rain began to fall, and still the good news had not come. Emily had just finished scouring the brass candlesticks and composing a poem called Rain Song, simultaneously, when Aunt Laura told her that Aunt Elizabeth wanted to see her in the parlor. Emily's recollections of parlor interviews with Aunt Elizabeth were not especially pleasant. She could not recall any recent deed, done or left undone, which would justify this summons, yet she walked into the parlor quakingly. Whatever Aunt Elizabeth was going to say to her, it must have some special significance or it would not be said in the parlor. This was just one of Aunt Elizabeth's little ways. Daffy, her big cat, slipped in beside her like a noiseless gray shadow. She hoped Aunt Elizabeth would not shoo him out. His presence was a certain comfort. A cat is a good backer when he is on your side. Aunt Elizabeth was knitting. She looked solemn, but not offended or angry. She ignored Daff, but thought that Emily seemed very tall in the old stately twilight room. How quickly children grew up! It seemed but the other day since fair, pretty Juliet. Elizabeth Murray shut her thoughts off with a click. "'Sit down, Emily,' she said. "'I want to have a talk with you.' Emily sat down. So did Daffy, wreathing his tail comfortably about his paws. Emily suddenly felt that her hands were clammy and her mouth dry. She wished that she had knitting, too. It was nasty to sit there, unoccupied, and wonder what was coming. What did come was the one thing she had never thought of. Aunt Elizabeth— after knitting a deliberate round on her stocking, said directly, "'Emily, would you like to go to Shrewsbury next week?' "'Go to Shrewsbury? Had she heard aright?' "'Oh, Aunt Elizabeth,' she said. "'I have been talking the matter over with your uncles and aunts,' said Aunt Elizabeth. "'They agree with me that you should have some further education. "'It will be a considerable expense, of course. "'No, don't interrupt.' I don't like interruptions, but Ruth will board you for half price as her contribution for your upbringing. Emily, I will not be interrupted. Your Uncle Oliver will pay the other half. Your Uncle Wallace will provide your books, and I will see to your clothes. You will, of course, help your Aunt Ruth about the house in every way possible, as some return for her kindness. You may go to Shrewsbury for three years on a certain condition. What was the condition? Emily, who wanted to dance and sing and laugh through the old parlor, as no Murray, not even her mother, had ever ventured to dance and laugh before, constrained herself to sit rigidly on her ottoman and ask herself that question. Behind her suspense she felt that the moment was quite dramatic. Three years at Shrewsbury,' Aunt Elizabeth went on, "'will do as much for you as three at Queen's, except, of course, that you don't get a teacher's license,' which doesn't matter in your case, as you are not under the necessity of working for your living. But, as I have said, there is a condition. Why didn't Aunt Elizabeth name the condition? Emily felt that the suspense was unendurable. Could it be possible that Aunt Elizabeth was a little afraid to name it? It was not like her to talk for time. Was it so very terrible? You must promise, said Aunt Elizabeth sternly, that for the three years you are at Shrewsbury, you will give up entirely this writing nonsense of yours, entirely, except in so far as school compositions may be required. Emily sat very still and cold. No Shrewsbury on the one hand. On the other, no more poems, no more stories and studies, no more delightful Jimmy books of miscellany. She did not take more than one instant to make up her mind. "'I can't promise that, Aunt Elizabeth,' she said resolutely. Aunt Elizabeth dropped her knitting in amazement. She had not expected this. She had thought Emily was so set on going to Shrewsbury that she would do anything that might be asked of her in order to go, especially such a trifling thing as this, which, so Aunt Elizabeth thought, involved only a surrender of stubbornness. "'Do you mean to say you won't give up your foolish scribbling "'for the sake of the education you've always pretended to want so much?' she demanded. 
Not that I won't. It's just that I can't, said Emily despairingly. She knew Aunt Elizabeth could not understand. Aunt Elizabeth had never understood this. I can't help writing, Aunt Elizabeth. It's in my blood. There's no use in asking me. I do want an education. It isn't pretending. But I can't give up my writing to get it. I couldn't keep such a promise. So what use would there be in making it? Then you can stay home, said Aunt Elizabeth angrily. Emily expected to see her get up and walk out of the room. Instead, Aunt Elizabeth picked up her stocking and wrathfully resumed her knitting. To tell the truth, Aunt Elizabeth was absurdly taken aback. She really wanted to send Emily to Shrewsbury. Tradition required so much of her, and all the clan of opinion she should be sent. This condition had been her own idea. She thought it a good chance to break Emily of a silly, unmurray like habit of wasting time and paper, and she had never doubted that her plan would succeed, for she knew how much Emily wanted to go. And now this senseless, unreasoning, ungrateful obstinacy, the star coming out, thought Aunt Elizabeth rancorously, forgetful of the Shipley inheritance. What was to be done? She knew too well from past experience that there would be no moving Emily once she had taken up a position, and she knew that Wallace and Oliver and Ruth, though they thought Emily's craze for writing as silly and untraditional as she did, would not back her, Elizabeth, up in her demand. Elizabeth Murray foresaw a complete right-about face before her, and Elizabeth Murray did not like the prospect. She could have shaken with a right good will the slim, pale thing sitting before her on the ottoman. The creature was so slight and young and indomitable. For over three years Elizabeth Murray had tried to cure Emily of this foolishness of writing, and for over three years she, who had never failed in anything before, had failed in this. One couldn't starve her into submission, and nothing short of it would seem to be efficacious. Elizabeth knitted furiously in her vexation, and Emily sat motionless, struggling with her bitter disappointment and sense of injustice. She was determined she would not cry before Aunt Elizabeth, but it was hard to keep the tears back. She wished Daff wouldn't purr with such resounding satisfaction, as if everything were perfectly delicious from a grey cat's point of view. She wished Aunt Elizabeth would tell her to go. But Aunt Elizabeth only knitted furiously and said nothing. It all seemed rather nightmarish. The wind was rising, and the rain began to drive against the pane, and the dead and gone Murrays looked down accusingly from their dark frames. They had no sympathy with flashes and jimmy books and alpine paths, with the pursuit of unwon, alluring divinities. Yet Emily couldn't help thinking, under all her disappointment, what an excellent setting it would make for some tragic scene in a novel. The door opened and Cousin Jimmy slipped in. Cousin Jimmy knew what was in the wind, and had been coolly and deliberately listening outside the door. He knew Emily would never promise such a thing. He had told Elizabeth so at the family council ten days before. He was only simple Jimmy Murray, but he understood what sensible Elizabeth Murray could not understand. "'What is wrong?' he asked, looking from one to the other. "'Nothing is wrong.' said Aunt Elizabeth haughtily. I have offered Emily an education, and she has refused it. She is free to do so, of course. No one can be free who has a thousand ancestors, said Cousin Jimmy, in the eerie tone in which he generally said such things. It always made Elizabeth shiver. She could never forget that his eeriness was her fault. Emily can't promise what you want. Can you, Emily? No, in spite of herself, a couple of big tears rolled down Emily's cheeks. "'If you could,' said Cousin Jimmy, "'you would promise it for me, wouldn't you?' Emily nodded. "'You've asked too much, Elizabeth,' said Cousin Jimmy to the angry lady of the knitting needles. "'You've asked her to give up all her writing. Now, if you just asked her to give up some, Emily, what if she asked you to give up some?' 
You might be able to do that, mightn't you? What sum? asked Emily cautiously. Well, anything that wasn't true, for instance. Cousin Jimmy sidled over to Emily and put a beseeching hand on her shoulder. Elizabeth did not stop knitting, but the needles went more slowly. Stories, for instance, Emily. She doesn't like your writing stories especially. She thinks they're lies. She doesn't mind other things so much. Do you think, Emily, you could give up writing stories for three years? An education is a great thing. Your grandmother Archibald would have lived on herring tails to get an education. Many a time I've heard her say it. Come, Emily. Emily thought rapidly. She loved writing stories. It would be a hard thing to give them up. But if she could still write airborne fancies in verse, and weird little Jimmy book sketches of character, and accounts of everyday events, witty, satirical, tragic, as the humor took her, she might be able to get along. Try her, try her, whispered Cousin Jimmy. Propitiate her a little. You do owe her a great deal, Emily. Meet her halfway. Aunt Elizabeth, said Emily tremulously, if you will send me to Shrewsbury, I promise you that for three years I won't write anything that isn't true. Will that do? Because it's all I can promise. Elizabeth knitted two rounds before deigning to reply. Cousin Jimmy and Emily thought she was not going to reply at all. Suddenly she folded up her knitting and rose. Very well. I will let it go at that. It is, of course, your stories I object to most. As for the rest, I fancy Ruth will see to it that you have not much time to waste on it. Aunt Elizabeth swept out, much relieved in her secret heart that she had not been utterly routed, but had been enabled to retreat from a perplexing position with some of the honors of war. Cousin Jimmy patted Emily's black head. That's good, Emily. Mustn't be too stubborn, you know. And three years isn't a lifetime, pussy. No, but it seems like one at fourteen. Emily cried herself to sleep when she went to bed, and woke again at three by the clock, of that windy, dark gray night on the old north shore, rose, lighted a candle, sat down at her table, and described the whole scene in her jimmy book, being exceedingly careful to write therein no word that was not strictly true. End of chapter 5「Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six Shrewsbury Beginnings Teddy and Elsa and Perry whooped for joy when Emily told them that she was going to Shrewsbury. Emily, thinking it over, was reasonably happy. The great thing was that she was going to high school. She did not like the idea of boarding with Aunt Ruth. This was unexpected. She had supposed that Aunt Ruth would never be willing to have her about, and that if Aunt Elizabeth did decide to send her to Shrewsbury, she would have to board elsewhere, probably with Elsa. Certainly she would have greatly preferred this. She knew quite well that life would not be very easy under Aunt Ruth's roof, and then she must write no more stories. To feel within her the creative urge, and be forbidden to express it, to tingle with delight in the conception of humorous or dramatic characters, and be forbidden to bring them into existence, to be suddenly seized with the idea of a capital plot, and realize immediately afterward that you couldn't develop it. All this was a torture which no one who has not been born with the fatal itch for writing can realize. The Aunt Elizabeths of the world can never understand it. To them it is merely foolishness. Those last two weeks of August were busy ones at New Moon. Elizabeth and Laura held long conferences over Emily's clothes. She must have an outfit that would cast no discredit on the Murrays, but common sense and not fashion was to give the casting vote. Emily herself had no say in the matter. Laura and Elizabeth argued from noon to dewy eve one day as to whether Emily might have a taffeta silk blouse. Ilsa had three and decided against it, much to Emily's disappointment. 
but Laura had her way in regard to what she dared not call an evening dress, since the name would have doomed it in Elizabeth's opinion. It was a pretty crepe thing of a pinkish gray, the shade, I think, which was then called Ashes of Roses, and was made collarless, a great concession on Elizabeth's part, with the big puffed sleeves that look very absurd today, but which, like every other fashion, were pretty and piquant when worn by the youth and beauty of their time. It was the prettiest dress Emily had ever had, and the longest, which meant much in those days when you could not be grown up until you had put on long dresses. It came to her pretty ankles. She put it on one evening when Laura and Elizabeth were away, because she wanted Dean to see her in it. He had come up to spend the evening with her, he was off the next day, having decided on Egypt, and they walked in the garden. Emily felt quite old and sophisticated because she had to lift her shimmering skirt clear of the ribbon grasses. She had a little grayish-pink scarf wound around her head and looked more like a star than ever, Dean thought. The cats were in attendance, Daffy, sleek and striped, Saucy Sal, who still reigned supreme in the new moon barns. Cats might come and cats might go, but Saucy Sal went on for ever. They frisked over the grass plots and pounced on each other from flowery jungles and rolled insinuatingly around Emily's feet. Dean was going to Egypt, but he knew that nowhere, even amid the strange charm of forgotten empires, would he see anything he liked better than the pretty picture Emily and her little cats made in the prim, stately, scented old garden of New Moon. They did not talk as much as usual, and the silences did queer things to both of them. Dean had one or two mad impulses to throw up the trip to Egypt and stay home for the winter, go to Shrewsbury, perhaps. He shrugged his shoulders and laughed at himself. This child did not need his looking after. The ladies of New Moon were competent guardians. She was only a child yet, in spite of her slim height and her unfathomable eyes. But how perfect the white line of her throat! How kissable the sweet red curve of her mouth! She would be a woman soon. But not for him. Not for lame Jarback priest of her father's generation. For the hundredth time Dean told himself that he was not going to be a fool. He must be content with what fate had given him, the friendship and affection of this exquisite, starry creature. In the years to come her love would be a wonderful thing, for some other man, no doubt, thought Dean cynically. She would waste it on some good-looking young mannequin who wasn't half worthy of it. Emily was thinking how dreadfully she was going to miss Dean, more than she had ever missed him before. They had been such good pals that summer. She had never had a talk with him, even if it were only for a few minutes, without feeling that life was richer. His wise, witty, humorous, satiric sayings were educative. They stimulated, stung, inspired her, and his occasional compliments gave her self-confidence. He had a certain strange fascination for her that no one else in the world possessed. She felt it, though she could not analyze it. Teddy, now, she knew perfectly well why she liked Teddy. It was just because of his Teddiness. And Perry, Perry was a jolly, sunburned, outspoken, boastful rogue you couldn't help liking. But Dean was different. Was his charm the allure of the unknown, of experience, of subtle knowledge, of a mind grown wise on bitterness, of things Dean knew that she could never know? Emily couldn't tell. She only knew that everybody tasted a little flat after Dean, even Teddy, though she liked him best. Oh, yes, Emily never had any doubt at all that she liked Teddy best, and yet Dean seemed to satisfy some part of her subtle and intricate nature that always went hungry without him. Thank you for all you've taught me, Dean, she said, as they stood by the sundial. Do you think you have taught me nothing, Star? How could I? I'm so young, so ignorant. You've taught me to laugh without bitterness. I hope you'll never realize what a boon that is. Don't let them spoil you at Shrewsbury, Star. You're so pleased over going that I don't want to throw cold water. But you'd be just as well off, better, here at New Moon. Dean, I want some education. 
education education isn't being spoon-fed with algebra and second-rate latin old carpenter could teach you more and better than the college cubs male and female in shrewsbury high school i can't go to school any more here protested emily i'll be all alone all the pupils of my age are going to queen's or shrewsbury or staying home i don't understand you dean i thought you'd be so glad they're letting me go to shrewsbury i am glad since it pleases you only the lore i wished for you isn't learned in high schools or measured by terminal exams whatever of worth you get in any school you'll dig out for yourself don't let them make anything of you by yourself that's all i don't think they will no they won't said emily decidedly i'm like kipling's cat i walk by my wild load and wave my wild tail where it so it pleases me that's why the murrays look askance at me they think i should only run with the pack oh dean you'll write me often won't you nobody understands like you and you've got to be such a habit with me i can't do without you emily said and meant it lightly enough but dean's thin face flushed darkly they did not say good-bye that was an old compact of theirs dean waved his hand at her may every day be kind to you he said emily gave him only her slow mysterious smile he was gone the garden seemed very lonely in the faint blue twilight with the ghostly blossoms of the white phlox here and there she was glad when she heard teddy's whistle in lofty john's bush on her last evening at home she went to see mr carpenter and get his opinion regarding some manuscripts she had left with him for criticism the preceding week among them were her latest stories written before aunt elizabeth's ultimatum criticism was something mr carpenter could give with a right good will and he never minced matters but he was just and emily had confidence in his verdicts even when he said things that raised temporary blisters on her soul this love story is no good he said bluntly i know that it isn't what i want to make it sighed emily no story ever is said mr carpenter you'll never write anything that really satisfies you though it may satisfy other people as for love stories you can't write them because you can't feel them don't try to write anything you can't feel it will be a failure echoes nothing worth this other yarn now about this old woman it's not bad the dialogue is clever the climax simple and effective and thank the lord you've got a sense of humour that's mainly why you're no good at love stories i believe nobody with a real sense of humour can write a love story emily didn't see why this should be she liked writing love stories and terribly sentimental tragical stories they were shakespeare could she said defiantly you're hardly in the shakespeare class said mr carpenter dryly emily blushed scorchingly i know i'm not but you said nobody and i maintain it shakespeare is the exception that proves the rule though his sense of humour was certainly in abeyance when he wrote romeo and juliet however let's come back to emily of new moon this story well a young person might read it without contamination emily knew by the inflection of mr carpenter's voice that he was not praising her story she kept silence and mr carpenter went on flicking her precious manuscripts aside irreverently this one sounds like a weak imitation of kipling been reading him lately yes i thought so don't try to imitate kipling if you must imitate imitate laura jean libby nothing good about this but its title a priggish little yarn and hidden riches is not a story it's a machine it creaks it never made me forget for one instant that it was a story hence it isn't a story i was trying to write something very true to life protested emily ah that's why we all see life through an illusion even the most disillusioned of us that's why things aren't convincing if they're too true to life let me see the madden family another attempt at realism but it's only photography not portraiture what a lot of disagreeable things you've said sighed emily it might be a nice world if nobody ever said a disagreeable thing but it would be a dangerous one retorted mr carpenter you told me you wanted criticism not taffy however here's a bit of taffy for you i kept it for the last something different is comparatively good and if i wasn't afraid of ruining you i'd say it was absolutely good ten years from now you can rewrite it and make something of it yes ten years don't screw up your face jade you have talent and you've got a wonderful feeling for words 
You get the inevitable one every time. That's a priceless thing. But you have some vile faults, too. Those cursed italics. Forswear them, Jade, forswear them. And your imagination needs a curb when you get away from realism. It's to have one now, said Emily gloomily. She told him of her compact with Aunt Elizabeth. Mr. Carpenter nodded. Excellent. Excellent? echoed Emily blankly. Yes, it's just what you need. It will teach you restraint and economy. Stick to facts for three years and see what you can make of them. Leave the realm of imagination severely alone and confine yourself to ordinary life. There isn't any such thing as ordinary life, said Emily. Mr. Carpenter looked at her for a moment. You're right. There isn't, he said slowly. But one wonders a little how you know it. Well, go on, go on, walk in your chosen path, and thank whatever gods there be that you're free to walk in it. Cousin Jimmy says nobody can be free who has a thousand ancestors. And yet people call that man simple, muttered Mr. Carpenter. However, your ancestors don't seem to have wished any special curse on you. They've simply laid it on you to aim for heights, and they'll give you no peace if you don't. Call it ambition, aspiration, Cassophies Gribbendi, any name you will. Under its sting, or allure, one has to go on climbing until one fails or— Succeeds, said Emily, flinging back her dark head. Amen, said Mr. Carpenter. Emily wrote a poem that night, Farewell to New Moon, and shed tears over it. She felt every line of it. It was all very well to be going to school, but to leave dear New Moon— Everything at New Moon was linked with her life and thoughts, was a part of her. It's not only that I love my room and trees and hills, they love me, she thought. Her little black trunk was packed. Aunt Elizabeth had seen that everything necessary was in it, and Aunt Laura and Cousin Jimmy had seen that one or two unnecessary things were in it. Aunt Laura had told Emily that she would find a pair of black lace stockings inside her strap slippers. Even Laura did not dare go so far as silk stockings, and Cousin Jimmy had given her three Jimmy books and an envelope with a five-dollar bill in it. "'To get anything you want with, Pussy. I'd have made it ten, but five was all Elizabeth would advance me on next month's wages. I think she suspected. "'Can I spend a dollar of it for American stamps, if I can find a way to get them?' whispered Emily anxiously. "'Anything you like,' repeated Cousin Jimmy loyally though even to him it did not appear an unaccountable thing that any one should want to buy American stamps. But if dear little Emily wanted American stamps, American stamps she should have. The next day seemed rather dreamlike to Emily, the birds she heard singing rapturously in Lofty John's bush when she woke at dawn, the drive to Shrewsbury in the early crisp September morning, Aunt Ruth's cool welcome, the hours at a strange school, the organization of the prep classes, home to supper, surely it must all have taken more than a day. Aunt Ruth's house was at the end of a residential side street, almost out in the country. Emily thought it a very ugly house, covered as it was with gingerbread work of various kinds. But a house with white wooden lace on its roof and its bay windows was the last word of elegance in Shrewsbury. There was no garden, nothing but a bare, prim little lawn, but one thing rejoiced Emily's eyes. Behind the house was a big plantation of tall, slender fir trees, the tallest, straightest, slenderest firs she had ever seen, stretching back into long, green, gossamered vistas. Aunt Elizabeth had spent the day in Shrewsbury and went home after supper. She shook hands with Emily on the doorstep and told her to be a good girl and do exactly as Aunt Ruth bade her. She did not kiss Emily, but her tone was very gentle for Aunt Elizabeth. Emily choked up and stood tearfully on the doorstep to watch Aunt Elizabeth out of sight, Aunt Elizabeth going back to dear new moon. "'Come in,' said Aunt Ruth, "'and please don't slam the door.' "'Now, Emily never slammed doors.' "'We will wash the supper dishes,' said Aunt Ruth. "'You will always do that after this. I will show you where everything is put.' I suppose Elizabeth told you I would expect you to do a few chores for your board. Yes, said Emily briefly. She did not mind doing chores, any number of them, but it was Aunt Ruth's tone. Of course your being here will mean a great deal of extra expense for me, continued Aunt Ruth. 
but it is only fair that we should all contribute something to your bringing up. I think, and I have always thought, that it would have been much better to send you to Queen's to get a teacher's license. I wanted that, too, said Emily. Hmm, Aunt Ruth pursed her mouth. So you tell me. In that case, I don't see why Elizabeth didn't send you to Queen's. She has pampered you enough in other ways, I'm sure. I would expect her to give in about this, too, if she thought you really wanted it. You will sleep in the kitchen chamber. It is warmer in winter than the other rooms. There is no gas in it, but I could not afford to let you have gas to study by in any case. You must use candles. You can burn two at a time. I shall expect you to keep your room neat and tidy, and to be here at my exact hours for meals. I am very particular about that. And there is another thing you might as well understand at once. You must not bring your friends here. I do not propose to entertain them. Not Ilsa, or Perry, or Teddy? Well, Ilsa is a Burnley and a distant connection. She might come in once in a while. I can't have her running in at all times. From all I hear of her, she isn't a very suitable companion for you. As for the boys, certainly not. I know nothing of Teddy Kent, and you ought to be too proud to associate with Perry Miller. I'm too proud not to associate with him, retorted Emily. Don't be pert with me, Emily. You might as well understand right away that you are not going to have things all your own way, here, as you had at New Moon. You have been badly spoiled. But I will not have hired boys calling on my niece. I don't know where you get your low tastes from, I'm sure. Even your father seemed like a gentleman. Go upstairs and unpack your trunk. Then do your lessons. We go to bed at nine o'clock. Emily felt very indignant. Even Aunt Elizabeth had never dreamed of forbidding Teddy to come to New Moon. She shut herself in her room and unpacked drearily. The room was such an ugly one. She hated it at sight. The door wouldn't shut tight, the slanting ceiling was rain-stained, and came down so close to the bed that she could touch it with her hand. On the bare floor was a large, hooked mat, which made Emily's eyes ache. It was not in Murray taste, nor in Ruth Dutton's taste either, to be just. A country cousin of the deceased Mr. Dutton had given it to her. The centre, of a crude, glaring scarlet, was surrounded by scrolls of militant orange and violent green. In the corners were bunches of purple ferns and blue roses. The woodwork was painted a hideous chocolate brown, and the walls were covered with paper of still more hideous design. The pictures were in keeping, especially a chromo of Queen Alexandra, gorgeously bedizened with jewels, hung at such an angle that it seemed the royal lady must certainly fall over on her face. Not even a chromo could make Queen Alexandra ugly or vulgar, but it came piteously near it. On a narrow chocolate shelf sat a vase filled with paper flowers that had been paper flowers for twenty years. One couldn't believe that anything could be as ugly and depressing as they were. "'This room is unfriendly. It doesn't want me. I can never feel at home here,' said Emily. She was horribly homesick. She wanted the new moon candlelights shining out on the birch trees, the scent of hop vines in the dew, her purring pussy cats, her own dear room full of dreams the silences and shadows of the old garden, the grand anthems of wind and billow in the gulf, the sonorous old music she missed so much in this inland silence. She missed even the little graveyard where slept the new moon dead. "'I'm not going to cry,' Emily clenched her hands. "'Aunt Ruth will laugh at me. There's nothing in this room I can ever love. Is there anything out of it?' She pushed up the window. It looked south into the fir grove, and its balsam blew into her like a caress. To the left there was an opening in the trees like a green arched window, and one saw an enchanting little moonlit landscape through it, and it would let in the splendor of the sunset. To the right was a view of the hillside, along which West Shrewsbury straggled. The hill was dotted with lights in the autumn dusk, and had a fairy-like loveliness. Somewhere nearby there was a drowsy twittering as of little sleepy birds swinging on a shadowy bough. "'Oh, this is beautiful,' breathed Emily, bending out to drink in the balsam-scented air. "'Father told me once that one could find something beautiful to love everywhere. I'll love this.' Aunt Ruth poked her head in at the door, unannounced. "'Emily, why did you leave that antimacassar crooked on the sofa in the dining-room?' "'I don't know,' said Emily confusedly. She hadn't even known she had disarranged the antimacassar. 
Why did Aunt Ruth ask such a question, as if she suspected her of some dark, deep, sinister design? Go down and put it straight. As Emily turned obediently, Aunt Ruth exclaimed, Emily Starr, put down that window at once. Are you crazy? The room is so close, pleaded Emily. You can air it in the daytime, but never have that window open after sundown. I am responsible for your health now. You must know that consumptives have to avoid night air and draughts. I am not a consumptive, cried Emily rebelliously. Contradict, of course. And if I were, fresh air any time is the best thing for me. Dr. Burnley says so. I hate being smothered. Young people think old people to be fools, and old people know young people to be fools. Aunt Ruth felt that the proverb left nothing to be said. Go and straighten that antimacassar, Emily. Emily swallowed something and went. The offending antimacassar was mathematically corrected. Emily stood for a moment and looked about her. Aunt Ruth's dining room was much more splendid and up-to-date than the sitting-room at New Moon, where they had company meals. Hardwood floor, Wilton rug, early English oak furniture. But it was not half as friendly as the old New Moon room, Emily thought. She was more homesick than ever. She did not believe she was going to like anything in Shrewsbury, living with Aunt Ruth or going to school. The teachers all seemed flat and insipid after pungent Mr. Carpenter, and there was a girl in the junior class she had hated at sight. And she had thought it would all be so delightful, living in pretty Shrewsbury and going to high school. Well, nothing ever is exactly like you what you expect it to be, Emily told herself in temporary pessimism as she went back to her room. Hadn't Dean told her once that he had dreamed all his life of rowing in a gondola through the canals of Venice on a moonlit night? and when he did he was almost eaten alive by mosquitoes. Emily set her teeth as she crept into bed. I shall just have to fix my thoughts on the moonlight and romance and ignore the mosquitoes, she thought. Only Aunt Ruth does sting so. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Pot Puri September 20, 19 something. I have been neglecting my diary of late. One does not have a great deal of spare time at Aunt Ruth's. But it is Friday night, and I couldn't go home for the weekend, so I come to my diary for comforting. I can spend only alternate weekends at New Moon. Aunt Ruth wants me every other Saturday to help house-clean. We go over this house from top to bottom, whether it needs it or not, as the tramp said when he washed his face every month, and then rest from our labors for Sunday. There is a hint of frost in the air tonight. I am afraid the garden at New Moon will suffer. Aunt Elizabeth will begin to think it is time to give up the cook-house for the season and move the waterloo back into the kitchen. Cousin Jimmy will be boiling the pig's potatoes in the old orchard and reciting his poetry. Likely Teddy and Ilsa and Perry, who have all gone home, lucky creatures, will be there and Daff will be prowling about, but I must not think of it. That way homesickness lies. I am beginning to like Shrewsbury and Shrewsbury School and Shrewsbury teachers, though Dean was right when he said I would not find anyone like Mr. Carpenter here. The seniors and juniors look down on the preps and are very condescending. Some of them condescended to me, but I do not think they will try it again, except Evelyn Blake, who condescends every time we meet, as we do quite often, because her chum, Mary Carswell, rooms with Elsa at Mrs. Adamson's boarding-house. I hate Evelyn Blake. There is no doubt at all about that. And there is as little doubt that she hates me. We are instinctive enemies. We looked at each other the first time we met like two strange cats, and that was enough. I never really hated anyone before. I thought I did, but now I know it was only dislike. Hate is rather interesting for a change. Evelyn is a junior, tall, clever, rather handsome, has long, bright, treacherous brown eyes, and talks through her nose. She has literary ambitions, I understand, and considers herself the best-dressed girl in the high school. Perhaps she is, but somehow her clothes seem to make more impression on you than she does. 
People criticize Ilsa for dressing too richly and too old, but she dominates her clothes for all that. Evelyn doesn't. You always think of her clothes before you think of her. The difference seems to be that Evelyn dresses for other people, and Ilsa dresses for herself. I must write a character sketch of her when I have studied her a little more. What a satisfaction that will be! I met her first in Ilsa's room, and Mary Carswell introduced us. Evelyn looked down at me, she is a little taller, being a year older, and said, "'Oh, yes, Miss Starr. I've heard my aunt, Mrs. Henry Blake, talking about you.' Mrs. Henry Blake was once Miss Brownell. I looked straight into Evelyn's eyes and said, "'No doubt Mrs. Henry Blake painted a very flattering picture of me.' Evelyn laughed, with a kind of laugh I don't like. It gives you the feeling that she is laughing at you, not at what you've said." "'You didn't get on very well with her, did you? "'I understand you are quite literary. "'What papers do you write for?' "'She asked the question sweetly, "'but she knew perfectly well that I don't write for any, yet. "'The Charlottetown Enterprise and the Shrewsbury Weekly Times,' "'I said, with a wicked grin. "'I've just made a bargain with them. "'I'm to get two cents for every news item I send, "'the Enterprise, and twenty-five cents a week "'for a society letter for the Times.' "'My grin worried Evelyn.' preps aren't supposed to grin like that at juniors it isn't done oh yes i understand you are working for your board she said i suppose every little helps but i meant real literary periodicals the quill i asked with another grin the quill is the high school paper appearing monthly it is edited by the members of the skull and owl a literary society to which only juniors and seniors are eligible the contents of the quill are written by the students, and in theory any student can contribute, but in practice hardly anything is ever accepted from a prep. Evelyn is a skull and owlite, and her cousin is editor of the quill. She evidently thought I was waxing sarcastic at her expense, and ignored me for the rest of her call, except for one dear little jab when dress came up for discussion. "'I want one of the new ties,' she said. There are some sweet ones at Jones and McCallum's, and they are awfully smart. The little black velvet ribbon you are wearing around your neck, Miss Starr, is rather becoming. I used to wear one myself when they were in style. I couldn't think of anything clever to say in retort. I can think of clever things so easily when there is no one to say them to. So I said nothing but merely smiled very slowly and disdainfully. That seemed to annoy Evelyn more than speech, for I heard she said afterwards that, that emily star had a very affected smile note one can do a great deal with appropriate smiles i must study the subject carefully the friendly smile the scornful smile the detached smile the entreating smile the common or garden grin as for miss brownell or rather mrs blake i met her on the street a few days ago after she passed she said something to her companion and they both laughed very bad manners i think i like shrewsbury and i like school but i shall never like aunt ruth's house it has a disagreeable personality houses are like people some you like and some you don't and once in a while there is one you love outside this house is covered with frippery i feel like getting a broom and sweeping it off inside its rooms are all square and proper and soulless nothing you could put into them would never seem to belong to them there are no nice romantic corners in it as there are at New Moon. My room hasn't improved on acquaintance, either. The ceiling oppresses me. It comes down so low over my bed, and Aunt Ruth won't let me move the bed. She looked amazed when I suggested it. The bed has always been in that corner, she said, just as she might have said. The sun has always risen in the east. But the pictures are really the worst thing about this room. Chromos of the most aggravated description. Once I turned them all to the wall, and of course Aunt Ruth walked in. She never knocks, and noticed them at once. Emily, why have you meddled with the pictures? Aunt Ruth is always asking why I do this and that. Sometimes I can explain and sometimes I can't. This was one of the times I couldn't. But of course I had to answer Aunt Ruth's question. No disdainful smile would do here. Queen Alexandra's dog color gets on my nerves, I said and Byron's expression on his deathbed at Miss Olonghi hinders me from studying. "'Emily,' said Aunt Ruth, "'you might try to show a little gratitude.' I wanted to say, 
to whom queen alexandra or lord byron but of course i didn't instead i meekly turned all the pictures right side out again you haven't told me the real reason why you turned those pictures said aunt ruth sternly i suppose you don't mean to tell me deep and sly deep and sly i always said you were the very first time i saw you at maywood i said you were the slyest child i had ever seen aunt ruth why do you say such things to me i said in exasperation is it because you love me and want to improve me or hate me and want to hurt me or just because you can't help it miss impertinence please remember that this is my house and you will leave my pictures alone after this i will forgive you for meddling with them this time but don't let it happen again i will find out your motive in turning them around clever as you think yourself aunt ruth stalked out but i know she listened on the landing quite a while to find out if i would begin talking to myself she is always watching me even when she says nothing does nothing i know she is watching me i feel like a little fly under a microscope not a word or action escapes her criticism and though she can't read my thoughts she attributes thoughts to me that i never had any idea of thinking i hate that worse than anything else can't i say anything good of aunt ruth of course i can she's honest and virtuous and truthful and industrious and of her pantry she needeth not to be ashamed but she hasn't any lovable virtues and she will never give up trying to find out why i turned the pictures she will never believe that i told her the simple truth of course things might be worse as teddy says it might have been queen victoria instead of queen alexandra i have some pictures of my own pinned up that save me some lovely sketches of new moon in the old orchard that teddy made for me and an engraving dean gave me it is a picture in soft dim colours of palms around a desert well and a train of camels passing across the sands against a black sky gemmed with stars it is full of lure and mystery and when i look at it i forget queen alexandra's jewellery and lord byron's lugubrious face and my soul slips out out through a little gateway into a great vast world of freedom and dream aunt ruth asked me where i got that picture when i told her she sniffed and said i can't understand how you have such a liking for jarback priest he's a man i have no use for i shouldn't think she would have but if the house is ugly and my room unfriendly the land of uprightness is beautiful and saves my soul alive the land of uprightness is the fir grove behind the house i call it that because the firs are all so exceedingly tall and slender and straight there is a pool in it veiled with ferns with a big grey boulder beside it it is reached by a little winding capricious path so narrow that only one can walk in it when i'm tired or lonely or angry or too ambitious i go there and sit for a few minutes nobody can keep an upset mind looking at those slender cross tips against the sky i go there to study on fine evenings though aunt ruth is suspicious and thinks it is just another manifestation of my slyness soon it will be dark too early to study there and i'll be so sorry somehow my books have a meaning there they never have anywhere else there are so many dear green corners in the land of uprightness full of the aroma of sun-steeped ferns and grassy open spaces where pale asters feather the grass swaying gently towards each other when the wind-woman runs among them and just to the left of my window there is a group of tall old firs that look in moonlight or twilight like a group of witches weaving spells of sorcery when i first saw them one windy night against the red sunset with the reflection of my candle like a weird signal flame suspended in the air among their boughs the flash came for the first time in shrewsbury and i felt so happy that nothing else mattered i have written a poem about them but oh i burn to write stories i knew it would be hard to keep my promise to aunt elizabeth but i didn't know it would be so hard every day it seems harder such splendid ideas for plots pop into my mind then i have to fall back on character studies of the people i know i have written several of them i always feel so strongly tempted to touch them up a bit deep in the shadows bring out the highlights a little more vividly but i remember that i promised aunt elizabeth never to write anything that wasn't true so i stay my hand and try to paint them exactly as they are i have written one of aunt ruth interesting but dangerous i never leave my jimmy book or my diary in my room i know aunt ruth rummages through it when i'm out so i always carry them in my book bag 
Ilsa was up this evening, and we did our lessons together. Aunt Ruth frowns on this, and, to be strictly just, I don't know that she is wrong. Ilsa is so jolly and comical that we laugh more than we study, I'm afraid. We don't do so well in class next day, and besides, this house disproves of laughter. Perry and Teddy like the high school. Perry earns his lodging by looking after the furnace and grounds and his board by waiting on the table. Besides, he gets twenty-five cents an hour for doing odd jobs. I don't see much of him or Teddy except in the weekends home, for it is against the school rules for boys and girls to walk together to and from school. Lots do it, though. I had several chances to, but I concluded that it would not be in keeping with New Moon traditions to break the rule. Besides, Aunt Ruth asks me every blessed night when I come home from school if I've walked with anybody. I think she's sometimes a little disappointed when I say no. Besides, I didn't much fancy any of the boys who wanted to walk with me. October twenty, nineteen something My room is full of boiled cabbage smells tonight, but I dare not open my window. Too much night air outside. I would risk it for a little while if Aunt Ruth hadn't been in a very bad humor all day. Yesterday was my Sunday in Shrewsbury, and when we went to church, I sat in the corner of the pew. I did not know that Aunt Ruth must always sit there, but she thought I did it on purpose. She read her Bible all the afternoon. I felt she was reading it at me, though I couldn't imagine why. This morning she asked me why I did it. Did what? I said in bewilderment. Emily, you know what you did. I will not tolerate this slyness. What was your motive? Aunt Ruth, I haven't the slightest idea what you mean, I said, quite haughtily, for I felt I was not being treated fairly. Emily, you sat in the corner of the pew yesterday just to keep me out of it. Why did you do it? I looked down at Aunt Ruth. I am taller than she is now, and I can do it. She doesn't like it either. I was angry, and I think I had a little of the Murray look on my face. The whole thing seemed so contemptible to be making a fuss over. If I did it to keep you out of it, isn't that why? I said, as contemptuously as I felt. I picked up my book bag and stalked to the door. There I stopped. It occurred to me that, whatever the Murrays might or might not do, I was not behaving as a star should. Father wouldn't have approved of my behavior. So I turned and said very politely, I should not have spoken like that, Aunt Ruth, and I beg your pardon. I didn't mean anything by sitting in the corner. It was just because I happened to go into the pew first. I didn't know you preferred the corner. Perhaps I overdid the politeness. At any rate, my apology only seemed to irritate Aunt Ruth the more. She sniffed and said, I will forgive you this time, but don't let it happen again. Of course I didn't expect you would tell me your reason. You are too sly for that. Aunt Ruth, Aunt Ruth, if you keep on calling me sly, you'll drive me into being sly in reality, and then watch out. If I choose to be sly, I could twist you round my finger. It's only because I'm straightforward that you can manage me at all. I have to go to bed every night at nine o'clock. People who are threatened with consumption require a good deal of sleep. When I come home from school there are chores to be done, and I must study in the evenings. So I haven't a moment of time for writing anything. I know Aunt Elizabeth and Aunt Ruth have had a conference on the subject, but I have to write. So I get up in the morning as soon as it is daylight, dress and put on a coat, for the mornings are cold now, sit down and scribble for a priceless hour. I didn't choose that Aunt Ruth should discover it and call me sly, so I told her I was doing it. She gave me to understand that I was mentally unsound and would make a bad end in some asylum, but she didn't actually forbid me, probably because she thought it would be of no use. It wouldn't. I've got to write. That's all there is to it. That hour in the grey morning is the most delightful one in the day for me. Lately, being forbidden to write stories, I've been thinking them out. But one day it struck me that I was breaking my compact with Aunt Elizabeth in spirit, if not in letter, so I have stopped it. I wrote a character study of Ilsa today. Very fascinating. It is difficult to analyze her. She is so different and unexpectable. I coined that word myself. She doesn't even get mad like anybody else. I enjoy her tantrums. She doesn't say so many awful things in them as she used to, but she is piquant. Piquant is a new word for me. I like using a new word. I never think I really own a word until I've spoken or written it. I am writing by my window. I love to watch the Shrewsbury lights twinkle out in the dusk over that long hill. I had a letter from Dean today. He is in Egypt, among ruined shrines of old gods and the tombs of old kings. 
I saw that strange land through his eyes. I seemed to go back with him through the old centuries. I knew the magic of its skies. I was Emily of Karnak or Thebes, not Emily of Shrewsbury at all. That is a trick Dean has. Aunt Ruth insisted on seeing his letter, and when she read it she said it was impious. I should never have thought of that adjective. October 21, 19-something I climbed the steep little wooded hill in the land of uprightness tonight, and had an exultation on its crest. There's always something satisfying in climbing to the top of a hill. There was a fine tang of frost in the air, the view over Shrewsbury Harbor was very wonderful, and the woods all about me were expecting something to happen soon. At least that is the only way I can describe the effect they had on me. I forgot everything. Aunt Ruth's stings and Evelyn Blake's patronage and Queen Alexandra's dog collar, everything in life that isn't just right. Lovely things came flying to meet me like birds. They weren't my thoughts. I couldn't think anything half so exquisite. They came from somewhere. Coming back on that dark little path where the air was full of nice whispering sounds, I heard a chuckle of laughter in a fir copse just behind me. I was startled and a little bit alarmed. I knew at once it wasn't human laughter. It was a bit more like the puckish mirth of fairy folk, with just a faint hint of malice in it. I can no longer believe in wood elves. Alas, one loses so much when one becomes incredulous. So this laughter puzzled me. And yes, a horrid, crawly feeling began in my spine. Then suddenly I thought of owls, and I knew it for it what it was, a truly delightful sound, as if some survival of the golden age were chuckling to himself there in the dark. There were two of them, I think, and they were certainly having a good time over some owlish joke. I must write a poem about it, though I'll never be able to put into words half the charm and devilry of it. Ilsa was up on the carpet in the principal's room yesterday for walking home from school with Guy Lindsay. Something Mr. Hardy said made her so furious that she snatched up a vase of chrysanthemums that was on his desk and hurled it against the wall, where of course it was smashed to pieces. "'If I hadn't thrown it at the wall, I'd have had to throw it at, at you,' she told him. It would have gone hard with some girls, but Mr. Hardy is a friend of Dr. Burnley's. Besides, there's something about those yellow eyes of Ilsa's that do things to you. I know exactly how she would look at Mr. Hardy after she had smashed the vase. All her rage would be gone and her eyes would be laughing and daring. Impudent, Aunt Ruth would call it. Mr. Hardy merely told her she was acting like a baby and would have to pay for the vase, since it was school property. That rather squelched Ilsa. She thought it a tame ending to her heroics. I scolded her roundly. Really, somebody has to bring Ilsa up, and nobody but me seems to feel any responsibility in the matter. Dr. Burnley will just roar with laughter when she tells him. But I might as well have scolded the wind woman. Ilsa just laughed and hugged me. Honey, it made such a jolly smash. When I heard it, it wasn't a bit mad any more. Ilsa recited at our school concert last week, and everybody thought her wonderful. Aunt Ruth told me today that she expected me to be a star pupil. She wasn't punning on my name. Oh, no, Aunt Ruth hasn't a nodding acquaintance with puns. All the pupils who make ninety per cent average at Christmas exams and do not fall below eighty in any subject are called star pupils and are given a gold star pin to wear for the rest of the term. It is a coveted distinction, and of course not many win it. If I fail, Aunt Ruth will rub it into the bone. I must not fail. October 30, 19-something The November quill came out today. I sent my owl poem in to the editor a week ago, but he didn't use it. And he did use one of Evelyn Blake's, a silly simpering little rhyme about autumn leaves, very much the sort of thing I wrote three years ago. And Evelyn condoled with me before the whole room full of girls because my poem hadn't been taken. I suppose Tom Blake told her about it. You mustn't feel badly about it, Miss Starr. Tom said it wasn't half bad, but of course not up to the quill's standard. Likely in another year or two you'll be able to get in. Keep on trying. Thanks, I said. I'm not feeling badly. Why should I? I didn't make beam rhyme with green in my poem. If I had, I'd be feeling very badly indeed. Evelyn colored to her eyes. Don't show your disappointment so plainly, child, she said. But I noticed she dropped the subject after that. 
For my own satisfaction I wrote a criticism of Evelyn's poem in my Jimmy book as soon as I came home from school. I modelled it on MacHelay's essay on poor Robert Montgomery, and I got so much fun out of it that I didn't feel sore and humiliated any more. I must show it to Mr. Carpenter when I go home. He'll chuckle over it. November 6, 19-something I noticed this evening, in glancing over my journal, that I soon gave up recording my good and bad deeds. I suppose it was because so many of my doings were half and half. I never could decide in what class they belonged. We are expected to answer roll call with a quotation on Monday mornings. This morning I repeated a verse from my own poem, A Window That Faces the Sea. When I left assembly to go down to the prep classroom, Miss Aylmer, the vice-principal, stopped me. "'Emily, that was a beautiful verse you gave at roll call. Where did you get it, and do you know the whole poem?' I was so elated I could hardly answer. "'Yes, Miss Aylmer, very demurely. "'I would like a copy of it,' said Miss Aylmer. "'Could you write me off one, and who is the author?' "'The author,' I said, laughing, "'is Emily Bird Star. The truth is, Miss Almer, that I forgot to look up a quotation for roll call and couldn't think of any in a hurry, so I just fell back on a bit of my own. Miss Almer didn't say anything for a moment. She just looked at me. She is a stout middle-aged woman with a square face and nice wide grey eyes. Do you still want the poem, Miss Almer? I said, smiling. Yes, she said, looking at me in that funny way, as if she had never seen me before. Yes and autograph it, please. I promised and went on down the stairs. At the foot I glanced back. She was still looking after me. Something in her look made me feel glad and proud and happy and humble, and, and prayerful. Yes, that was just how I felt. Oh, this has been a wonderful day. What care I now for the quill or Evelyn Blake? This evening Aunt Ruth marched up town to see Uncle Oliver's Andrew, who was in the bank there. She made me go along. She gave Andrew lots of good advice about his morals and his meals and his underclothes, and asked him to come down for an evening whenever he wished. Andrew is a Murray, you see, and can therefore rush in where Teddy and Perry dare not tread. He is quite good-looking, with straight, well-groomed red hair. But he always looked as if he'd just been starched and ironed. I thought the evening not wholly wasted, for Mrs. Garden, his landlady, has an interesting cat who made certain advances to me. But when Andrew patted him and called him poor pussy, the intelligent animal hissed at him. "'You mustn't be too familiar with a cat,' I advised Andrew. "'And you must speak respectfully to and of him.' "'Piffle!' said Aunt Ruth. "'But a cat's a cat for all that.' November 8, 19-something The nights are cold now. When I came back Monday I brought one of the new moon gin jars for my comforting. I cuddle down with it in bed and enjoy the contrasting roars of the storm wind outside in the land of uprightness and the rain whirling over the room. Aunt Ruth worries for fear the cork will come out and deluge the bed. That would be almost as bad as what really did happen night before last. I woke up about midnight with the most wonderful idea for a story. I felt I must rise at once and jot it down in a jimmy book before I forgot it. Then I could keep it until my three years are up and I am free to write it. I hopped out of bed, and, in pawing around my table to find my candle, I upset my ink bottle. Then, of course, I went mad and couldn't find anything. Matches, candles, everything had disappeared. I set the ink bottle up, but I knew there was a pool of ink on the table. I had ink all over my fingers and dared not touch anything in the dark, and I couldn't find anything to wipe it off. And all the time I heard that ink drip dripping on the floor. In desperation I opened the door with my toes, because I dare not touch it with my inky hands, and went downstairs where I wiped my hands on the stove rag and got some matches. But this time, of course, Aunt Ruth was up, demanding whys and motives. She took my matches, lighted her candle, and marched me upstairs. Oh, twas a gruesome sight! How could a small stone ink bottle hold a quart of ink? There must have been a quart to make the mess it did. I felt like the old Scotch immigrant who came home one evening, found his house burned down and his entire family sculpted by Indians, and said, This is perfectly ridiculous. The table cover was ruined, the carpet was soaked, even the wallpaper was bespattered. But Queen Alexandra smiled benignly over all, and Byron went on dying. Aunt Ruth and I had an hour's seance with salt and vinegar. Aunt Ruth wouldn't believe me, 
when I said I got up to jot down the plot of a story. She knew I had some other motive, and it was just some more of my deepness and slyness. She also said a few other things which I won't write down. Of course I deserved a scolding for leaving that ink bottle uncorked. But I didn't deserve all she said. However, I took it all very meekly. For one thing, I had been careless, and for another I had my bedroom shoes on. Anyone can overcrow me when I'm wearing bedroom shoes. Then she wound up by saying she would forgive me this time, but it was not to happen again. Perry won the mile race in the school sports and broke the record. He bragged too much about it, and Elsa raged at him. November 11th, 19-something Last night Aunt Ruth found me reading David Copperfield and crying over Davy's alienation from his mother, with a black rage against Mr. Murdstone in my heart. She must know why I was crying, and wouldn't believe me when I told her. "'Crying over people who never existed,' said my Aunt Ruth incredulously. "'Oh, but they do exist,' I said. "'Why, they're as real as you are, Aunt Ruth. Do you mean to say that Miss Betsy Trotwood is a delusion?' I thought perhaps I could have real tea when I came to Shrewsbury, but Aunt Ruth says it is not healthy. So I drink cold water, for I will not drink cambric tea any longer, as if I were a child. November 30, 19-something. Andrew was in tonight. He always comes the Friday night I don't go to New Moon. Aunt Ruth left us alone in the parlor and went out to a meeting of the ladies' aid. Andrew, being a Murray, can be trusted. I don't dislike Andrew. It would be impossible to dislike so harmless a being. He is one of those good, talkative, awkward dears who goad you irresistibly into tormenting them. Then you feel remorseful afterwards because they are so good. Tonight, Aunt Ruth being out, I tried to discover how little I could really say to Andrew while I pursued my own train of thought. I discovered that I could get along with very few words, yes, no, in several inflections, with or without a little laugh. I don't know. Really, well, well, how wonderful, especially the last. Andrew talked on, and when he stopped for breath, I stuck in, how wonderful. I did it exactly eleven times. Andrew liked it. I knew it gave him a nice flattering feeling that he was wonderful, and his conversation wonderful. Meanwhile, I was living a splendid imaginary dream life by the river of Egypt in the days of Thotmus I. So we were both very happy. I think I'll try it again. Andrew's too stupid to catch me at it. When Aunt Ruth came home, she asked, Well, how did you and Andrew get along? She asks that every time he comes down. I know why. I know the little scheme that is understood among the Murrays, even though I don't believe any of them have ever put it into words. Beautifully, I said. Andrew's improving. He said one interesting thing tonight, and he hadn't so many feet and hands as usual. I don't know why I say things like that to Aunt Ruth occasionally. It would be so much better for me if I didn't. But something, whether it's Murray or Starr or Shipley or Burnley, or just pure cousinness I know not, makes me say them before I have time to reflect. No doubt you would find more congenial company in Stovepipe Town, says Aunt Ruth. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight Not Proven. Emily regretfully left the bookshop, where the aroma of books and new magazines was as the savour of sweet incense in her nostrils, and hastened down cold and blustery Prince Street. Whenever possible, she slipped into the bookshop and took hungry dips into magazines she could not afford to buy avid to learn what kind of stuff they published especially poetry she could not see that many of the verses in them were any better than some of her own yet editors sent hers back religiously emily had already used a considerable portion of the american stamps she had bought with cousin jimmy's dollar in paying the homeward way of her fledglings accompanied by only the cold comfort of rejection slips her owl's laughter had already been returned six times but Emily had not wholly lost faith in it yet. That very morning she had dropped it again into the letter-box at the shop. "'The seventh time brings luck,' she thought, as she turned down the street leading to Ilsa's boarding-house. 
She had her examination in English at eleven o'clock, and she wanted to glance over Elsa's notebook before she went for it. The preps were almost through their terminal examinations, taking them by fits and starts when the classrooms were free from seniors and juniors, a thing that always made the preps furious. Emily felt comfortably certain she would get her star pin. The examinations in her hardest subjects were over, and she did not believe she had fallen below eighty in any of them. Today was English, in which she ought to go well over ninety. Remained only history, which she also loved. Everybody expected her to win the star pin. Cousin Jimmy was intensely excited over it, and Dean had sent her premature congratulations from the top of a pyramid, so sure was he of her success. His letter had come the previous day, along with the packet containing his Christmas gift. "'I send you a little gold necklace that was taken from the mummy of a dead princess of the nineteenth dynasty,' wrote Dean. Her name was Mina, and it said in her epitaph that she was sweet of heart so I think she fared well in the Hall of Judgment, and that the dread old god smiled indulgently upon her. This little amulet lay on her dead breast for thousands of years. I send it to you weighted with centuries of love. I think it must have been a love gift. Else why should it have rested on her heart all this time? It must have been her own choice. Others would have put a finer thing on the neck of a king's daughter. The little trinket intrigued Emily with its charm and mystery, yet she was almost afraid of it. She gave a slight ghostly shudder as she clasped it around her slim white throat and wondered about the royal girl, who had worn it in those days of a dead empire. What would its history and its secret? Naturally, Aunt Ruth had disapproved. What business had Emily to be getting Christmas presents from Jarback Priest? At least he might have sent you something new if he had to send anything, she said. A souvenir of Cairo, made in Germany, suggested Emily gravely. Something like that agreed Aunt Ruth unsuspiciously. Mrs. Ayers has a handsome gold-mounted glass paperweight with a picture of the Sphinx in it that her brother brought her from Egypt. That battered thing looks positively cheap. Cheap! Aunt Ruth, do you realize that this necklace was made by hand and worn by an Egyptian princess before the days of Moses? Oh, well, if you want to believe Jarback Priest's fairy tales, said Aunt Ruth, much amused. I wouldn't wear it in public if I were you, Emily. The Murrays never wear shabby jewelry. You're not going to leave it on tonight, child. Of course I am. The last time it was worn was probably at the court of Pharaoh in the days of the oppression. Now it will go to Kit Barrett, snowshoe dance. What a difference! I hope the ghost of Princess Mina won't haunt me tonight. She may resent my sacrilege. Who knows? But it was not I who rifled her tomb, and somebody would have this if I didn't. "'somebody who mightn't think of the little princess at all. "'I'm sure she would rather that it was warm and shining about my neck "'than in some grim museum for thousands of curious cold eyes to stare at. "'She was sweet of heart,' Dean says. "'She won't grudge me her pretty pendant. "'Lady of Egypt, whose kingdom has been poured on the desert sands like spilled wine, "'I salute you across the gulf of time.' "'Emily bowed deeply and waved her hand adown the vistas of dead centuries. "'Such high fault in language is very foolish,' <laughs> sniffed Aunt Ruth. "'Oh, most of that last sentence was a quotation from Dean's letter,' said Emily candidly. "'Sounds like him,' was Aunt Ruth's contemptuous agreement. "'Well, I think your Venetian beads would be better than that heathenish-looking thing. "'Now, mind you, don't stay too late, Emily. "'Make Andrew bring you home not later than twelve. "'Emily was going with Andrew to Kitty Barrett's dance.' a privilege quite graciously accorded since Andrew was one of the elect people. Even when she did not get home until one o'clock, Aunt Ruth overlooked it. But it left Emily rather sleepy for the day, especially as she had studied late the two previous nights. Aunt Ruth relaxed her rigid rules in examination time and permitted an extra allowance of candles. What she would have said had she known that Emily used some of the extra candlelight to write a poem on shadows, I do not know and cannot record, but no doubt she would have considered it an added proof of slyness. Perhaps it was sly. Remember that I am only Emily's biographer, not her apologist. Emily found Evelyn Blake in Ilse's room, and Evelyn Blake was secretly much annoyed, because she had not been invited to the snowshoe dance, and Emily Starr had. 
Therefore Evelyn, sitting on Ilse's table and swinging her high, silken-sheathed instep flauntingly in the face of girls who had no silk stockings, was prepared to be disagreeable. "'I am glad you have come, trusty and well-beloved,' moaned Ilse. "'Evelyn has been clapper-clawing me all the morning. Perhaps she'll whirl in at you now and give me a rest.' "'I have been telling her that she should learn to control her temper,' said Evelyn virtuously. "'Don't you agree with me, Miss Starr?' "'What have you been doing now, Elsa?' asked Emily. "'Oh, I had a large quarrel with Mrs. Adamson this morning. "'It was bound to come sooner or later. "'I've been good so long there was an awful lot of wickedness bottled up in me. "'Mary knew that, didn't you, Mary?' "'Mary felt quite sure an explosion was due to happen. "'Mrs. Adamson began it by asking disagreeable questions. "'She's always doing that, isn't she, Mary?' "'After that she started in scolding, and finally she cried. "'Then I slapped her face.' "'You see,' said Evelyn significantly. "'I couldn't help it,' grinned Ilsa. "'I could have endured her impertinence and her scolding, "'but when she began to cry, she's so ugly when she cries. "'Well, I just slapped her.' "'I suppose you felt better after that,' said Emily, "'determined not to show any disapproval before Evelyn. "'Ilsa burst out laughing. <laughs> "'Yes, at first. It "'Stopped her yowling, anyway. "'But afterwards came remorse.' I'll apologize to her, of course. I do feel real sorry, but I'm quite likely to do it again. If Mary here weren't so good, I wouldn't be half as bad. I have to even the balance up a bit. Mary is meek and humble, and Mrs. Adamson walks all over her. You should hear her scold Mary if Mary goes out more than one evening a week. She is right, said Evelyn. It would be much better if you went out less. You're getting talked about, Ilsa. "'You weren't out last night, anyhow, were you, dear?' asked Ilsa, with another unholy grin. Evelyn coloured and was haughtily silent. Emily buried herself in her notebook, and Mary and Ilsa went out. Emily wished Evelyn would go, too, but Evelyn had no intention of going. "'Why don't you make Ilsa behave herself?' she began in a hatefully confidential sort of way. "'I have no authority over Ilsa,' said Emily coldly. "'Besides, I don't think she misbehaves.' "'Oh, my dear girl, why, you heard her yourself saying she slapped Mrs. Adamson.' "'Mrs. Adamson needed it. She's an odious woman, always crying when there's no need in the world for her to cry. There's nothing more aggravating.' "'Well, Ilsa skipped French again yesterday afternoon and went for a walk up river with Ronnie Gibson. If she does that too often, she's going to get caught.' "'Ilsa is very popular with the boys,' said Emily, who knew that Evelyn wanted to be. "'She's popular in the wrong quarters.' Evelyn was condescending now, knowing by instinct that Emily Starr hated to be condescended to. "'She always has a ruck of wild boys after her. The nice ones don't bother with her, you notice.' "'Ronnie Gibson's nice, isn't he?' "'Well, what do you say to Marshall Ord?' "'Ilsa has nothing to do with Marshall Ord.' "'Oh, hasn't she?' She was driving with him till twelve o'clock last Tuesday night, and he was drunk when he got the horse from the livery stable. I don't believe a word of it. Ilsa never went driving with Marsh Ord. Emily was white-lipped with indignation. I was told by a person who saw them. Ilsa is being talked about everywhere. Perhaps you have no authority over her, but surely you have some influence. Though you do foolish things yourself sometimes, don't you? not meaning any harm perhaps that time you went bathing on the blairwater sands without any clothes on for instance that's known about all through the school i heard marsh's brother laughing about it now wasn't that foolish my dear emily blushed with anger and shame though quite as much over being my deared by evelyn blake as anything else that beautiful bathing by moonlight what a thing of desecration it had been made by the world she would not discuss it with evelyn she would not even tell Evelyn they had their petticoats on. Let her think what she would. "'I don't think you quite understand some things, Miss Blake,' she said, with a certain fine detached irony of tone and manner, which made very commonplace words seem charged with meanings unutterable. "'Oh, you belong to the chosen people, don't you?' Evelyn laughed her malicious little laugh. "'I do,' said Emily, refusing to withdraw her eyes from her notebook. "'Well, don't get so vexed, dear. "'I only spoke because I thought it a pity "'to see poor Ilsa getting in wrong everywhere. 
I rather like her, poor soul. And I wish she would tone down her taste in colors a bit. That scarlet evening dress she wore at the prep concert. Really, you know, it's weird. She looked like a golden lily in a scarlet sheath, I thought, said Emily. What a loyal friend you are, dear. I wonder if Ilsa would stand up for you like that. Well, I suppose I ought to let you study. You have English at ten, haven't you? Mr. Scoville is going to watch the room. Mr. Travers is sick. Don't you think Mr. Scoville's hair is wonderful? Speaking of hair, dear, why don't you dress yours low enough at the sides to hide your ears? The tips, anyway. I think it would become you so much better. Emily decided that if Evelyn Blake called her dear again, she would throw an ink bottle at her. Why didn't she go away and let her study? Evelyn had another shot in her locker. That callow young friend of yours from Stovepipe Town has been trying to get into the quill. He sent in a patriotic poem. Tom showed it to me. It was a scream. One line especially was delicious. Canada, like a maiden, welcomes back her sons. You should have heard Tom howl. Emily could hardly help smiling herself, though she was horribly annoyed with Perry for making such a target of himself. Why couldn't he learn his limitations and understand the slopes of Parnassaw? was not for him. I do not think the editor of the quill has any business to show rejected contributions to outsiders, she said coldly. Oh, Tom doesn't look on me as an outsider. And that really was too good to keep. Well, I think I'll run down to the shop. Emily sighed with relief as Evelyn took her departure. Presently Ilsa returned. Evelyn gone? Sweet temper she was in this morning. I can't understand what Mary sees in her. Mary's a decent sort, though she isn't exciting. Ilsa, said Emily seriously, were you out driving with Marsh Ord one night last week? Ilsa stared. No, you dear young ass, I wasn't. I can guess where you heard that yarn. I don't know who the girl was. But you cut French and went up river with Ronnie Gibson. Peccavi. Ilsa, you shouldn't really— Now, don't make me mad, Emily, said Ilsa shortly. You're getting too smug. Something ought to be done to cure you before it gets chronic. I hate prunes and prisms. I'm off. I want to run round to the shop before I go to school. Ilsa gathered up her books pettishly and flounced out. Emily yawned and decided she was through with the notebook. She had half an hour yet before it was necessary to go to the school. She would lie down on Ilsa's bed for just a moment. It seemed the next minute when she found herself sitting up, staring with dismayed face at Mary Carswell's clock. Five minutes to eleven, five minutes to cover a quarter of a mile and be at her desk for examination. Emily flung on coat and cap, caught up her notebooks and fled. She arrived at the high school out of breath, with a nasty subconsciousness that people had looked at her queerly, as she tore through the streets, hung up her wraps without a glance at the mirror, and hurried into the classroom. A stare of amazement, followed by a ripple of laughter, went over the room. Mr. Scoville, tall, slim, elegant, was giving out the examination papers. He laid one down before Emily and said gravely, "'Did you look in your mirror before you came to class, Miss Starr?' "'No,' said Emily resentfully, sensing something fearfully wrong somewhere. "'I think I would look now, if I were you.' Mr. Scoville seemed to be speaking with difficulty. Emily got up and went back to the girls' dressing room. She met Principal Hardy in the hall, and Principal Hardy stared at her. Why Principal Hardy stared, why the preps had laughed, Emily understood when she confronted the dressing room, looking glass. Drawn skillfully and blackly across her upper lip and her cheeks was a mustache, a flamboyant, very black mustache, with fantastically curled ends. For a moment Emily gaped at herself in blank horror. Why, what, who had done it? She whirled furiously about. Evelyn Blake had just entered the room. You, you did this, panted Emily. Evelyn stared for a moment, then went off into a peal of laughter. <laughs> Emily Starr, you look like a nightmare. Do you mean to tell me you went into class with that on your face? Emily clenched her hands. You did it, she said again. Evelyn drew herself up very haughtily. Really, Miss Starr, I hope you don't think I'd stoop to such a trick. I suppose your dear friend Ilsa thought she'd play a joke on you. She was chuckling over something when she came in a few minutes ago. Ilsa never did it, cried Emily. 
Evelyn shrugged her shoulders. "'I'd wash it off first and find out who did it afterward,' she said with a twitching face as she went out. Emily, trembling from head to foot with anger, shame, and the most intense humiliation she had ever suffered, washed the moustache off her face. Her first impulse was to go home. She could not face that room full of preps again. Then she set her teeth and went back, holding her black head very high as she walked down the aisle to her desk. Her face was burning, and her spirit was aflame. In the corner she saw Ilse's yellow head bent over her paper. The others were smiling and tittering. Mr. Scovel was insultingly grave. Emily took up her pen, but her hand shook over her paper. If she could have had a good cry there and then, her shame and anger would have found a saving vent. But that was impossible. She would not cry. She would not let them see the depths of her humiliation. If Emily could have laughed off the malicious joke, it would have been better for her. But Emily, being one of the proud Murrays, she could not. She resented the indignity to the very core of her passionate soul. As far as the English paper was concerned, she might almost as well have gone home. She had lost twenty minutes already. It was ten minutes before she could steady her hand sufficiently to write. Her thoughts she could not command at all. The paper was a difficult one, as Mr. Traver's papers always were. Her mind seemed a chaos of jostling ideas, spinning around a fixed point of torturing shame. When she handed in her paper and left the classroom, she knew she had lost her star. That paper would be no more than a pass if it were that. But in her turmoil of feeling she did not care. She hurried home to her unfriendly room, thankful that Aunt Ruth was out, threw herself on the bed, and wept. She felt sore, beaten, bruised, and under all her pain was a horrible, teasing little doubt. Did Ilse do it? No, she didn't. She couldn't have. Who, then? Mary? The idea was absurd. It must have been Evelyn. Evelyn had come back and played that cruel trick on her out of spite and pique. Yet she had denied it, with seemingly insulted indignation, and eyes that were perhaps a shade too innocent. What had Ilse said? You are getting positively smug. Something ought to be done to cure you before it gets chronic. Had Ilse taken that abominable way of curing her? No, no, no! Emily sobbed fiercely into her pillow, but the doubt persisted. Aunt Ruth had no doubt. Aunt Ruth was calling on her friend, Mrs. Ball, and her friend, Mrs. Ball, had a daughter who was a prep. Anita Ball came home with the tale that had been well laughed over in prep and junior and senior classes, and Anita Ball said that Evelyn Blake had said Ilsa Burnley had done the deed. Well, said Aunt Ruth, invading Emily's room on her return home, I hear Ilsa Burnley decorated you beautifully today. I hope you realize what she is now. Ilsa didn't do it, said Emily. Have you asked her? No, I wouldn't insult her with such a question. Well, I believe she did do it, and she is not to come here again. Understand that? Aunt Ruth! You've heard what I said, Emily. Ilsa Burnley is no fit associate for you. I've heard too many tales about her lately, but this is unpardonable. Aunt Ruth, if I ask Ilsa if she did it, and she says she did not, won't you believe her? No, I wouldn't believe any girl brought up as Ilsa Burnley was. It's my belief she'd do anything and say anything. Don't let me see her in my house again. Emily stood up and tried to summon the Murray look into a face distorted by weeping. Of course, Aunt Ruth, she said coldly, I won't bring Ilsa here if she is not welcome. But I shall go to see her. And if you forbid me, I'll, I'll go home to New Moon. I feel as if I wanted to go anyhow now, only I won't let Evelyn Blake drive me away. Aunt Ruth knew quite well that the new moon folks would not agree to a complete divorce between Emily and Ilsa. They were too good friends with the doctor for that. Mrs. Dutton had never liked Dr. Burnley. She had to be content with the excuse for keeping Ilsa away from her house, for which she had long hankered. Her own annoyance over the matter was not born out of any sympathy with Emily, but solely from anger at a Murray being made ridiculous. I would have thought that you'd had enough of going to see Ilsa. As for Evelyn Blake, she is too clever and sensible a girl to have played a silly trick like that. I know the Blakes. They are an excellent family, and Evelyn's father is well-to-do. Now stop crying. A pretty face you've got. What sense is there in crying? None at all, agreed Emily drearily. Only I can't help it. 
I can't bear to be made ridiculous. I can endure anything but that. Oh, Aunt Ruth, please leave me alone. I can't eat any supper. You've got yourself all worked up, star-like. We Murrays conceal our feelings. I don't believe you've any to conceal, some of you, thought Emily rebelliously. Keep away from Ilsa Burnley after this, and you'll not be so likely to be publicly disgraced, was Aunt Ruth's parting advice. Emily, after a sleepless night, during which it seemed to her that if she couldn't push that ceiling farther from her face, she would surely smother, went to see Ilsa the next day and reluctantly told her what Aunt Ruth had said. Ilsa was furious, but Emily noted with a pang that she did not assert any innocence of the crayon trick. "'Ilsa, you—you didn't really do that?' she faltered. She knew Ilsa hadn't. She was sure of it, but she wanted to hear her say so. To her surprise, a sudden blush swept over Elsa's face. "'Is thy servant a dog?' she said, rather confusedly. It was very unlike straightforward, outspoken Ilsa to be so confused. She turned her face away and began fumbling aimlessly with her book-bag. "'You don't suppose I'd do anything like that to you, Emily?' "'No, of course not,' said Emily slowly. The subject was dropped. But the little doubt and distrust at the bottom of Emily's mind came out of its lurking-place and declared itself. Even yet she couldn't believe Ilsa could do such a thing, and lie about it afterward. But why was she so confused and shamefaced? Would not an innocent Ilsa have stormed about according to form, berated Emily roundly for mere suspicion, and aired the subject generally until all the venom had been blown out of it? It was not referred to again but the shadow was there, and spoiled, to a certain extent, the Christmas holidays at New Moon. Outwardly, the girls were the friends they had always been. But Emily was acutely conscious of a sudden rift between them. Strive as she would, she could not bridge it. The seeming unconsciousness of any severance on Ilsa's part served to deepen it. Hadn't Ilsa cared enough for her and her friendship to feel the chill that had come over it? Could she be so shallow and indifferent as not to perceive it? Emily brooded and grew morbid over it. A thing like that, a dim, poisonous thing that lurked in shadow and dared not come into the open, always played havoc with her sensitive and passionate temperament. No open quarrel with Ilsa could have affected her like this. She had quarreled with Ilsa scores of times and made up the next minute with no bitterness or backward glance. This was different. The more Emily brooded over it, the more monstrous it grew. She was unhappy, absent, restless. Aunt Laura and Cousin Jimmy noticed it, but attributed it to her disappointment over the star-pin. She had told them she was sure she would not win. But Emily had ceased to care about the star-pin. To be sure, she had a bad time of it when she went back to high school and the examination results were announced. She was not one of the envied four who flaunted star-pins, and Aunt Ruth rubbed it in for weeks. Aunt Ruth felt that she had lost family prestige in Emily's failure, and she was very bitter about it. Altogether Emily felt that the new year had come in very inauspiciously for her. The first month of it was a time she never liked to recall. She was very lonely. Elsa could not come to her, and though she made herself go to see Elsa, the subtle little rift between them was slowly widening. Elsa gave no sign of feeling it, but then, somehow, she was seldom alone with Elsa now. The room was always filled with girls, and there was a good deal of noise and laughter and jokes and school gossip, all very harmless and even jolly, but very different from the old intimacy and understanding comradeship with Ilsa. Formerly it used to be a chummy jest between them that they could walk or sit for hours together, and say no word, and yet feel that they had had a splendid time. There were no such silences now. When they did happen to be alone together they both chattered gaily and shallowly as if each were secretly afraid that there might come a moment for the silence that betrays. Emily's heart ached over their lost friendship. Every night her pillow was wet with tears. Yet there was nothing she could do. She could not, try as she would, banish the doubt that possessed her. She made many an honest effort to do so. She told herself every day that Elsa Burnley could never have played that trick, that she was constitutionally incapable of it, and went straight away to Ilsa with the firm determination to be just what she had always been to her, with the result that she was unnaturally cordial and friendly, even gushing, and no more like her real self than she was like Evelyn Blake. Ilsa was just as cordial and friendly, and the rift was wider still. 
Ilsa never goes into a tantrum with me now, Emily reflected sadly. It was quite true. Ilsa was always good-tempered with Emily, presenting a baffling front of politeness unbroken by a single flash of her old wild spirit. Emily felt that nothing could have been more welcome than one of Ilsa's stormy rages. It might break the ice that was forming so relentlessly between them, and release the pent-up flood of old affection. One of the keenest things in this situation was that Evelyn Blake was quite well aware of the state of affairs between Ilsa and Emily. The mockery of her long brown eyes and the hidden sneer in her casual sentences betrayed her knowledge and her enjoyment of it. This was gall and wormwood to Emily, who felt that she had no defense against it. Evelyn was a girl whom intimacies between other girls annoyed, and the friendship between Ilsa and Emily had annoyed her especially. It had been so complete, so absorbing. There had been no place in it for anyone else, and Evelyn did not like to feel that she was barred out, that there was some garden enclosed, into which she might not enter. She was therefore hugely delighted to think that this vexingly beautiful friendship between two girls she secretly hated was at an end. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine A Supreme Moment. Emily came downstairs laggingly, feeling that all the color and music had somehow gone out of life, and that it stretched before her in unbroken grayness. Ten minutes later she was encompassed by rainbows, and the desert of her future had blossomed like the rose. The cause of this miracle of transformation was a thin letter which Aunt Ruth handed to her with an Aunt Ruthian sniff. There was a magazine, too, but Emily did not at first regard it. She saw the address of a floral firm on the corner of the envelope, and sensed at touch the promising thinness of it, so different from the plump letters full of rejected verses. Her heart beat violently as she tore it open and glanced over the typewritten sheet. Miss Emily B. Starr, Shrewsbury, P.E. Island, Canada. Dear Miss Starr, it gives us great pleasure to tell you that your poem, Owl's Laughter, has been found available for use in garden and woodland. It appears in the current issue of our magazine, a copy of which we are sending you. Your verses have the true ring, and we shall be glad to see more of your work. It is not our custom to pay cash for our contributions, but you may select two dollars' worth of seeds or plants from our catalogue, to be sent to your address prepaid. Thanking you, we remain, yours truly, Foss E. Carlton and Company. Emily dropped the letter and seized upon the magazine with trembling fingers. She grew dizzy. The letters danced before her eyes. She felt a curious sensation of choking, for there on the front page, in a fine border of curlicues, was her poem, Owl's Laughter, by Emily Bird Starr. It was the first sweet bubble on the cup of success, and we must not think her silly if it intoxicated her. She carried the letter and magazine off to her room to gloat over it, blissfully unconscious that Aunt Ruth was doing an extra deal of sniffing. Aunt Ruth felt very suspicious of suddenly crimsoned cheek and glowing eye, and general air of rapture and detachment from earth. In her room Emily sat down and read her poem as if she had never seen it before. There was, to be sure, a printer's error in it that made the flesh creep on her bones. It was awful to have Hunter's Moon come out as Hunter's Moan, but it was her poem, hers, accepted and printed in a real magazine, and paid for. To be sure, a check would have been more acceptable. Two dollars all her own, earned by her own pen, would have seemed like riches to Emily. But what fun she and Cousin Jimmy would have selecting the seeds! She could see in imagination that beautiful flower-bed next summer in the new moon garden, a glory of crimson and purple and blue and gold. And what was it the letter said? Your verses have the true ring, and we shall be glad to see more of your work. O oh, bliss! O oh, rapture! The world was hers, the alpine path was as good as climbed. What signified a few more scrambles to the summit? Emily could not remain in that dark little room with its oppressive ceiling and unfriendly furniture. Lord Byron's funereal expression was an insult to her happiness. She threw on her wraps and hurried out to the land of uprightness. As she went through the kitchen, Aunt Ruth, naturally more suspicious than ever, inquired with markedly bland sarcasm, 
Is the house on fire, or the harbor? Neither. It's my soul that's on fire, said Emily, with an inscrutable smile. She shut the door behind her, and at once forgot Aunt Ruth and every other disagreeable thing in person. How beautiful the world was! How beautiful life was! How wonderful the land of uprightness was! The young firs along the narrow path were lightly powdered with snow, as if, thought Emily, a veil of aerial lace had been tricksily flung over austere young druid priestesses, forsworn to all such frivolities of vain adornment. Emily decided she would write that sentence down in her jimmy book when she went back. On and on she flitted to the crest of the hill. She felt as if she were flying. Her feet couldn't really be touching the earth. On the hill she paused and stood, a rapt, ecstatic figure, with clasped hands and eyes of dream. It was just after sunset. Out, over the ice-bound harbor, great clouds piled themselves up in dazzling iridescent masses. Beyond were gleaming white hills with early stars over them. Between the dark trunks of the old fir trees to her right, far away through the crystal evening air, rose a great round full moon. "'It has the true ring!' murmured Emily, tasting the incredible words anew. "'They want to see more of my work. Oh, if only father could see my verses in print!' Years before, in the old house at Maywood, her father, bending over her as she slept, had said, "'She will love deeply, suffer terribly. She will have glorious moments to compensate.' This was one of her glorious moments. She felt a wonderful lightness of spirit, a soul-stirring joy in mere existence. The creative faculty, dormant through the wretched month just past, suddenly burned in her soul like a purifying flame. It swept away all morbid, poisonous, rankling things. All at once Emily knew that Ilsa had never done that. She laughed joyously, amusedly. "'What a little fool I've been! Oh, such a little fool! Of course Ilsa never did it! There's nothing between us now. It's gone, gone, gone! I'll go right to her and tell her so!' Emily hurried back adown her little path. The land of uprightness lay all about her, mysterious in the moonlight, wrapped in the exquisite reticence of winter woods. She seemed one with its beauty and charm and mystery. With a sudden sigh of the wind-woman through the shadowy aisles came the flash, and Emily went dancing to Ilsa with the afterglow of it in her soul. She found Ilsa alone, threw her arms around her, hugged her fiercely. Ilsa, do forgive me, she cried. I shouldn't have doubted you. I did doubt you, but now I know. I know. You will forgive me? You young goat, said Ilsa. Emily loved to be called a young goat. This was the old Ilsa, her Ilsa. Oh, Ilsa, I've been so unhappy. Well, don't bawl over it, said Ilsa. I haven't been very hilarious myself. Look here, Emily, I've got something to tell you. Shut up and listen. That day I met Evelyn at the shop, and we went back for some books she wanted, and we found you sound asleep. So sound asleep that you never stirred when I pinched your cheek. Then just for devilment I picked up a black crayon and said, I'm going to draw a mustache on her. Shut up! Evelyn pulled a long face and said, Oh, no, that would be mean, don't you think? I hadn't the slightest intention of doing it. I'd only spoken in fun. But that shrimp Evelyn's ungodly affectation of righteousness made me so mad that I decided I would do it. Shut up! I meant to wake you right up and hold a glass before you, that was all. But before I could do it, Kate Errol came in and wanted us to go along with her, and I threw down the chalk and went out. That's all, Emily, honest to Caesar. But it made me feel ashamed and silly later on. I'd say a bit conscience-stricken if I had such a thing as a conscience, because I felt that I must have put the idea into the head of whoever did it, and so was responsible in a way. And then I saw you distrusted me, and that made me mad. Not temporary mad, you see, but a nasty, cold, inside sort of madness. I thought you had no business to even suspect that I could have done such a thing as let you go to class like that. And I thought, since you did, you could go on doing it. I wouldn't say one word to put matters straight. Golly, but I'm glad you're through with seeing things. Do you think Evelyn Blake did it? No. Oh, she's quite capable of it, of course. But I don't see how it could have been she. She went to the shop with Kate and me, and we left her there. She was in class fifteen minutes later, so I don't think she'd have had time to go back and do it. I really think it was that little devil of a May Hilson. She'd do anything, and she was in the hall when I was flourishing the crayon. She'd take the suggestion as a cat laps milk. But it couldn't have been Evelyn. 
Emily retained her belief that it could have been and was, but the only thing that mattered now was the fact that Aunt Ruth still believed Ilsa guilty and would continue to believe so. "'Well, that's a rotten shame,' said Ilsa. "'We can't have any real chum talks here. Mary always has such a mob in an E.B. pervades the place.' "'I'll find out who did it yet,' said Emily darkly, "'and make Aunt Ruth give in.' On the next afternoon, Evelyn Blake found Ilsa and Emily in a beautiful row. At least, Ilsa was rowing, while Emily sat with her legs crossed and a bored, haughty expression in her insolently half-shut eyes. It should have been a welcome sight to a girl who disliked the intimacies of other girls. But Evelyn Blake was not rejoiced. Ilsa was quarreling with Emily again. Ergo, Ilsa and Emily were on good terms once more. "'I'm so glad to see you've forgiven Elsa for that mean trick,' she said sweetly to Emily the next day. "'Of course it was just pure thoughtlessness on her part. I've always insisted on that. She never stopped to think what ridicule she was letting you in for. Poor Ilsa is like that. You know I tried to stop her. I didn't tell you this before, of course. I didn't want to make any more trouble than there was, but I told her it was a horribly mean thing to do to a friend. I thought I had put her off.' "'It's sweet of you to forgive her, Emily, dear. "'You are better-hearted than I am. "'I'm afraid I could never pardon anyone who had made me such a laughing-stock. "'Why didn't you slay her in her tracks?' said Elsa, when she heard of it from Emily. "'I simply half shut my eyes and looked at her like a murray,' said Emily. "'And that was more bitter than death.'" End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The Madness of an Hour. The high school concert in aid of the school library was an annual event in Shrewsbury, coming off in early April before it was necessary to settle down to hard study for spring examinations. This year it was at first intended to have the usual program of music and readings with a short dialogue. Emily was asked to take part in the latter, and agreed, after securing Aunt Ruth's very grudging consent, which would probably never have been secured if Miss Aylmer had not come in person to plead for it. Miss Aylmer was a granddaughter of Senator Aylmer, and Aunt Ruth yielded to family what she would have yielded to nothing else. Then Miss Aylmer suggested cutting out most of the music and all the readings, and having a short play instead. This found favor in the eyes of the students, and the change was made forthwith. Emily was cast for a part that suited her, so she became keenly interested in the matter, and enjoyed the practices, which were held in the school building two evenings of the week, under the chaperonage of Miss Almer. The play created quite a stir in Shrewsbury. Nothing so ambitious had been undertaken by the high school students before. It became known that most of the Queen's Academy students were coming up from Charlottetown on the evening train to see it. This drove the performers half wild. The Queen's students were old hands at putting on plays. Of course they came to criticize. It became a fixed obsession with each member of the cast to make the play as good as any of the Queen's Academy plays had been. And every nerve was strained to that end. Kate Earle's sister, who was a graduate of a school of oratory, coached them, and when the evening of the performance arrived, there was burning excitement in the various homes and boarding-houses of Shrewsbury. Emily, in her small candle-lighted room, looked at Emily in the glass, with considerable satisfaction, a satisfaction that was quite justifiable. The scarlet flush of her cheeks, the deepening darkness of her grey eyes, came up brilliantly above the ashes of Rose's gown, and the little wreath of silver leaves twisted around her black hair made her look like a young dryad. She did not, however, feel like a dryad. Aunt Ruth had made her take off her lace stockings and put on cashmere ones, had tried, indeed, to make her put on woolen ones, but had gone down in defeat at that point, retrieving her position, however, by insisting on a flannel petticoat. "'Horrid, bunchy thing,' thought Emily resentfully, meeting the petticoat, of course. But the skirts of the day were full, and Emily's slenderness could carry even a thick flannel petticoat. She was just fastening her Egyptian chain around her neck when Aunt Ruth stalked in. One glance was sufficient to reveal that Aunt Ruth was very angry. "'Emily, Mrs. Ball has just called. She told me something that amazed me. Is this a play you're taking part in tonight?' "'Of course it's a play, Aunt Ruth. Surely you knew that.' 
"'When you asked my permission to take part in this concert, you told me it was a dialogue,' said Aunt Ruth icily. "'Oh, but Miss Elmer decided to have a little play in place of it. I thought you knew, Aunt Ruth. I truly I did. I thought I mentioned it to you.' You didn't think anything of the kind, Emily. You deliberately kept me in ignorance because you knew I wouldn't have allowed you to take part in a play. Indeed, no, Aunt Ruth, pleaded Emily gravely. I never thought of hiding it. Of course, I didn't feel like talking much to you about it because I knew you didn't approve of the concert at all. When Emily spoke gravely, Aunt Ruth always thought she was impudent. This crowns all, Emily. Sly as I've always known you to be, I wouldn't have believed you could be as sly as this. There was nothing of the kind about it, Aunt Ruth, said Emily impatiently. It would have been silly of me to try to hide the fact that we were getting up a play when all Shrewsbury is talking of it. I don't see how you could help hearing of it. You knew I wasn't going anywhere because of my bronchitis. Oh, I see through it all, Emily. You cannot deceive me. I haven't tried to deceive you. I thought you knew. That is all there is to it. I thought the reason you never spoke of it was because you were opposed to the whole thing. That is the truth, Aunt Ruth. What difference is there between a dialogue and a play? There is every difference, said Aunt Ruth. Plays are wicked. But this is such a little one, pleaded Emily despairingly, and then laughed, because it sounded so ridiculously like the nursemaid's excuse in Midshipman Easy. Her sense of humor was untimely, her laughter infuriated Aunt Ruth. Little or big, you are not going to take part in it. Emily stared again, paling a little. Aunt Ruth, I must! Why, the play would be ruined! Better a play ruined than a soul ruined, retorted Aunt Ruth. Emily dared not smile. The issue at stake was too serious. Don't be so, so indignant, Aunt Ruth. She had nearly said unjust. I'm sorry you don't approve of plays. I won't take part in any more. But you can see I must do it tonight. Oh, my dear Emily, I don't think you are quite as indispensable as all that. Certainly Aunt Ruth was very maddening. How disagreeable the word dear could be. Still was Emily patient. I really am, tonight. You see, they couldn't get a substitute at the last moment. Miss Almer would never forgive me. "'Do you care more about Miss Alma's forgiveness than God's?' demanded Aunt Ruth, with the air of one stating a decisive position. "'Yes, then your God's,' muttered Emily, unable to keep her patience under such insensate questions. "'Have you no respect for your forefathers?' was Aunt Ruth's next relevant query. "'Why, if they knew a descendant of theirs was play-acting, they would turn over in their graves.' Emily favoured Aunt Ruth with a sample of the Murray look. It would be excellent exercise for them. I am going to take my part in the play tonight, Aunt Ruth. Emily spoke quietly, looking down from her young height with resolute eyes. Aunt Ruth felt a nasty sense of helplessness. There was no lock to Emily's door, and she couldn't detain her by physical force. If you go, you needn't come back here tonight, she said, pale with rage. This house is locked at nine o'clock. If I don't come back here tonight, I won't come at all. Emily was too angry over Aunt Ruth's unreasonable attitude to care for consequences. "'If you lock me out, I'll go back to New Moon. They know all about the play there. Even Aunt Elizabeth was willing for me to take part.' She caught up her coat and jammed the little red feather hat, which Uncle Oliver's wife had given her at Christmas, down on her head. Aunt Addie's taste was not approved at at New Moon, but the hat was very becoming, and Emily loved it. Aunt Ruth suddenly realized that Emily looked oddly mature and grown up in it. But the knowledge did not as yet dampen her anger. Emily was gone. Emily had dared to defy her and disobey her. Sly, underhand Emily. Emily must be taught a lesson. At nine o'clock a stubborn, outraged Aunt Ruth locked all the doors and went to bed. The play was a big success. Even the Queen students admitted that, and applauded generously. Emily threw herself into her part with a fire and energy generated by her encounter with Aunt Ruth, which swept away all hampering consciousness of flannel petticoats, and agreeably astonished Mrs. Earle, whose one criticism of Emily's acting had been that she was rather cold and reserved in a part that called for more abandon. Emily was showered with compliments at the close of the performance. Even Evelyn Blake said graciously, "'Really, dear, you are quite wonderful. A star actress, a poet, a budding novelist.' What surprise will you give us next? Thought Emily, 
condescending, insufferable creature, said Emily. Thank you. There was a happy, triumphant walk home with Teddy, a gay good night at the gate, and then the locked door. Emily's anger, which had been sublimated during the evening into energy and ambition, suddenly flared up again, sweeping everything before it. It was unbearable to be treated thus. She had endured enough at Aunt Ruth's hands. This was the proverbial last straw. One could not put up with everything, even to get an education. One owed something to one's dignity and self-respect. There were three things she could do. She could thump the old-fashioned brass knocker on the door until Aunt Ruth came down and let her in, as she had done once before, and then endure weeks of slurs because of it. She could fly up street and down street to Ilsa's boarding-house. The girls wouldn't be in bed yet, as she had likewise done once before, and as no doubt Aunt Ruth would expect her to do now, and then Mary Carswell would tell Evelyn Blake, and Evelyn Blake would laugh maliciously and tell it all through the school. Emily had no intention of doing either of these things. She knew from the moment she found the door locked just what she would do. She would walk to New Moon and stay there. Months of suppressed chafing under Aunt Ruth's perpetual stings burst into a conflagration of revolt. Emily marched out of the gate, slammed it shut behind her with no Murray dignity but plenty of star passion, and started on her seven-mile walk through the midnight. Had it been three times seven, she would have started just the same. So angry was she, and so angry she continued to be, that the walk did not seem long, nor, though she had no wrap save her cloth coat, did she feel the cold of the sharp April night. The winter's snow had gone, but the bare road was hard frozen and rough, no dainty footing for the thin kid slippers of Cousin Jimmy's Christmas box. Emily reflected with what she considered a grim sarcastic laugh that it was well, after all, that Aunt Ruth had insisted on cashmere stockings and a flannel petticoat. There was a moon that night, but the sky was covered with curdled gray clouds, and the harsh bleak landscape lay dourly in the pallid gray light. The wind came across it in sudden moaning gusts. Emily felt with considerable dramatic satisfaction that the night harmonized with her stormy tragic mood. She would never go back to Aunt Ruth's, that was certain. No matter what Aunt Elizabeth might say, and she would say a plenty, no doubt of that, no matter what any one would say. If Aunt Elizabeth would not let her go anywhere else to board, she would give up school altogether. She knew it would cause a tremendous upheaval at New Moon. Never mind! In her very reckless mood upheavals seemed welcome things. It was time somebody upheaved. She would not humiliate herself another day, that she would not. Aunt Ruth had gone too far at last. You could not safely drive a star to desperation." "'I have done with Ruth Dutton for ever,' vowed Emily, feeling a tremendous satisfaction in leaving off the aunt. As she drew near home the clouds cleared away suddenly, and when she turned into New Moon Lane the austere beauty of the three tall Lombardies against the moonlit sky made her catch her breath. Oh, how wonderful! For a moment she almost forgot her wrongs and Aunt Ruth. Then bitterness rushed over her soul again. Not even the magic of the three princesses could charm it away. There was a light shining out of the new moon window. Falling on the tall white birches in Lofty John's bush, with spectral effect, Emily wondered who could be up at New Moon. She had expected to find it in darkness, and had meant to slip in by the front door and up to her own dear room, leaving explanations to the morning. Aunt Elizabeth always locked and barred the kitchen door every night with great ceremony before retiring, but the front door was never locked. Tramps and burglars would surely never be so ill-mannered as to come to the front door of New Moon. Emily crossed the garden and peeped through the kitchen window. Cousin Jimmy was there alone, sitting by the table, with two candles for company. On the table was a stoneware crock, and just as Emily looked in he absently put his hand into it and drew out a chubby doughnut. Cousin Jimmy's eyes were fixed on a big beef ham hanging from the ceiling, and Cousin Jimmy's lips moved soundlessly. There was no reasonable doubt that Cousin Jimmy was composing poetry, though why he was doing it at that hour and night was a puzzle. Emily slipped around the house, opened the kitchen door gently, and walked in. Poor Cousin Jimmy in his amazement tried to swallow half a doughnut whole and then couldn't speak for several seconds. Was this Emily or an apparition? Emily in a dark blue coat, an enchanting little red feather hat, Emily with wind-blown night-black hair and tragic eyes, Emily with tattered kid slippers on her feet, 
Emily in this plight at new moon when she should have been sound asleep on her maiden couch in Shrewsbury? Cousin Jimmy seized the cold hands Emily held out to him. Emily, dear child, what has happened? Well, just to jump into the middle of things, I've left Aunt Ruth's and I'm not going back. Cousin Jimmy didn't say anything for a few moments. But he did a few things. First he tiptoed across the kitchen and carefully shut the sitting-room door. Then he gently filled the stove up with wood, drew a chair up to it, pushed Emily into it, and lifted her cold, ragged feet to the hearth. Then he lighted two more candles and put them on the chimney-piece. Finally he sat down in his chair again and put his hands on his knees. Now, tell me about it. Emily, still in the throes of rebellion and indignation, told it pretty fully. As soon as Cousin Jimmy got an inkling of what had really happened, he began to shake his head slowly, continued to shake it, shook it so long and gravely that Emily began to feel an uncomfortable conviction that instead of being a wronged, dramatic figure, she was by way of being a little bit of a fool. The longer Cousin Jimmy shook his head, the smaller grew her heroics. When she had finished her story with a defiant, conclusive, I'm not going back to Aunt Ruth's anyhow, Cousin Jimmy gave a final wag to his head and pushed the crock across the table. Have a doughnut, pussy. Emily hesitated. She was very fond of doughnuts, and it had been a long time since she had had her supper. But doughnuts seemed out of keeping with rebellion and tumult. They were decidedly reactionary in their tendencies. Some vague glimmering of this made Emily refuse the doughnut. Cousin Jimmy took one himself. So you're not going back to Shrewsbury? "'Not to Aunt Ruth's,' said Emily. "'It's the same thing,' said Cousin Jimmy. Emily knew it was. She also knew it was of no use to hope that Aunt Elizabeth would let her board elsewhere. "'And you walked all the way home over these roads?' Cousin Jimmy shook his head. "'Well, you have spunk. Heaps of it,' he added meditatively between bites. "'Do you blame me?' demanded Emily passionately all the more passionately because she felt some inward support had been shaken away by Cousin Jimmy's head. "'No, it was a dern mean shame to lock you out, just like Ruth Dutton. And you see, don't you, that I can't go back after such an insult!' Cousin Jimmy nibbled at the doughnut cautiously, as if bent on trying to see how near he could nibble to the hole without actually breaking through. "'I don't think any of your grandmothers would have given up a chance for an education so easily,' he said. "'Not on the Murray side, anyhow.' he added, after a moment's reflection, which apparently reminded him that he knew too little about the stars to dogmatize concerning them. Emily sat very still. As Teddy would have said in cricket parlance, Cousin Jimmy had got her middle wicket with the first ball. She felt at once that when Cousin Jimmy, in that diabolical fit of inspiration, dragged her grandmothers in, everything was over but the precise terms of surrender. She could see them all around her, the dear dead ladies of New Moon, Mary Shipley and Elizabeth Burnley, and all the rest, mild, determined, restrained, looking down with something of contemptuous pity on her, their foolish, impulsive descendant. Cousin Jimmy appeared to think there might be some weakness on the star side. While there wasn't, she would show him. She had expected more sympathy from Cousin Jimmy. She had known Aunt Elizabeth would condemn her, and even Aunt Laura would look disappointed question but she had counted on Cousin Jimmy taking her part. He always had before. "'My grandmothers never had to put up with Aunt Ruth,' she flung at him. "'They had to put up with your grandfathers.' Cousin Jimmy appeared to think that this was conclusive, as any one who had known Archibald and Hugh Murray might very well have thought. "'Cousin Jimmy, do you think I ought to go back and accept Aunt Ruth's scolding and go on as if this had never happened?' "'What do you think about it?' asked Cousin Jimmy. "'Do take a doughnut, pussy.' This time Emily took the doughnut. She might as well have some comfort. "'Now you can't eat doughnuts and remain dramatic. Try it.' Emily slipped from her peak of tragedy to the valley of petulance. "'Aunt Ruth has been abominable these past two months, ever since her bronchitis has prevented her from going out. You don't know what it's been like.' "'Oh, I do, I do.' Ruth Dutton never made anyone feel better pleased with herself. Feet getting warm, Emily? I hate her, cried Emily, still grasping after self-justification. It's horrible to live in the same house with anyone you hate. Poisonous, agreed Cousin Jimmy. And it isn't my fault. I have tried to like her, tried to please her. She's always twitting me. She attributes mean motives to everything I do or say or don't do or say. 
I've never heard the last of sitting in the corner of the pew and failing to get a star pin. She's always hinting insults to my father and mother, and she's always forgiving me for things I haven't done or that don't need forgiveness. Aggravating, very, conceded Cousin Jimmy. Aggravating, you're right. I know if I go back she'll say, I'll forgive you this time, but don't let it happen again. And she will sniff. Oh, Aunt Ruth's sniff is the hatefulest sound in the world. Ever hear a dull knife sawing through thick cardboard? murmured Cousin Jimmy. Emily ignored him and swept on. I can't be always in the wrong, but Aunt Ruth thinks I am, and she says she has to make allowances for me. She doses me with cod liver oil. She never lets me go out in the evening if she can help it. Consumptives should never be out after eight o'clock. If she is cold, I must put on an extra petticoat. She is always asking disagreeable questions and refusing to believe my answers. She believes, and always will believe, that I kept this play a secret from her because of slyness. I never thought of such a thing. Why, the Shrewsbury Times referred to it last week. Aunt Ruth doesn't often miss anything in the Times. She twitted me for days because she found a composition of mine that I had signed E-M-I-L-I-E. Better try to spell your name after some unheard of twist, she sneered. Well, wasn't it a bit silly, pussy? Oh, I suppose my grandmothers wouldn't have done it. But Aunt Ruth needn't have kept it up as she did. That is what is so dreadful, if she'd speak her mind on a thing and have it done with it. Why, I got a little spot of iron rust on my white petticoat, and Aunt Ruth harped on it for weeks. She was determined to find out when it was rusted and how, and I hadn't the least idea. Really, Cousin Jimmy, when this had gone on for three weeks, I thought I'd have to scream if she mentioned it again. Any proper person would feel the same, said Cousin Jimmy to the beef ham. Oh, any one of these things is only a pinprick, I know, and you think I'm silly to mind it, but— No, no. A hundred pinpricks would be harder to put up with than a broken leg. I'd sooner be knocked on the head and done with it. Yes, that's it. Nothing but pinpricks all the time. She won't let Ilsa come to the house, or Teddy, or Perry. Nobody but that stupid Andrew. I'm so tired of him. She wouldn't let me go to the prep dance. They had a sleigh drive and supper at the Brown Teapot Inn and a little dance. Everybody went but me. It was the event of the winter. If I go for a walk in the land of uprightness at sunset, she is sure there is something sinister in it. She never wants to walk in the land of uprightness, so why should I? She says I have got too high an opinion of myself. I haven't. Have I, Cousin Jimmy? No, said Cousin Jimmy thoughtfully. High, but not too high. She says I'm always displacing things. If I look out of a window, she'll trot across the room and mathematically match the corners of the curtains again. And it's why, why, why all the time, all the time, Cousin Jimmy. I know you feel a lot better now, now that you've got all that out of your system, said Cousin Jimmy. Another doughnut? Emily, with a sigh of surrender, took her feet off the stove and moved over to the table. The crock of doughnuts was between her and Cousin Jimmy. She was very hungry. Ruth giving you enough to eat? queried Cousin Jimmy anxiously. Oh, yes. Aunt Ruth keeps up one new moon tradition, at least. She has a good table. But there are no snacks. And you always liked the tasty bite at bedtime, didn't you? But you took a box back last time you were home. Aunt Ruth confiscated it. That is, she put it in the pantry and served its contents up at meal times. These doughnuts are good, and there is always something exciting and lawless about eating at unearthly hours like this, isn't there? How did you happen to be up, Cousin Jimmy? A sick cow. Thought I'd better sit up and look after her. It was lucky for me you were. Oh, I'm in my proper senses again, Cousin Jimmy. Of course I know you think I've been a little fool. Everybody's a fool in some particular, said Cousin Jimmy. Well, I'll go back and bite the sour apple without a grimace. Lie down on the sofa and have a nap. I'll hitch up the gray mare and drive you back as soon as it begins to be daylight. No, that won't do at all. Several reasons. In the first place, the roads aren't fit for wheels or runners. In the second place, we couldn't drive away from here without Aunt Elizabeth hearing us. And then she'd find out all about it, and I don't want her to. We'll keep my foolishness a dark and deadly secret between you and me, Cousin Jimmy. Then how are you going to get back to Shrewsbury? Walk. Walk? To Shrewsbury? At this hour of the night? Haven't I just walked from Shrewsbury at this hour? I can do it again, and it won't be any harder than bumping over those awful roads behind the gray mare. Of course I've put something on my feet that will be a little more protection than kid slippers. 
I've ruined your Christmas present in my brainstorm. There is a pair of my old boots in the closet there. I'll put them on, and my old ulster. I'll be back in Shrewsbury by daylight. I'll start as soon as we finish the doughnuts. Let's lick the platter clean, Cousin Jimmy. Cousin Jimmy yielded. After all, Emily was young and wiry. The night was fine, and the less Elizabeth knew about some things the better for all concerned. With a sigh of relief that the affair had turned out so well, he had really been afraid at first that Emily's underlying stubbornness had been reached, and then, whew, Cousin Jimmy settled down to doughnuts. "'How's the writing coming on?' he asked. "'I've written a good deal lately, though it's pretty cold in my room mornings, but I love it so. It's my dearest dream to do something worth while some day.' "'So you will. You haven't been pushed down a well,' said Cousin Jimmy. Emily patted his hand. None realized better than she what Cousin Jimmy might have done if he had not been pushed down a well. When the doughnuts were finished, Emily donned her old boots and ulster. It was a very shabby garment, but her young moon beauty shone over it like a star in the old dim candle-lighted room. Cousin Jimmy looked up at her. He thought that she was a gifted, beautiful, joyous creature, and that some things were a shame. "'Tall and stately. Tall and stately like all our women,' he murmured dreamily. "'Except Aunt Ruth.' he added. Emily laughed and made a face. Aunt Ruth will make the most of her inches in our forthcoming interview. This will last her the rest of the year. But don't worry, cousin darling, I won't do any more foolish things for quite a long time now. This has cleared the air. Aunt Elizabeth will think it was dreadful of you to eat a whole crockful of doughnuts yourself, you greedy cousin Jimmy. Do you want another blank book? Not yet. The last one you gave me is only half full yet. A blank book lasts me quite a while when I can't write stories. Oh, I wish I could, Cousin Jimmy. The time will come, the time will come, said Cousin Jimmy encouragingly. Wait a while, just wait a while. If we don't chase things, sometimes the things following us can catch up. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding is it established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. All pleasant and precious riches, Emily. Proverbs 24, 3rd and 5th. He let Emily out and bolted the door. He put out all the candles but one. He glared at it for a few minutes. Then, satisfied that Elizabeth could not hear him, Cousin Jimmy said fervently, "'Ruth Dutton can go to—to—to—' to, to, Cousin Jimmy's courage failed him. "'To heaven!' Emily went back to Shrewsbury through the clear moonlight. She had expected the walk to be dreary and weary, robbed of the impetuous anger and rebellion had given. But— she found that it had become transmuted into a thing of beauty, and Emily was one of the eternal slaves of beauty, of whom Carmen sings, who are yet masters of the world. She was tired, but her tiredness showed itself in a certain exultation of feeling and imagination such as she often experienced when over-fatigued. Thought was quick and active. She had a series of brilliant imaginary conversations, and thought out so many epigrams that she was agreeably surprised at herself. It was good to feel vivid and interesting and all alive once more. She was alone, but not lonely. As she walked along, she dramatized the night. There was about it a wild, lawless charm that appealed to a certain wild, lawless strain, hidden deep in Emily's nature, a strain that wished to walk where it would with no guidance but its own, the strain of the gypsy and the poet, the genius and the fool. The big fir trees, released from their burden of snow, were tossing their arms freely and wildly and gladly across the moonlit fields. Was ever anything so beautiful as the shadows of those grey, clean-limbed maples on the road at her feet? The houses she passed were full of intriguing mystery. She liked to think of the people who lay there, dreaming, and saw in sleep what waking life denied them. Of little children's dear hands folded in exquisite slumber. Of hearts that, perhaps, kept sorrowful, wakeful vigils, of lonely arms that reached out in the emptiness of the night, all while she, Emily, flitted by like a shadowy wraith of the small hours. And it was so easy to think, too, that other things were abroad, things that were not mortal or human. She had always lived on the edge of fairyland, and now she stepped right over it. The wind woman was really whistling eerily in the weeds of the swamp. She was sure she heard the dear diabolical chuckles of owls in the spruce copses. Something frisked across her path. It might be a rabbit, or it might be a little grey person. The trees put on half-pleasing, half-terrifying shapes they never wore by day. 
The damp thistles of last year were goblin groups along the fences. That shaggy old yellow birch was some satire of the woodland. The footsteps of the old gods echoed around her. Those gnarled stumps on the hill field were surely Pan piping through moonlight and shadow with his troop of laughing fauns. It was delightful to believe they were. One loses so much when one becomes incredulous, said Emily, and then thought, and truly a little afraid of the results to Emily herself if she had really gone to New Moon in those thin shoes and that insufficient coat. For Ruth Dutton was not a fiend, only a rather stupid, stubborn little barnyard fowl trying to train up a skylark. She was honestly afraid that Emily might catch a cold and go into consumption, and if Emily took it into her head not to come back to Shrewsbury, well, that would make talk, and Ruth Dutton hated talk when she or her doings was the subject. So all things considered, she decided to ignore the impertinence of Emily's greeting. "'Did you spend the night on the streets?' she asked grimly. "'Oh, dear, no. I went out to New Moon, had a chat with Cousin Jimmy and some lunch, and then walked back.' "'Did Elizabeth see you? Or Laura? No, they were asleep.' Mrs. Dutton reflected that this was just as well. "'Well,' she said coldly, "'you have been guilty of great ingratitude, Emily, but I'll forgive you this time.' then stopped abruptly. Hadn't that been said already this morning? Before she could think of a substitute remark, Emily had vanished upstairs. Mistress Ruth Dutton was left with the unpleasant sensation that, somehow or other, she had not come out of the affair quite as triumphantly as she should have. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Heights and Hollows. April twenty eighth, nineteen something. This was my weekend at New Moon, and I came back this morning. Consequently, this is Blue Monday, and I am homesick. Aunt Ruth, too, is always a little more unlivable on Mondays, or seems so by contrast with Aunt Laura and Aunt Elizabeth. Cousin Jimmy wasn't quite so nice this weekend as he usually is. He had several of his queer spells and was a bit grumpy for two reasons. In the first place, several of his young apple trees are dying because they were girdled by mice in the winter, and in the second place he can't induce Aunt Elizabeth to try the new creamers that everyone else is using. For my own part, I'm secretly glad that she won't. I don't want our beautiful old dairy and the glossy brown milk pans to be improved out of existence. I can't think of New Moon without a dairy. When I could get Cousin Jimmy's mind off his grievances, we explored the Carlton catalogue and discussed the best selections to make for my two dollars' worth of owl's laughter. We planned a dozen different combinations and beds, and got several hundred dollars' worth of fun out of it, but finally settled on a long, narrow bed full of asters, lavender down the middle, white around it, and a border of pale pink, with clumps of deep purple for sentinels at the four corners. I'm sure it will be beautiful, and I shall look at its September loveliness and think— this came out of my head. I have taken another step in the alpine path. Last week the lady's own journal accepted my poem, The Wind Woman, and gave me two subscriptions to the journal for it. No cash, but that may come yet. I must make enough money before long to pay Aunt Ruth every cent my living with her has cost her. Then she won't be able to twit me with the expense I am to her. She hardly misses a day without some hint of it. No, Mrs. Beatty, I feel I can't give quite as much to missions this year as usual. My expenses have been much heavier, you know. Oh, no, Mr. Morrison, your new goods are beautiful, but I can't afford a silk dress this spring. This Davenport should really be upholstered again. It's getting fearfully shabby, but it's out of the question now for a year or two. So it goes. But my soul doesn't belong to Aunt Ruth. Owl's laughter was copied in the Shrewsbury Times, Hunter's moan and all. Evelyn Blake, I understand, says she doesn't believe I wrote it at all. She's sure she read something exactly like it somewhere some years ago. Dear Evelyn. Aunt Elizabeth said nothing at all about it, but Cousin Jimmy told me she cut it out and put it in the Bible she keeps on the stand by her bed. When I told her I was to get two dollars' worth of seeds for it, she said I'd likely find when I sent for them that the firm had gone bankrupt. I have a notion to send that little story about the child that Mr. Carpenter liked, to golden hours. I wish I could get it typewritten, but that's impossible, so I shall have to write it very plainly. 
I wonder if I dare. They would surely pay for a story. Dean will soon be home. How glad I'll be to see him. I wonder if he'll think I've changed much. I've certainly grown taller. Aunt Laura says I will soon have to have really long dresses and put my hair up, but Aunt Elizabeth says fifteen is too young for that. She says girls are not so womanly at fifteen nowadays as they were in her time. Aunt Elizabeth is really frightened, I know, that if she lets me grow up I'll be eloping, like Juliet. But I'm in no hurry to grow up. It's nicer to be just like this, betwixt and between. Then if I want to be childish I can be, none daring to make me ashamed, and if I want to behave maturely I have the authority of my extra inches. It's a gentle, rainy evening to-night. There are pussy-willows out in the swamp, and some young birches in the land of uprightness have cast a veil of transparent purple over their bare limbs. I think I will write a poem on A Vision of Spring. May 5th, 19-something There has been quite an outbreak of spring poetry in high school. Evelyn has won in the May quill on flowers. Very wobbly rhymes. And Perry, he also felt the annual spring urge, as Mr. Carpenter calls it, and wrote a dreadful thing called The Old Farmer Sows His Seed. He sent it to the quill, and the quill actually printed it, in the jokes column. Perry is quite proud of it, and doesn't realize that he has made an ass of himself. Ilsa turned pale with fury when she read it, and hasn't spoken to him since. She says he isn't fit to associate with. Ilsa is far too hard on Perry, and yet when I read the thing, especially the verse, I've plowed and harrowed and sown, I've done my best, now I'll leave the crop alone, and let God do the rest. I wanted to murder him myself. Perry can't understand what's wrong with it. It rhymes, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it rhymes. Ilsa has also been raging at Perry lately, because he has been coming to school with all but one button off his coat. I couldn't endure it myself, so when we came out of class I whispered to Perry to meet me for five minutes by the fern pool at sunset. I slipped out with needle, thread, and buttons and sewed them on. He didn't see why it wouldn't have done to wait till Friday night and have Aunt Tom sew it on. I said, "'Why didn't you sew them on yourself, Perry?' "'I've no buttons and no money to buy any,' he said. "'But never mind. Some day I will have gold buttons if I want them.' Aunt Ruth saw me coming in with thread and scissors, etc., and of course wanted to know where, what, and why. I told her the whole tale, and she said, "'You'd better let Perry Miller's friends sew his buttons on for him.' "'I'm the best friend he's got,' I said. "'I don't know where you get your low tastes from,' said Aunt Ruth." May 7, 19-something. This afternoon after school, Teddy rode Ilsa and me across the harbour to pick mayflowers in the spruce barrens up the Green River. We got basketfuls and spent a perfect hour wandering about the barrens with the friendly murmur of the little fir trees all around us. As somebody said of strawberries, so say I of mayflowers. God might have made a sweeter blossom, but never did. When we left for home, a thick white fog had come in over the bar and filled the harbour. But Teddy rode in the direction of the train whistles, so we hadn't any trouble, really, and I thought the experience quite wonderful. We seemed to be floating over a white sea in an unbroken calm. There was no sound save the faint moan of the bar, the deep sea call beyond, and the low dip of the oars in the glassy water. We were alone in a world of mist on a veiled, shoreless sea. Now and then, for just a moment, a cool air current lifted the mist curtain, and dim coasts loomed phantom-like around us. Then the blank whiteness shut down again. It was as though we sought some strange, enchanted shore that ever receded farther and farther. I was really sorry when we got to the wharf, but when I reached home I found Aunt Ruth all worked up on account of the fog. "'I knew I shouldn't have allowed you to go,' she said. "'There wasn't any danger, really, Aunt Ruth,' I protested. "'And look at my lovely mayflowers.' Aunt Ruth wouldn't look at the mayflowers. "'No danger in a white fog.' "'Suppose you had got lost, and a wind had come up before you reached land.' "'How could one get lost on little Shrewsbury Harbour, Aunt Ruth?' I said. "'The fog was wonderful, wonderful. "'It seemed as if we were voyaging over the planet's rim into the depth of space.' "'I spoke enthusiastically, and I suppose I looked a bit wild with mist drops on my hair, "'for Aunt Ruth said coldly, pityingly, "'It is unfortunate that you are so excitable, Emily.' It is maddening to be frozen and pitied, so I answered recklessly. But think of the fun you miss when you're not excitable, Aunt Ruth. There's nothing more wonderful than dancing round a blazing fire. What matter if it end in ashes? 
"'When you are as old as I am,' said Aunt Ruth, "'you will have more sense than to go into ecstasies over white fogs. "'It seems to me impossible that I shall ever grow old or die. "'I know I will, of course, but I don't believe it.' "'I didn't make any answer to Aunt Ruth, so she started on another tack. "'I was watching Ilsa go past. "'Emily, does that girl wear any petticoats?' "'Her clothing is silk and purple,' I murmured, quoting the Bible verse, simply because there's something in it that charms me. One couldn't imagine a finer or simpler description of a gorgeously dressed woman. I don't think Aunt Ruth recognized the quotation. She thought I was just trying to be smart. "'If you mean that she wears a purple silk petticoat, Emily, say so in plain English. Silk petticoats, indeed. If I had anything to do with her, I'd silk petticoat her. "'Some day I'm going to wear silk petticoats,' I said. "'Oh, indeed, miss, and may I ask you what you have got to get silk petticoats with?' "'I've got a future,' I said, as proudly as the murriest of all the Murrays could have said it. Aunt Ruth sniffed. "'I have filled my room with mayflowers, and even Lord Byron looks as if there might be a chance of recovery.' "'May 13, 19-something. "'I have made the plunge and sent my story something different to golden hours.' I actually trembled as I dropped it into the box at the shop. Oh, if it should be accepted! Perry has set the school laughing again. He said in class that France exported fashions. Ilsa walked up to him when class came out and said, You spawn! She hasn't spoken to him since. Evelyn continues to say sweet cutting things and laugh. I might forgive her the cutting things, but never the laugh. May 15, 19 something. We had our prep powwow last night. It always comes off in May. We had it in the assembly room of the school, and when we got there we found we couldn't light the gas. We didn't know what was the matter, but suspected the juniors. Today we discovered that they had cut off the gas in the basement and locked the basement doors. At first we didn't know what to do, then I remembered that Aunt Elizabeth had brought Aunt Ruth a big box of candles last week for my use. I tore home and got them, Aunt Ruth being out, and we stuck them all around the room. So we had our pow-wow after all, and it was a brilliant success. We had such fun improvising candle holders that we got off to a good start, and somehow the candlelight was so much more friendly and inspiring than gas. We all seemed to be able to think of wittier things to say. Everybody was supposed to make a speech on any subject he or she wished. Perry made the speech of the evening. He had prepared a speech on Canadian history. Very sensible, and I suspect dull but at the last minute he changed his mind and spoke on candles, just making it up as he went along, telling of all the candles he saw in different lands when he was a little boy sailing with his father. It was so witty and interesting that we sat enthralled, and I think the students will forget about French fashions and the old farmer who left the hoeing and weeding to God. Aunt Ruth hasn't found out about the candles yet, as the old box isn't quite empty. When I go to New Moon tomorrow night, I'll coax Aunt Laura to give me another box. I know she will, and I'll bring them to Aunt Ruth. May 22, 19-something. Today there was a hateful, long, fat envelope for me in the mail. Golden Hours had sent my story back. The accompanying rejection slip said, We have read your story with interest and regret to say that we cannot accept it for publication at the present time. At first I tried to extract a little comfort from the fact that they had read it with keen interest. Then it came home to me that the rejection slip was a printed one, so of course it is just what they send with all rejected manuscripts. The worst of it was that Aunt Ruth had seen the packet before I got home from school and had opened it. It was humiliating to have her know of my failure. I hope this will convince you that you'd better waste no more stamps on such nonsense, Emily. The idea of your thinking you could write a story fit to be published. I've had two poems published, I cried. Aunt Ruth sniffed. Oh, poems, of course they have to have something to fill up the corners. Perhaps it's so. I felt very flat as I crawled to my room with my poor story. I was quite content to fill a little space then. You could have packed me in a thimble. My story is all dog-eared and smells of tobacco. I have a notion to burn it. No, I won't. I'll copy it out again and try somewhere else. I will succeed. I think, from glancing over the recent pages of this journal, but I am beginning to be able to do without italics, but sometimes are necessary. New Moon, Blairwater, May 24, 19-something. 
For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds has come. I'm sitting on the sill of my open window in my own dear room. It's so lovely to get back to it every now and then. Out there, over lofty John's bush, is a soft yellow sky and one very white little star is just visible where the pale yellow shades off into paler green. Far off, down in the south, in regions mild of calm and serene air, are great clad palaces of rosy marble. Leaning over the fence is a choke cherry tree that is a mass of blossoms like creamy caterpillars. Everything is so lovely, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. Sometimes I think it isn't really worth while to try to write anything when everything is already so well expressed in the Bible. That verse I've just quoted, for instance, it makes me feel like a pygmy in the presence of a giant. Only twelve simple words, yet a dozen pages couldn't have better expressed the feeling one has in spring. This afternoon, Cousin Jimmy and I sewed our aster bed. The seeds came promptly. Evidently the firm has not gone bankrupt yet but Aunt Elizabeth thinks they are old stock and won't grow. Dean is home. He was down to see me last night, dear old Dean. He hasn't changed a bit. His green eyes are as green as ever, and his nice mouth as nice as ever, and his interesting face as interesting as ever. He took both my hands and looked earnestly at me. You have changed, Star, he said. You look more like spring than ever. But don't grow any taller, he went on. I don't want to have you looking down at me. I don't want to either. I'd hate to be taller than Dean. It wouldn't seem right at all. Teddy is an inch taller than I am. Dean says he has improved greatly in his drawing this past year. Mrs. Kent still hates me. I met her tonight when I was out for a walk with myself in the spring twilight, and she would not even stop to speak to me, just slipped by me like a shadow in the twilight. She looked at me for a second as she passed me, and her eyes were pools of hatred. I think she grows more unhappy every year. In my walk I went and said good evening to the disappointed house. I am always so sorry for it. It is a house that has never lived, that has not fulfilled its destiny. Its blind windows seem peering wistfully from its face, as if seeking vainly for what they cannot find. No home light has ever gleamed through them in summer dusk or winter darkness. And yet I feel somehow that the little house has kept its dream, and that some time it will come true. I wish I owned it. I dandered around all my old haunts tonight, Lofty John's Bush, Emily's Bower, the Old Orchard, the Pond Graveyard, the Today Road. I love that little road. It's like a personal friend to me. I think dandering is a lovely word of its kind, not in itself exactly, like some words, but because it is so perfectly expressive of its own meaning. Even if you've never heard it before, you'd know exactly what it meant. Dandering could mean only dandering. The discovery of beautiful and interesting words always gives me joy. When I find a new charming word, I exult as a jewel-seeker, and am unhappy until I've said it in a sentence. May twenty-nine, nineteen something. Tonight Aunt Ruth came home with a portentous face. "'Emily, what does this story mean that is all over Shrewsbury, "'that you were seen standing on Queen Street last night "'with a man's arms around you, kissing him?' "'I knew in a minute what had happened. "'I wanted to stamp, I wanted to laugh, I wanted to tear my hair. "'The whole thing was so absurd and ludicrous, "'but I had to keep a grave face and explain to Aunt Ruth. "'This is the dark, unholy tale.' Elsa and I were dandering along Queen Street last night at dusk. Just by the old tailor house we met a man. I do not know the man, not likely I shall ever know him. I do not know if he was tall or short, old or young, handsome or ugly, black or white, Jew or Gentile, bond or free. But I do know he hadn't shaved that day. He was walking at a brisk pace. Then something happened which passed in the wink of an eye, but takes several seconds to describe. I stepped aside to let him pass. He stepped in the same direction. I darted the other way. So did he. Then I thought I saw a chance of getting past, and I made a wild dash. He made a dash, with the result that I ran full tilt against him. He had thrown out his arms when he realized a collision was unavoidable. I went right between them, and in the shock of the encounter they involuntarily closed around me for a moment, while my nose came into violent contact with his chin. I, I beg your pardon, 
The poor creature gasped, dropped me as if I were a hot coal, and tore off around the corner. Ilsa was in fits. She said she had never seen anything so funny in her life. It had all passed so quickly that to a bystander it looked exactly as if that man and I had stopped, gazed at each other for a moment, then rushed madly into each other's arms. My nose ached for blocks. Ilsa said she saw Miss Taylor peering from the window just as it happened. Of course that old gossip has spread the story with her own interpretation of it. I explained all this to Aunt Ruth, who remained incredulous and seemed to consider it a very limping tale indeed. It's a very strange thing that on a sidewalk twelve feet wide you couldn't get past a man without embracing him, she said. Come now, Aunt Ruth, I said, I know you think me sly and deep and foolish and ungrateful. But you know I am half Murray, and do you think anyone with any Murray in her would embrace a gentleman friend on the public street? Oh, I did think you could hardly be so brazen, admitted Aunt Ruth. But Miss Taylor said she saw it. Everyone has heard it. I do not like to have one of my family talked out about like that. It would not have occurred if you had not been out with Ilsa Burnley in defiance of my advice. Do not let anything like this happen again. Things like that don't happen, I said. They are foreordained. June 3rd, 19-something The land of uprightness is a thing of beauty. I can go to the fern pool to write again. Aunt Ruth is very suspicious of this performance. She has never forgotten that I met Perry there one evening. The pool is very lovely now under its new young ferns. I look into it and imagine it is the legendary pool in which one could see the future. I picture myself tiptoeing to it at midnight, by full a moon, casting something precious into it, then looking timidly at what I saw. What would it show me? The alpine path gloriously climbs? Or failure? No, never failure. June nine, nineteen something. Last week Aunt Ruth had a birthday, and I gave her a centerpiece which I had embroidered. She thanked me rather stiffly and didn't seem to care anything about it. Tonight I was sitting in the bay window recess of the dining room doing my algebra by the last light. The folding doors were open, and Aunt Ruth was talking to Mrs. Ince in the parlor. I thought they knew I was in the bay, but I suppose the curtains hid me. All at once I heard my name. Aunt Ruth was showing the centerpiece to Mrs. Ince, quite proudly. My niece Emily gave me this on my birthday. See how beautifully it's done. She's very skillful with her needle. Could this be Aunt Ruth? I was so petrified with amazement that I could neither move nor speak. She is clever with more than her needle, said Mrs. Ince. I hear Principal Hardy expects her to head her class in the terminal examinations. Her mother, my sister Juliet, was a very clever girl, said Aunt Ruth. And she's quite pretty, too, said Mrs. Ince. Her father, Douglas Starr, was a remarkably handsome man, said Aunt Ruth. They went out then, for once an eavesdropper had heard something good of herself. But from Aunt Ruth! June 17, 19 something. My candle goeth not out by night now, at least not until quite late. Aunt Ruth lets me sit up because the terminal examinations are on. Perry infuriated Mr. Travers by writing at the end of his algebra paper, Matthew 7-5. When Mr. Travers turned it up, he read, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt seek clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Mr. Travers is credited with knowing much less about mathematics than he pretends to. So he was furious and threw Perry's paper out, as a punishment for impertinence. The truth is, poor Perry made a mistake. He meant to write Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He went and explained to Mr. Travers, but Mr. Travers wouldn't listen. Then Ilsa bearded the lion in his den, that is, went to Principal Hardy, told him the tale, and induced him to intercede with Mr. Travers. As a result, Perry got his marks, but was warned not to juggle with scripture texts again. June 28, 19-something. School's out. I have won my star pin. It has been a great old year of fun and study and stings. And now I'm going back to dear new moon for two splendid months of freedom and happiness. I'm going to write a garden book in vacation. The idea has been sizzling in my brain for some time, and since I can't write stories, I shall try my hand at a series of essays on Cousin Jimmy's garden, with a poem for a tailpiece to each essay. It will be good practice and will please Cousin Jimmy. End of chapter 11 
Chapter Twelve of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve at the Sign of the Haystack. Why do you want to do a thing like that? <laughs> said Aunt Ruth, sniffing, of course. A sniff may always be taken for granted with each of Aunt Ruth's remarks, even when the present biographer emits mention of it. To poke some dollars into my slim purse, said Emily. Holidays were over, the garden book had been written and read in installments to Cousin Jimmy, in the dusks of July and August, to his great delight, and now it was September, with its return to school and studies, the land of uprightness and Aunt Ruth. Emily, with skirts a fraction longer and her hair clubbed up so high in the cadogan braid of those days that it really was almost up, was back in Shrewsbury for her junior year, and she had just told Aunt Ruth what she meant to do on her Shrewsbury Saturdays for the autumn. The editor of the Shrewsbury Times was planning a special illustrated Shrewsbury edition, and Emily was going to canvass as much of the country as she could cover for subscriptions to it. She had wrung a rather reluctant consent from Aunt Elizabeth, a consent which could never have been extorted if Aunt Elizabeth had been paying all Emily's expenses at school. But there was Wallace paying for her books and tuition fees, and occasionally hinting to Elizabeth that he was a very fine, generous fellow to do so. Elizabeth, in her secret heart, was not over-fond of her brother Wallace, and resented his splendid airs over the little help he was extending to Emily. So when Emily pointed out that she could easily earn, during the fall, at least half enough to pay for her books for the whole year, Elizabeth yielded. Wallace would have been offended if she, Elizabeth, had insisted on paying Emily's expenses when he took a notion to it, but he could not reasonably resent Emily earning part for herself. He was always preaching that girls should be self-reliant and be able to earn their own way in life. Aunt Ruth could not refuse when Elizabeth had assented, but she did not approve. "'The idea of your wandering over the country alone!' "'Oh, I'll not be alone. Ilsa is going with me,' said Emily. Aunt Ruth did not seem to consider this much of an improvement. "'We're going to begin Thursday,' said Emily. "'There's no school Friday, owing to the death of Principal Hardy's father, and our classes are over at three on Thursday afternoon. We're going to canvass the western road that evening. "'May I ask if you intend to camp on the side of the road?' "'Oh, no, we'll spend the night with Ilse's aunt at Wiltney. Then on Friday we'll cut back to the western road, finish it that day, and spend Friday night with Mary Carswell's people at St. Clair, then work home Saturday by the river road.' "'It's perfectly absurd,' said Aunt Ruth. "'No Murray ever did such a thing. I'm surprised at Elizabeth. It simply isn't decent for two young girls like you and Ilsa to be wandering alone over the country for three days.' "'What do you suppose could happen to us?' asked Emily. "'A good many things might happen,' said Aunt Ruth severely. She was right. A good many things might, and did, happen in that excursion, but Emily and Ilsa set off in high spirits Thursday afternoon, two graceless schoolgirls with an eye for the funny side of everything, and a determination to have a good time. Emily especially was feeling uplifted. There had been another thin letter in the mail that day, with the address of a third-rate magazine in the corner, offering her three subscriptions to the said magazine for her poem Night in the Garden, which had formed the conclusion of her garden book and was considered both by herself and Cousin Jimmy to be the gem of the volume. Emily had left the garden book locked up in the mantel cupboard of her room at New Moon, but she meant to send copies of its tail-pieces to various publications during the fall. It augured well that the first one sent had been accepted so promptly. "'Well, we're off,' she said over the hills and far away. What an alluring old phrase! Anything might be beyond those hills ahead of us. I hope we'll get lots of material for our essays, said Elsa practically. Principal Hardy had informed the junior English class that he would require several essays from them during the fall term, and Emily and Elsa had decided that one at least of their essays should recount their experiences in canvassing for subscriptions, from their separate points of view. Thus they had two strings to their bow. "'I suggest we work along the western road and its branches as far as Hunter's Creek tonight,' said Emily. "'We ought to get there by sunset. Then we can hit the gypsy trail across the country, through the Malvern Woods, and come out on the other side of them, quite near Wiltney. It's only half an hour's walk, while around by the Malvern Road it's an hour. "'What a lovely afternoon this is!' "'It was a lovely afternoon, such an afternoon as only September can produce when summer has stolen back for one more day of dream and glamour.' Harvest fields, drenched in sunshine, lay all around them, 
the austere charm of northern firs made wonderful the ways over which they walked. Goldenrod beribboned the fences, and the sacrificial fires of willow herb were kindled on all the burnt lands along the sequestered roads back among the hills. But they soon discovered that canvassing for subscriptions was not all fun, though to be sure, as Ilsa said, they found plenty of human nature for their essays. There was the old man who said, Humph! at the end of every remark Emily made. When finally asked for a subscription, he gruffly said, No. I'm glad you didn't say Humph this time, said Emily. It was getting monotonous. The old fellow stared, then chuckled. Are you any relation to the proud Murrays? I worked at a place they call New Moon when I was young, and one of the Murray gals, Elizabeth her name was, had a sort of high and lofty way of looking at ye, just like yours. My mother was a Murray. I was thinking so. You bear the stamp of the breed. Well, here's two dollars, and you can put my name down. I'd rather see the special edition for I subscribe. I don't favor buying bearskins afore I see the bear, but it's worth two dollars to see a proud Murray come down to ask an old Billy Scott for a subscription. Why didn't you slay him with a glance? asked Ilsa as they walked away. Emily was walking savagely, with her head held high and her eyes snapping. I'm out to get subscriptions, not to make widows. I didn't expect it would be all plain sailing. There was another man who growled all the way through Emily's explanations, and then, when she was primed for refusal, gave her five subscriptions. He likes to disappoint people, she told Ilsa, as they went down the lane. He would rather disappoint them agreeably than not at all. One man swore volubly, not at anything in particular, but just at large, as Ilsa said, and another old man was on the point of subscribing when his wife interfered. I wouldn't if I was you, father. The editor of that paper is an infidel. Very impudent of him, to be sure, said father, and put his money back in his wallet. Delicious, murmured Emily when she was out of earshot. I must jot that down in my jimmy book. As a rule, the women received them more politely than the men, but the men gave them more subscriptions. Indeed, the only woman who subscribed was an elderly dame whose heart Emily won by listening sympathetically to a long account of the beauty and virtues of the said elderly lady's deceased pet Thomas Cat, though it must be admitted that she whispered aside to Ilsa at its conclusion. Charlotte Town Papers, please copy. Their worst experience was with a man who treated them to a tirade of abuse because his politics differed from the politics of the times, and he seemed to hold them responsible for it. When he halted for breath, Emily stood up. "'Kick the dog, then you'll feel better,' she said calmly as she stalked out. Elsa was white with rage. "'Could you have believed people could be so detestable?' she exploded. "'To rate us as if we were responsible for the politics of the times. "'Well, human nature, from a canvasser's point of view, is to be the subject of my essay. "'I'll describe that man and picture myself telling him all the things I wanted to and didn't.' Emily broke into laughter and found her temper again. "'You can. I can't even take that revenge. My promise to Aunt Elizabeth binds me. I shall have to stick to facts. Come, let's not think of the brute. After all, we've got quite a lot of subscriptions already, and there's a clump of white birches in which it is reasonably certain a dryad lives, and that cloud over the firs looks like the faint golden ghost of a cloud. "'Nevertheless, I should have liked to reduce that old vampire to powder,' said Elsa. At the next place of call, however, their experience was pleasant, and they were asked to stay for supper. By sunset they had done reasonably well in the matter of subscriptions, and had accumulated enough private jokes and bywords to furnish fun for many moons of reminiscence. They decided to canvass no more that night. They had not got quite as far as Hunter's Creek, but Emily thought it would be safe to make a cross-cut from where they were. The Malvern Woods were not so very extensive, and no matter where they came out on the northern side of them, they would be able to see Wiltney. They climbed a fence, and went up across a hill pasture field feathered with asters, and were swallowed up by the Malvern Woods, crossed and recrossed by dozens of trails. The world disappeared behind them, and they were alone in a realm of wild beauty. Emily thought the walk through the woods all too short, though tired Elsa, whose foot had turned on a pebble earlier in the day, found it unpleasantly long. Emily liked everything about it. She liked to see that the shining gold head of Ilsa's slipping through the grey-green trunks, under the long, swaying boughs. She liked the faint, dreamlike notes of sleepy birds. She liked the little, wandering, whispering, tricksy wind at dusk among the tree crests. She liked the incredibly delicate fragrance of wood flowers and growths. She liked the little ferns that brushed Ilsa's silken ankles. 
She liked that slender, white, tantalizing thing which gleamed out for a moment adown the dim vista of a winding path. Was it a birch or a wood nymph? No matter. It had given her that stab of poignant rapture she called the flash, her priceless thing whose flitting, uncalculated moments were worth cycles of mere existence. Emily wandered on, thinking all of the loveliness of the road and nothing of the road itself, absently following limping Elsa, until at last the trees suddenly fell away before them and they found themselves in the open, with a wild sort of little pasture before them, and beyond, in the clear afterlight, a long, sloping valley, rather bare and desolate, where the farmsteads had no great appearance of thrift or comfort. "'Why, where are we?' said Elsa blankly. "'I don't see anything like Weltney.' Emily came abruptly out of her dreams and tried to get her bearings. The only landmark visible was a tall spire on a hill ten miles away. "'Why, there's the spire of the Catholic Church at Nindian Head,' she said flatly. "'And that must be hard scrabble road down there. We must have taken a wrong turning somewhere, Elsa. We've come out on the east side of the woods instead of the north.' "'Then we're five miles from Wiltney,' said Elsa despairingly. "'I can never walk that far, and we can't go back through those woods. It will be pitch dark in a quarter of an hour.' "'What on earth can we do?' "'Admit we're lost and make a beautiful thing of it,' said Emily coolly. "'Oh, we're lost, all right, to all intents and purposes,' moaned Ilsa, climbing feebly up on the tumble-down fence and sitting there. "'But I don't see how we're going to make it beautiful. We can't stay here all night. The only thing to do is go down and see if they'll put us up at any of those houses. I don't like the idea. If that's hard scrabble Road, the people are all poor and dirty. I've heard Aunt Nette tell weird tales of hard scrabble Road.' "'Why can't we stay here all night?' said Emily. Ilsa looked at Emily to see if she meant it, saw that she did. "'Where can we sleep, hang ourselves over this fence?' "'Over on that haystack,' said Emily. "'It's only half-finished, hard-scrabble fashion. "'The top is flat, there's a ladder leaning against it, "'the hay is dry and clean. "'The night is summer warm, there are no mosquitoes this time of year. "'We can put our raincoats over us to keep off the dew. "'Why not?' Ilsa looked at the haystack in the corner of the little pasture, and began to laugh assentingly. "'What will Aunt Ruth say?' "'Aunt Ruth need never know it. I'll be sly for once with a vengeance. Besides, I've always longed to sleep in the open. It's been one of the secret wishes I believed were forever unattainable, hedged about as I am with ants. And now it's been tumbled into my lap like a gift thrown down by the gods. It's really such good luck as to be uncanny.' "'Suppose it rains,' said Elsa, who nevertheless found the idea very alluring. "'It won't rain. There isn't a cloud in sight except those great fluffy rose and white ones piling up over Indian Head. They're the kind of clouds that always make me feel that I'd love to soar up on wings as eagles and swoop right down into the middle of them.' It was easy to ascend the little haystack. They sank down on its top with sighs of content, realizing that they were tireder than they had thought. The stack was built of the wild, fragrant grasses of the little pasture, and yielded an indescribably alluring aroma such as no cultivated clover can give. They could see nothing but a great sky of faint rose above them, pricked with early stars, and the dim fringe of treetops around the field. Bats and swallows swooped darkly above them against the paling western gold. Delicate fragrances exhaled from the mosses and ferns just over the fence edge of the trees. A couple of aspen poplars of the quarter talked in silvery whispers of the gossip of the woods. They laughed together in sheer lawless pleasure. An ancient enchantment was suddenly upon them, and the white magic of the sky and the dark magic of the woods wove the final spell of a potent incantation. "'Such loveliness as this doesn't seem real,' murmured Emily. "'It's so wonderful it hurts me. I'm afraid to speak out loud for fear it will vanish.' We were vexed with that old horrid man and his beastly politics today, Ilsa. Why, he doesn't exist, not in this world, anyway. I hear the wind-woman running with soft, soft footsteps over the hill. I shall always think of the wind as a personality. She is a shrew when she blows from the north, a lonely seeker when she blows from the east, a laughing girl when she comes from the west, and tonight from the south a little grey fairy. How do you think of such things? asked Ilsa. This was a question which, for some mysterious reason, always annoyed Emily. "'I don't think of them. They come,' she answered rather shortly. Elsa resented the tone. "'For heaven's sake, Emily, don't be such a crank!' she exclaimed. For a second the wonderful world in which Emily was at the moment living trembled and wavered like a disturbed reflection in water. Then—don't let's quarrel here,' she implored. 
one of us might push the other off the haystack. Elsa burst out laughing. Nobody can really laugh and keep angry. So their night under the stars was not spoiled by a fight. They talked for a while in whispers of schoolgirl secrets and dreams and fears. They even talked of getting married sometime in the future. Of course they shouldn't have, but they did. Ilsa, it appeared, was slightly pessimistic in regard to her matrimonial chances. The boys like me as a pal, but I don't believe anyone will ever really fall in love with me. Nonsense, said Emily reassuringly. Nine out of ten men will fall in love with you. But it'll be the tenth one I want, persisted Ilsa gloomily. And then they talked of almost everything else in the world. Finally they made a solemn compact that whichever one of them died first was to come back to the other if it were possible. How many such compacts have been made, and has even one ever been kept? Then Elsa grew drowsy and fell asleep. But Emily did not sleep, did not want to sleep. It was too dear a night to go to sleep, she felt. She wanted to lie awake for the pleasure of it and think over a thousand things. Emily always looked back to that night, spent under the stars, as a sort of milestone. Everything in it and of it ministered to her. It filled her with its beauty, which she must later give to the world. She wished that she could coin some magic word that might express it. The round moon rose. Did an old witch in a high-crowned hat ride past it on a broomstick? No, it was only a bat and the little tip of a hemlock tree by the fence. She made a poem on it at once, the lines singing themselves through her consciousness without effort. With one side of her nature she liked writing prose best, with the other she liked writing poetry. This sight was uppermost to-night and her very thoughts ran into rhyme. A great pulsating star hung low in the sky over Indian Head. Emily gazed on it and recalled Teddy's old fancy of his previous existence in a star. The idea seized on her imagination, and she spun a dream life, lived in some happy planet circling round that mighty, far-off sun. Then came the northern lights, drifts of pale fire over the sky, spears of light, as of Empyrean armies, pale, elusive hosts retreating and advancing. Emily lay and watched them in rapture. Her soul was washed pure in that great bath of splendor. She was a high priestess of loveliness, assisting in the divine rites of her worship, and she knew her goddess smiled. She was glad Ilsa was asleep. Any human companionship, even the dearest and most perfect, would have been alien to her then. She was sufficient unto herself, needing not love nor comradeship or any human emotion to round out her felicity. Some moments come rarely in any life, but when they do come they are inexpressibly wonderful, as if the finite were for a second infinity, as if humanity were for a space uplifted into divinity, as if all ugliness had vanished, leaving only flawless beauty. Oh, beauty! Emily shivered with the pure ecstasy of it. She loved it. It filled her being to-night as never before. She was afraid to move or breathe, lest she break the current of beauty that was flowing through her. Life seemed like a wonderful instrument on which to play supernatural harmonies. "'Oh, God, make me worthy of it! Oh, make me worthy of it!' she prayed. Could she ever be worthy of such a message? Could she dare try to carry some of the loveliness of that dialogue divine back to the everyday world of sordid marketplace and clamorous street? She must give it. She could not keep it to herself. Would the world listen, understand, feel?' only if she were faithful to the trust, and gave out that which was committed to her, careless of blame or praise. High priestess of beauty, yes, she would serve at no other shrine. She fell asleep in this rapt mood, dreamed that she was Sappho springing from the Lucadian rock, woke to find herself at the bottom of the haystack with Ilsa's startled face peering down at her. Fortunately so much of the stack had slipped down with her that she was able to say cautiously, I think I'm in all one piece still. End of chapter 12When you have fallen asleep listening to the hymns of the gods, it is something of an anticlimax to be awakened by an ignominious tumble from a haystack, but at least it had aroused them in time to see the sunrise over Indian Head, which was worth the sacrifice of several hours of inglorious ease. 
"'Besides, I might never have known what an exquisite thing a spider's web beaded with dew is,' said Emily. "'Look at it, swung between those two tall, plumy grasses.' "'Write a poem on it,' jeered Ilsa, whose alarm made her fleetingly cross. "'How's your foot?' "'Oh, it's all right, but my hair is sopping wet with dew.' "'So is mine. We'll carry our hats for a while, and the sun will soon dry us. It's just as well to get an early start. We can get back to civilization by the time it's safe for us to be seen.' only we'll have to breakfast on the crackers in my bag it won't do for us to be looking for breakfast with no rational account to give of where we spent the night ilsa swear you'll never mention this escapade to a living soul it's been beautiful but it will remain beautiful just as long as only we two know of it remember the result of your telling about our moonlit bath people have such beastly minds grumbled ilsa sliding down the stack oh look at indian head I could be a sun-worshipper this very moment. Indian Head was a flaming mount of splendor. The far-off hills turned beautifully purple against the radiant sky. Even the bare, ugly, hard-scrabble road was transfigured and luminous in hazes of silver. The fields and woods were very lovely in faint, pearly luster. "'The world is always young again for just a few moments at the dawn,' murmured Emily. Then she pulled her jimmy book out of her bag and wrote the sentence down. They had the usual experiences of canvassers the world over that day. Some people refused to subscribe, ungraciously, some subscribed graciously, some refused to subscribe so pleasantly that they left an agreeable impression, some consented to subscribe so unpleasantly that Emily wished they had refused. But on the whole they enjoyed the forenoon, especially when an excellent early dinner in a hospitable farmhouse on the western road filled up the aching void left by a few crackers and a night on a haystack. "'Suppose you didn't come across any stray children today, asked their host. "'No, have any been lost? "'Little Alan Bradshaw, Will Bradshaw's son down river at Malvern Point, "'has been missing ever since Tuesday morning. "'He walked out of the house that morning, singing, "'and has been seen or heard of since.' "'Emily and Elsa exchanged shocked glances. "'How old was he?' "'Just seven, and an only child. "'They say his poor ma is plumb distracted.' All the Malvern Point men have been searching for him for two days, and not a trace of him can they discover. "'What can have happened to him?' said Emily, pale with horror. "'It's a mystery. Some think he fell off the wharf at the point. It was only about a quarter of a mile from the house, and he used to like sitting there and watching the boats. But nobody saw anything of him round the wharf or on the bridge that morning. There's a lot of marshland west of the Bradshaw farm, full of bogs and pools. Some think he must have got there and got lost and perished. You remember Tuesday night was terrible cold.' "'That's where his mother thinks he is, and if you ask me, she's right. "'If he'd been anywhere else, he'd have been found by the sergeant parties. "'They've combed the country.' "'The story haunted Emily all the rest of the day, and she walked under its shadow. "'Anything like that always took almost a morbid hold on her. "'She could not bear the thought of the poor mother at Malvern Point. "'And the little lad, where was he? "'Where had he been the previous night when she had lain in the ecstasy of wild free hours?' That night had not been cold, but Wednesday night had. And she shuddered as she recalled Tuesday night, when a bitter autumnal windstorm had raged till dawn, with showers of hail and stinging rain. Had he been out in that, the poor lost baby? Oh, I can't bear it, she moaned. It's dreadful, agreed Elsa, looking rather sick. But we can't do anything. There's no use in thinking of it. Oh, suddenly Elsa stamped her foot. I believe father used to be right when he didn't believe in God. Such a hideous thing as this! How could it happen if there is a God, a decent God, anyway? God hadn't anything to do with this, said Emily. You know the power that made last night couldn't have brought about this monstrous thing. Well, he didn't prevent it, retorted Ilsa, who was suffering so keenly that she wanted to arraign the universe at the bar of her pain. Little Alan Bradshaw may be found yet. He must be, exclaimed Emily. He won't be found alive, stormed Ilsa. "'No, don't talk to me about God, and don't talk to me about this. "'I've got to forget it. I'll go crazy if I don't.' "'Elsa put the matter out of her mind with another stamp of her foot, and Emily tried to. "'She could not quite succeed, but she forced herself to concentrate superficially on the business of the day, "'though she knew the horror lurked in the back of her consciousness. "'Only once did she really forget it, when they came around a point on the Malvern River Road, and saw a little house built in the cup of a tiny bay, with a steep grassy hill rising behind it. Scattered over the hill were solitary, beautiful-shaped, young fir-trees like little green, elongated pyramids. No other house was in sight. 
all about it was a lovely autumnal solitude of grey, swift-running, windy river, and red, spruce-fringed points. "'That house belongs to me,' said Emily. Elsa stared. "'To you?' "'Yes, of course I don't own it. But haven't you sometimes seen houses that you knew belonged to you, no matter who owned them?' "'No, Ilsa hadn't. She hadn't the least idea what Emily meant. "'I know who owns that house,' she said. "'It's Mr. Scobie of Kingsport. He built it for a summer cottage. I heard Aunt Nett talking of it the last time I was in Wiltney. It was finished a few weeks ago. It's a pretty little house, but too small for me. I like a big house. I don't want to be cramped and crowded, especially in summer.' "'It's hard for a big house to have any personality,' said Emily thoughtfully. "'But little houses almost always have. "'That house is full of it. "'There isn't a line or a corner that isn't eloquent, "'and those casement windows are lovable, "'especially that little one high up under the eaves on the front door. "'It's absolutely smiling at me. "'Look at it glowing like a jewel in the sunshine "'out of the dark shingle setting. "'That little house is greeting us. "'You dear friendly thing, I love you. "'I understand you. "'As old Kelly would say, "'may never a tear be shed under your roof.' The people who are going to live in you must be nice people, or they would never have thought you. If I lived in you, beloved, I'd always stand at that western window at evening to wave to someone coming home. That's just exactly what that window was built for, a frame for love and welcome. When you get through with talking to your house, we'd better hurry on, warned Ilsa. There's a storm coming up. See those clouds and those seagulls? Gulls never come up this far except before a storm. It's going to rain any minute. We'll not sleep on a haystack tonight, friend Emily. Emily loitered past the little house and looked at it lovingly as long as she could. It was such a dear little place, with its dubbed-off gables and rich brown shingle tints, and its general intimate air of sharing mutual jokes and secrets. She turned around half a dozen times to look upon it as they climbed the steep hill, and when at last it dipped below sight she sighed. "'I hate to leave it. I have the oddest feeling, Elsa, that it's calling to me, that I ought to go back to it.' "'Don't be silly,' said Elsa impatiently. "'There, it's sprinkling now. "'If you hadn't poked so long looking at your blessed little hut, "'we'd have been out of the main road by now and near shelter. "'Wow, but it's cold!' "'It's going to be a dreadful night,' said Emily in a low voice. "'Oh, Ilsa, where is that poor little lost boy tonight? "'I wish I knew if they had found him.' "'Don't!' said Elsa savagely. "'Don't say another word about him. "'It's awful. It's hideous. But what can we do?' "'Nothing. That's the dreadful thing about it. "'It seems wicked to go on about our own business, asking for subscriptions, "'when that child is not found.' "'By this time they had reached the main road. "'The rest of the afternoon was not pleasant. "'Stinging showers came at intervals. "'Between them the world was raw and damp and cold, "'with a moaning wind that came in ominous sighing gusts under a leaden sky. At every house where they called they were reminded of the lost baby, for there were only women to give or refuse subscriptions. The men were all away searching for him. "'Though it isn't any use now,' said one woman gloomily, "'except that they may find his little body. He can't have lived this long. I just can't eat or cook for thinking of his poor mother. They say she's not crazy. I don't wonder.' "'They say old Margaret McIntyre is taking it quite calmly,' said an older woman, who was piecing a log cabin quilt by the window. I'd have thought she'd be wild, too. She seemed real fond of little Alan. Oh, Margaret McIntyre has never got worked up about anything for the past five years, ever since her own son Neil was frozen to death in the Klondike. Seems as if her feelings were frozen then, too. She's been a little mad ever since. She won't worry none over this. She'll just smile and tell you she spanked the king. Both women laughed. Emily, with the storyteller's nose, said to the story instantly, but though she would fain have lingered to hunt it down, Ilsa hustled her away. We must get on, Emily, or we'll never reach St. Clair before night. They soon realized that they were not going to reach it. At sunset St. Clair was still three miles away, and there was every indication of a wild evening. We can't get to St. Clair, that's certain, said Elsa. It's going to settle down for a steady rain, and it'll be as black as a million black cats in a quarter of an hour. We'd better go to that house over there and ask if we can stay all night. It looks snug and respectable, though it certainly is the jumping-off place. The house at which Ilsa pointed, an old whitewashed house with a grey roof, was set on the face of a hill amid bright green fields of clover aftermath. A wet red road wound up the hill to it. 
A thick grove of spruces shuddered off from the gulf shore, and beyond the grove a tiny dip in the land revealed a triangular glimpse of misty, white-capped grey sea. The near brook valley was filled with young spruces, dark green in the rain. The grey clouds hung heavily over it. Suddenly the sun broke through the clouds in the west for one magical moment. The hill of clover meadows flashed instantly into incredibly vivid green. The triangle of sea shimmered into violet. The old house gleamed like white marble against the emerald of its hilly background and the inky black sky over and around it. "'Oh!' gasped Emily. "'I never saw anything so wonderful!' She groped wildly in her bag and clutched her jimmy book. The post of a field gate served as a desk. Emily licked a stubborn pencil and wrote feverishly. Ilsa squatted on a stone in a fence corner and waited with ostentatious patience. She knew that when a certain look appeared on Emily's face, she was not to be dragged away until she was ready to go. The sun had vanished, and the rain was beginning to fall again when Emily put her jimmy book back into her bag, with a sigh of satisfaction. I had to get it, Ilsa. Couldn't you have waited till you got to dry land and wrote it down from memory, grumbled Ilsa, uncoiling herself from her stone. No, I'd have missed some of the flavor then. I've got it all now, and in just exactly the right words. Come on, I'll race you to the house. Oh, smell that wind. There's nothing in all the world like a salt sea wind, a savage salt sea wind. After all, there's something delightful in a storm. There's always something, deep down in me, that seems to rise and leap out to meet a storm, wrestle with it. I feel that way sometimes, but not tonight, said Elsa. I'm tired, and that poor baby— Oh! Emily's triumph and exultation went from her in a cry of pain. Oh, Ilsa, I'd forgotten for a moment. How could I? Where can he be? Dead, said Ilsa harshly. It's better to think so than to think of him alive still, out tonight. Come, we've got to get in somewhere. The storm is on for good now. No more showers. An angular woman, panoplied in a white apron so stiffly starched that it could easily have stood alone, opened the door of the house on the hill and bade them enter. "'Oh, yes, you can stay here, I reckon,' she said, not inhospitably. "'If you'll excuse things being a bit upset. They're in sad trouble here.' "'Oh, I'm sorry,' stammered Emily. "'We won't intrude. We'll go somewhere else.' "'Oh, we don't mind you, if you don't mind us. There's a spare room. You're welcome. You can't go out in a storm like this. There isn't another house for some ways. I advise you to stop here. I'll get you a bit of supper.' I don't live here. I'm just a neighbor come to help him out of it. Hollinger's my name. Mrs. Julia Hollinger. Mrs. Bradshaw ain't good for anything. You've heard of her little boy, maybe. Is this where? And he... he hasn't been found? No, never will be. I'm not mentioning it to her. With a quick glance over her shoulder along the hall. But it's my opinion he got in the quicksands down by the bay. That's what I think. Come in and lay off your things. I suppose you don't mind eating in the kitchen. The room is cold. We haven't the stove up in yet. It'll have to be put up soon if there's a funeral. I suppose there won't be if he's in the quicksand. You can't have a funeral without a body, can you? All this was very gruesome. Emily and Ilsa would fain have gone elsewhere, but the storm had broken in full fury and darkness seemed to pour in from the sea over the changed world. They took off their drenched hats and coats and followed their hostess to the kitchen, a clean, old-fashioned spot which seemed cheerful enough in lamplight and fire glow. "'Sit up to the fire. I'll poke it a bit. Don't mind Grandfather Bradshaw. Grandfather, here's two young ladies that want to stay all night.' Grandfather stared stonily at them, out of little hazy blue eyes, and said not a word. "'Don't mind him,' in a pig's whisper. "'He's over ninety, and he never was much of a talker. Clara, Mrs. Bradshaw, is in there,' nodding towards the door of what seemed a small bedroom off the kitchen. "'Her brother's with her, Dr. McIntyre, from Charlottetown. We sent for him yesterday. He's the only one that can do you see.' "'A child can't be lost in the nineteenth century, I tell you,' repeated Grandfather Bradshaw, with an irritable shift of emphasis. "'No, no,' soothingly, "'of course not, Grandfather. Little Alan'll turn up all right. Here's a hot cup of tea for you. I advise you to drink it. That'll keep him quiet for a bit. Not that he's ever very fussy. Only everybody's a bit upset, except old Mrs. McIntyre. Nothing ever upsets her. It's just as well, only it seems to me real unfeeling.' course she isn't just right come sit in have a bite girls listen to that rain will you the men will be soaked they can't search much longer tonight will will soon be home i sort of dread it clara'll go wild again when he comes home without little allen we had a terrible time with her last night poor thing a child can't be lost in the nineteenth century 
said Grandfather Bradshaw, and choked over his hot drink in his indignation. "'No, nor in the twentieth, neither,' said Mrs. Hollinger, patting him on the back. "'I advise you to go to bed, Grandfather. You're tired.' "'I am not tired, and I will go to bed when I choose, Julia Hollinger.' "'Oh, very well, Grandfather. I advise you not to get worked up. I think I'll take a cup of tea into Clara. Perhaps she'll take it now. She hasn't eaten or drunk since Tuesday night. How can a woman stand that? I put it to you.' Emily and Ilsa ate their supper with what appetite they could summon up, while Grandfather Bradshaw watched them suspiciously, and sorrowful sounds reached them from the little inner room. "'It is wet and cold to-night. Where is he, my little son?' moaned a woman's voice, with an undertone of agony that made Emily writhe as if she felt it herself. "'They'll find him soon, Clara,' said Mrs. Hollinger, in a sprightly tone of artificial comfort. "'Just you be patient. Take a sleep, I advise you. They're bound to find him soon.' "'They'll never find him!' The voice was almost a scream now. "'He is dead! He is dead! He died that bitter cold Tuesday night so long ago. Oh, God, have mercy! He was such a little fellow, and I have told him so often not to speak until he was spoken to. He'll never speak to me again. I wouldn't let him have a light after he went to bed, though there's sheets on the bed. They was all aired today, blankets and sheets. I thought it'd be better to air them in case there was a funeral.' I remember the New Moon Murrays would always particular about airing their beds, so I thought I'd mention it. Listen to that wind. We'll likely hear of awful damage from this storm. I wouldn't wonder if the roof flew off this house tonight. Troubles never come singly. I advise you not to get upset if you hear a noise through the night. If the men bring the body home, Clara will likely act all possessed. Poor thing. Maybe you'd better turn the key of the lock. Old Mrs. McIntyre wanders round a bit sometimes. She's quite harmless and mostly sane enough, but it gives folks a start. The girls felt relieved as the door closed behind Mrs. Hollinger. She was a good soul, doing her neighborly duty as she conceived it, faithfully, but she was not exactly cheerful company. They found themselves in a tiny, meticulously neat spare room under the sloping eaves. Most of the space in it was occupied by a big, comfortable bed that looked as if it were meant to be slept in, and not merely to decorate the room. A little four-paned window, with a spotless white muslin frill, shut them in from the cold, stormy night that was on the sea. Ugh! shivered Ilsa, as she got into the bed as speedily as possible. Emily followed her more slowly, forgetting about the key. Ilsa, tired out, fell asleep almost immediately, but Emily could not sleep. She lay and suffered, straining her ears for the sound of footsteps. The rain dashed against the window, not in drops, but sheets. The wind snarled and shrieked. Down below the hill she heard the white waves ravening along the dark shore. Could it be only twenty-four hours since that moonlit, summering glamour of the haystack and the ferny pasture? Why, that must have been another world. Where was that poor lost child? In one of the pauses of the storm she fancied she heard a little whimper overhead in the dark as if some lonely little soul, lately freed from the body, were trying to find its way to kin. She could discover no way of escape from her pain. Her gates of dream were shut against her. She could not detach her mind from her feelings and dramatize them. Her nerves grew strained and tense. Painfully she sent her thoughts out into the storm, seeking, striving to pierce the mystery of the child's whereabouts. He must be found, she clutched her hands. He must! That poor mother! Oh, God, let him be found safe! Let him be found safe! Emily prayed, desperately and insistently, over and over again all the more desperately and insistently because it seemed a prayer so impossible of fulfillment. But she reiterated it to bar out of her mind terrible pictures of swamp and quicksand and river, until at last she was so weary that mental torture could no longer keep her awake, and she fell into a troubled slumber, while the storm roared on and the baffled searchers finally gave up their vain quest. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen The Woman Who Spanked the King. The wet dawn came up from the gulf in the wake of the spent storm and crept grayly into the little spare room of the whitewashed house on the hill. Emily woke with a start from a troubled dream of seeking and finding the lost boy. But where she had found him she could not now remember. Ilsa was still asleep at the back of the bed, her pale gold curls lying in a silken heap on the pillow. Emily, her thoughts still tangled in the cobweb meshes of her dream, 
looked around the room, and thought she must be dreaming still. By the tiny table, covered with its white lace-trimmed cloth, a woman was sitting, a tall, stout old woman, wearing over her thick grey hair a spotless white widow's cap, such as the old Highland Scotch women still wore in the early years of the century. She had on a dress of plum-coloured drugget with a large snowy apron, and she wore it with the air of a queen. A neat blue shawl was folded over her breast. Her face was curiously white and deeply wrinkled, but Emily, with her gift for seeing essentials, saw instantly the strength and vivacity which still characterized every feature. She saw, too, that the beautiful, clear blue eyes looked as if their owner had been dreadfully hurt some time. This must be the old Mrs. McIntyre, of whom Mrs. Hollinger had spoken. And if so, then old Mrs. McIntyre was a very dignified personage indeed. Mrs. McIntyre sat with her hands folded on her lap, looking steadily at Emily with a gaze in which there was something hard to define, something just a little strange. Emily recalled the fact that Mrs. McIntyre was supposed to be not quite right. She wondered a little uneasily what she should do. Ought she to speak? Mrs. McIntyre saved her the trouble of deciding. "'You will be having Highland men for your forefathers,' she said, in an unexpectedly rich, powerful voice, full of the delightful Highland accent. "'Yes,' said Emily. "'And you will be Presbyterian?' "'Yes.' "'They will be the only decent things to be,' remarked Mrs. McIntyre, in a tone of satisfaction. "'And will you please be telling me what your name is? Emily Starr. That will be a very pretty name. I will be telling you mine. It is Mistress Margaret McIntyre. I am no common person. I am the woman who spanked the king.' Again Emily, now thoroughly awake, thrilled with the storyteller's instinct. But Ilsa, awakening at the moment, gave a low exclamation of surprise. Mrs. McIntyre lifted her head with a quite regal gesture. "'You will not be afraid of me, my dear. I will not be hurting you, although I will be the woman who spanked the king. That is what the people say of me. Oh, yes. As I walk into the church, she is the woman who spanked the king.' "'I suppose,' said Emily, hesitatingly, "'that we'd better be getting up.' "'You will not be rising until I have told you my tale,' said Mrs. McIntyre firmly. I will be knowing as soon as I saw you that you will be the one to hear it. You will not be having very much colour, and I will not be saying that you are very pretty. Oh, no! But you will be having the little hands and the little ears. They will be the ears of the fairies, I am thinking. The girl with you there, she is a very nice girl, and will make a very fine wife for a handsome man. She is clever, oh, yes, but you half the way, and it is to you I will be telling my story. "'Let her tell it,' whispered Elsa. "'I'm dying of curiosity to hear about the king being spanked.' Ilsa, who realized that there was no letting in the case, only a matter of lying still and listening to whatever it seemed good to Mistress McIntyre to say, nodded. "'You will not be having the twa talks. I will be meaning the Gaelic.' Spellbound, Emily shook her black head. "'That is a pity, for my story will not be sounding so well in the English, oh no. You will be saying to yourself the old woman is having a dream.' "'But you will be wrong, for it is the true story I will be telling you. "'Oh, yes. I spanked the king. "'Of course he would not be the king then. "'He would be only a little prince and no more than nine years old, "'just the same age as my little Alec. "'But it is at the beginning I must be, "'or you will not be understanding the matter at all. "'It was all a long, long time ago before we ever left the old country. "'My husband would be Alistair McIntyre, "'and he would be a shepherd near the Balmoral Castle. "'Alistair was a very handsome man, and we were very happy.' It was not that we did not quarrel once in a while. Oh, no, that would be very monotonous. But when we made it up, it was more loving than ever we would be, and I would be very good-looking myself. I will be getting fatter and fatter all the time now, but I was very slim and beautiful then. Oh, yes, it is the truth I will be telling you, though I will be seeing that you are laughing your sleeves at me. When you will be eighty, you will be knowing more about it. You will be remembering, maybe, that Queen Victoria and Prince Albert would be coming up to Balmoral every summer, and bringing their children with them, and they would not be bringing any more servants than they could help, for they would not be wanting fuss and pother, but just a quiet, nice time, like common folks. On Sundays they would be walking down sometimes to the church in the glen to be hearing Mr. Donald Macpherson preach. Mr. Donald Macpherson was very grifted in prayer, and he would not be liking it when people would come in when he was praying. He would be apt to be stopping and saying, "'Oh, Lord, we will be waiting until Sandy Big Jim has taken his seat.' "'Oh, yes. I would be hearing the Queen laugh the next day. At Sandy Big Jim you will be knowing, not at the minister.' 
when they will be needing some more help at the castle they just sent for me and janet jardine janet's husband was a gilly on the estate she would always be saying to me good morning mistress mcintyre when we would be meeting and i would be saying good morning janet just to be showing the superiority of the mcintyres over the jardines but she was a very good creature in her place and we would be getting on very well together when she would not be forgetting it i was very good friends with the queen oh yes she was not a proud woman whatever she would be sitting in my house at times and drinking a cup of tea and she would be talking to me of her children she was not very handsome oh no but she would be having a very pretty hand prince albert was very fine-looking so people would be saying but to my mind alister was far the handsomer man they would be very fine people whatever and the little princes and princesses would be playing about with my children every day the queen would be knowing they were in good company and she would be easier in her mind about them than i was for prince bertie was the daring lad if ever there was one oh yes and the tricky one and i would be worrying all the time for the fear he and alec would be getting into a scrape they would be playing every day together and quarrelling too and it would not always be alec's fault either but it was alec that would be getting the scolding poor lad somebody would have to be scolded and you will be knowing that i could not be scolding the prince my dear there was one great worry i will be having the burn behind the house and the trees it was very deep and swift in places and if a child should be falling in he would be drowned i would be telling prince bertie and alec time after time that they must never be going near the banks of the burn they would be doing it once or twice for all that and i would be punishing alec for it though he would be telling me that he did not want to go and prince bertie would be saying oh come on there will not be any danger do not be a coward and alec he would be going because he would be thinking he had to do what prince bertie wanted and not looking very well either to be called a coward and him a mcintyre i would be worrying so much over it that i would not be sleeping at nights and then my dear one day prince bertie would be falling right into the deep pool and alec would be trying to pull him out and falling in after him and they would have been drowned together if i had not been hearing the skirls of them when i would be coming home from the castle after taking some buttermilk up for the queen oh yes it is quick i will be taking in what had happened and running to the burn and it will not be long before i was fishing them out very frightened and dripping i will be knowing something had to be done and i was tired of blaming for alec and besides it will be truth my dear that i was very very mad and i was not thinking of princes and kings but just of two very bad little boys oh it is the quick temper i will always be having oh yes i will be picking up prince bertie and turning him over my knee and i will be giving him a sound spanking on the place the good lord will be making for spanks and princes as well as in common children i will be spanking him first because he was a prince then i spanked alec and they made music together for it was very angry i was and i will be doing what my hands will be finding to do with all my might as the good book says then when prince bertie had gone home very mad i will be cooling off and feeling a bit frightened for i will not be knowing just how the queen will be taking it and i will not be liking the thought of janet jardine triumphing over me but it is a sensible woman queen victoria was and she will be telling me next day that i did right and prince albert will be smiling and joking to me about the laying on of hands and prince bertie would not be disobeying me again about going to the burn oh no and he could not be sitting down very easy for some time as for alistair i had been thinking he would be fairly cross with me but it will always be hard telling what a man will think of anything oh yes for he would be laughing over it and telling me that a day would come when i could be boasting that i had spanked the king it was all a long time ago now but never will i be forgetting it she would be dying two years ago and prince bertie would be the king at last when alistair and i came to canada the queen will be giving me a silk petticoat it was a very fine petticoat of the victoria tartan I have never worn it, but I will be wearing it once, in my coffin, oh yes. I will be keeping it in the chest in my room, and they will be knowing what it is for. I will be wishing Janet Jardine could have known that I was to be buried in a petticoat of the Victoria Tartan, but she has been dead for a long while. She was a very good sort of creature, although she was not a Macintyre. Mistress Macintyre folded her hands and held her peace. Having told her story, she was content. Emily had listened avidly. Now she said, "'Mrs. McIntyre, will you let me write that story down and publish it?' Mistress McIntyre leaned forward. Her white shriveled face warmed a little, her deep-set eyes shone. "'Will you be meaning that it will be printed in paper?' "'Yes.' Mistress McIntyre rearranged her shawl over her breast with hands that trembled a little. "'It is strange how our wishes will be coming true at times. It is a pity that the foolish people who will be staying there is no God could not be hearing of this.' 
you will be writing it out and you will be putting it into proud words no no said emily quickly i will not do that i may have to make a few changes and write a framework but most of it i shall write exactly as you told it i could not better it by a syllable mistress mcintyre looked doubtful for a moment then gratified it is only a poor ignorant body i am and i will not be choosing my words very well but maybe you will be knowing best you have listened to me very nicely and it is sorry i am to have kept you so long with my old tales i will be going now and letting you get up have they found the lost child asked ilsa eagerly mistress mcintyre shook her head composedly oh no it is not finding them in a hurry they will be i will be hearing clara skirling in the night she is the daughter of my son angus he will be marrying a wilson and the wilsons will always be making a strumash over everything the poor thing will be worrying that she was not good enough to the little lad but it would always be spoiling him she was and him that full of mischief i will not be of much use to her i have not the second sight you will be having that a bit yourself i am thinking oh yes no no said emily hurriedly she could not help recalling a certain incident of her childhood at new moon of which she somehow never liked to think old mistress mcintyre nodded sagely and smoothed her white apron it will not be right for you to be denying it my dear for it is a great gift and my cousin helen four times removed will be having it oh yes but they will not be finding little alan oh no clara will be loving him too much it is not a very good thing to be loving any one too much god will be a jealous god oh yes it is margaret mcintyre who knows it i will be having six sons once all very fine men and the youngest would be neil he was six feet two in his stockings and there would be none of the others like him at all there would be such fun in him he would always be laughing oh yes and the wiling tongue of him would be coaxing the birds off the bushes he will be going to the klondike and he will be getting frozen unto death out there one night oh yes he will be dying while i was praying for him i have not been praying since clara will be feeling like that now she will be saying god does not hear it is a very strange thing to be a woman my dears and to be loving so much for nothing little alan was a very pretty baby he will be having a fat little brown face and very big blue eyes and it is a pity he will not be turning up though they will not be finding my kneel in time oh no i will be leaving clara alone and not vexing her with comforting i was always the great hand to leave people alone without it it would be when i spanked the king it is julia hollinger who will be darkening counsel by words without knowledge it is the foolish woman she is she would be leaving her husband because he will not be giving up a dog he liked i am thinking he was wise in sticking to the dog but i will always be getting on well with julia because i will have learned to suffer fools gladly she will enjoy giving advice so much and it will not be hurting me whatever because i will never be taking it i will be saying good-bye to you now my dears and it is very glad i am to have seen you and i will be wishing that trouble may never sit on your hearthstones and i will not be forgetting either that you listen to me very polite oh yes i will not be of much importance to anybody now but once i spanked the king end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of emily climbs by lucy maud montgomery this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the thing that couldn't when the door had closed behind Mistress McIntyre, the girls got up and dressed rather laggingly. Emily thought of the day before her with some distaste. The fine flavor of adventure and romance with which they had started out had vanished, and canvassing a country road for subscriptions had suddenly become irksome. Physically, they were both tireder than they thought. "'It seems like an age since we left Shrewsbury,' grumbled Ilsa, as she pulled on her stockings." Emily had an even stronger feeling of a long passage of time. Her wakeful, enraptured night under the moon had seemed in itself like a year of some strange soul growth. And this past night had been wakeful also, in a very different way, and she had roused from her brief sleep at its close with an odd, rather unpleasant sensation of some confused and troubled journey, a sensation which old Mistress McIntyre's story had banished for a time, but which now returned as she brushed her hair. "'I feel as if I had been wandering somewhere for hours,' she said. "'And I dreamed I found little Alan, but I don't know where. "'It was horrible to wake up feeling that I had known just immediately before I woke and had forgotten. "'I slept like a log,' said Elsa, yawning. "'I didn't even dream. "'Emily, I want to get away from this house and this place as soon as I can.' 
I feel as if I were in a nightmare, as if something horrible were pressing me down and I couldn't escape from it. It would be different if I could do anything, help in any way, but since I can't, I just want to escape from it. I forgot it for a few minutes when the old lady was telling her story. Heartless old thing! She wasn't worrying one bit about poor little lost Alan. I think she stopped worrying long ago, said Emily dreamily. That's what people mean when they say she isn't right. People who don't worry a little never are right, like Cousin Jimmy. But that was a great story. I'm going to write it for my first essay, and later on I'll see about having it printed. I'm sure it would make a splendid sketch for some magazine, if I can only catch the savour and vivacity she put into it. I think I'll jot down some of her expressions right away in my Jimmy book before I forget them. "'Oh, drat your Jimmy book,' said Elsa. "'Let's get down and eat breakfast if we have to, and get away.' But Emily, reveling in her storyteller's paradise, had temporarily forgotten everything else. "'Where is my Jimmy book?' she said impatiently. "'It isn't in my bag. I knew it was here last night. Surely I didn't leave it on that gate-post.' "'Isn't that it over on the table?' asked Elsa. Emily gazed blankly at it. "'It can't be. It is. How did it get there?' I know I didn't take it out of the bag last night. You must have, said Elsa indifferently. Emily walked over to the table with a puzzled expression. The Jimmy book was lying open on it with her pencil beside it. Something on the page caught her eye suddenly. She bent over it. Why don't you hurry and finish your hair, demanded Ilsa a few minutes later. I'm ready now. For pity's sake, tear yourself from the blessed Jimmy book for long enough to get dressed. Emily turned around, holding the jimmy book in her hands. She was very pale, and her eyes were dark with fear and mystery. "'Elsa, look at this,' she said in a trembling voice. Elsa went over and looked at the page of the jimmy book which Emily held out to her. On it was a pencil sketch, exceedingly well done, of the little house on the river shore, to which Emily had been so attracted on the preceding day. A black cross was marked on a small window over the front door, and opposite it, on the margin of the jimmy book, beside another cross, was written, "'Alan Bradshaw is here.' "'What does it mean?' gasped Ilsa. "'Who did it?' "'I don't know,' stammered Emily. "'The writing is mine.' Ilsa looked at Emily and drew back a little. "'You must have drawn it in your sleep,' she said dazedly. "'I can't draw,' said Emily. "'Who else could have done it? "'Mistress McIntyre couldn't. "'You know she couldn't. "'Emily, I never heard of such a strange thing. "'Do you think... "'Do you think he can be there?' "'How could he be? "'The house must be locked up. "'There's no one working at it now. "'Besides, they must have searched all around there. "'He would be looking out of the window. "'It wasn't shuttered, you remember. "'Calling. "'They would have seen... "'Heard him.' I suppose I must have drawn that picture in my sleep, though I can't understand how I did it, because my mind was so filled with the thought of little Alan. It's so strange. It frightens me. You'll have to show it to the Bradshaws, said Elsa. I suppose so, and yet I hate to. It may fill them with a cruel, false hope again, and there can't be anything in it. But I daren't risk not showing it. You show it. I can't somehow. The thing has upset me. I feel frightened, childish. I could sit down and cry. If he should have been there since Tuesday, he would be dead of starvation. Well, they'd know. I'll show it, of course. If it should turn out... Emily, you're an uncanny creature. Don't talk of it. I can't bear it, said Emily, shuddering. There was no one in the kitchen when they entered it, but presently a young man came in. "'evidently the Dr. McIntyre of whom Mrs. Hollinger had spoken. "'He had a pleasant, clever face, with keen eyes behind his glasses, "'but he looked tired and sad. "'Good morning,' he said. "'I hope you had a good rest and were not disturbed in any way. "'We are all sadly upset here, of course.' "'They haven't found the little boy?' asked Elsa. "'Dr. McIntyre shook his head. "'No, they have given up the search.' He cannot be living yet, after Tuesday night and last night. The swamp will not give up its dead. I feel sure that is where he is. My poor sister is broken-hearted. I am sorry your visit should have happened at such a sorrowful time. But I hope Mrs. Hollinger has made you comfortable. Grandmother McIntyre would be quite offended if you lacked for anything. 
She was very famous for her hospitality in her day. I suppose you haven't seen her. She does not often show herself to strangers. Oh, we've seen her, said Emily absently. She came into our room this morning and told us how she spanked the king. Dr. McIntyre laughed a little. Then you have been honored. <laughs> it's not to everyone grandmother tells that tale. She's something of an ancient mariner and knows her predestined listeners. She's a little bit strange. A few years ago her favorite son, my uncle Neil, met his death in the Klondike under sad circumstances. He was one of the lost patrol. Grandmother never recovered from the shock. She has never felt anything since. Feeling seems to have been killed in her. She neither loves nor hates nor fears nor hopes. She lives entirely in the past and experiences only one emotion, a great pride in the fact that she once spanked the king. But I'm keeping you from your breakfast. Here comes Mrs. Hollinger to scold me. Wait a moment, please, Dr. McIntyre, said Elsa hurriedly. I, you, we, there is something I want to show you. Dr. McIntyre bent a puzzled face over the Jimmy book. What is this? I don't understand. We don't understand it either. Emily drew it in her sleep. In her sleep? Dr. McIntyre was too bewildered to be anything but an echo. She must have. There was nobody else, unless your grandmother can draw. Not she, and she never saw this house. It's the Scoby Cottage below Malvern Bridge, isn't it? Yes, we saw it yesterday. But Ellen can't be there. It's been locked for a month. The carpenters went away in August. Oh, I know, stammered Emily. I was thinking so much of Ellen before I went to sleep. I suppose it's only a dream. I don't understand it at all, but we had to show it to you. Of course. Well, I won't say anything to Will or Clara about it. I'll get Rob Mason from over the hill, and we'll run down and have a look around the cottage. It would be odd if— But it couldn't possibly be. I don't see how we can get into the cottage. It's locked and the windows are shuttered. This one over the front door isn't— No, but that's a closet window at the end of the upstairs hall. I was over the house one day in August when the painters were at work in it. The closet shuts with a spring lock, so I suppose that's why they didn't put a shutter on that window. It's high up, close to the ceiling, I remember. Well, I'll slip over to Rob's and see about this. It won't do to leave any stone unturned. Emily and Elsa ate what breakfast they could, thankful that Mrs. Hollinger let them alone, save for a few passing remarks as she came and went at work. Terrible night last night, but the rain is over. I never closed an eye. Poor Clara didn't either. But she's quieter now, sort of despairing. I'm scared for her mind. Her grandmother never was right after she heard of her son's death. When Clara heard they weren't going to search no more, she screamed once and laid down on the bed with her face to the wall. He ain't stirred since. Well, the world has got to go on for other folks. Help yourselves to the toast. I'd advise you not to be in too much of a hurry starting out till the wind dries the mud a bit. I'm not going to go until we find out if— whispered Ilsa inconclusively. Emily nodded. She could not eat, and if Aunt Elizabeth or Aunt Ruth had seen her, they would have sent her to bed at once with orders to stay there, and they would have been quite right. She had almost reached her breaking point. The hour that passed after Dr. McIntyre's departure seemed interminable. Suddenly they heard Mrs. Hollinger, who was washing milk pans at the bench outside the kitchen door, give a sharp exclamation. A minute later she rushed into the kitchen, followed by Dr. McIntyre, breathless from his mad run from Malvern Bridge. "'Clara must be told first, he said. "'It is her right.' He disappeared into the inner room. Mrs. Hollinger dropped into a chair, laughing and crying. "'They found him! They found little Alan! On the floor of the hall closet! In the Scobie cottage!' "'Is he living?' gasped Emily. Yes, but no more. He couldn't even speak, but he'll come round with care, the doctor says. <laughs> they carried him to the nearest house. That's all the doctor had time to tell me. A wild cry of joy came from the bedroom, and Clara Bradshaw, with disheveled hair and pallid lips, but with the light of rapture shining in her eyes, rushed through the kitchen, out and over the hill. Mrs. Hollinger caught up a coat and ran after her. Dr. McIntyre sank into a chair. I couldn't stop her, and I'm not fit for another run yet. But joy doesn't kill. It would have been cruel to stop her even if I could. Is little Alan all right? asked Elsa. He will be. The poor kid was at the point of exhaustion, naturally. 
He wouldn't have lasted for another day. We carried him right up to Dr. Matheson at the bridge and left him in his charge. He won't be fit to be brought home before tomorrow. Have you any idea how he came to be there? Well, he couldn't tell us anything, of course, but I think I know how it happened. We found a cellar window about half an inch open. I fancy that Alan was poking about the house, boy fashion, and found that this window hadn't been fastened. He must have got entrance by it, pushed it almost shut behind him, and then explored the house. He had pulled the closet door tight in some way, and the spring lock made him a prisoner. The window was too high for him to reach, or he might have attracted attention from it. The white plaster of the closet wall is all marked and scarred, with his vain attempts to get up to the window. Of course he must have shouted, but nobody has ever been near enough the house to hear him. You know, it stands in that bare little cove, with nothing near it, where a child could be hidden, so I suppose the searchers did not pay much attention to it. They didn't search the river banks until yesterday, anyhow, because it was never thought he would have gone away down there alone, and by yesterday he was past calling for help. "'I am so happy, since he's found,' said Elsa, winking back tears of relief. Grandfather Bradshaw suddenly poked his head out of the sitting-room doorway. "'I told ye a child couldn't be lost in the nineteenth century,' he chuckled. He was lost, though, said Dr. McIntyre, and he wouldn't have been found, in time, if it were not for this young lady. It's a very extraordinary thing. Emily is psychic, said Elsa, quoting Mr. Carpenter. Psychic? Humph! Well, it's curious, very. I don't pretend to understand it. Grandmother would say it was second sight, of course. Naturally, she's a firm believer in that, like all the Highland folk. Oh, oh, I'm sure I haven't second sight, protested Emily. I must just have dreamed it and got up in my sleep. But then I can't draw. Something used you as an instrument, then, said Dr. McIntyre. After all, Grandmother's explanation of second sight is just as reasonable as anything else when one is compelled to believe an unbelievable thing. I'd rather not talk of it, said Emily with a shiver. I'm so glad Alan has been found, but... "'Please don't tell people about my part in it. "'Let them think it just occurred to you to search inside the Scobie house. I, "'I couldn't bear to have this talked of all over the country.' "'When they left the little white house on the windy hill, "'the sun was breaking through the clouds, "'and the harbour waters were dancing madly in it. "'The landscape was full of the wild beauty "'that comes in the wake of a spent storm, "'and the western road stretched before them "'in loop and hill and dip of wet red allurement, but Emily turned away from it. "'I'm going to leave it for my next trip,' she said. "'I can't go canvassing today somehow. Friend of my heart, let's go to Malvern Bridge and take the morning train to Shrewsbury.' "'It was awfully funny about your dream,' said Elsa. "'It makes me a little afraid of you, Emily, somehow.' "'Oh, don't be afraid of me,' implored Emily. "'It was only a coincidence.' I was thinking of him so much, and the house took possession of me yesterday. "'Remember how you found out about Mother?' said Elsa in a low tone. "'You have some power the rest of us haven't.' "'Perhaps I'll grow out of it,' said Emily, desperately. "'I hope so. I don't want to have any such power. You don't know how I feel about it, Elsa. It seems to me a terrible thing, as if I were marked out in some uncanny way. I don't feel human.' When Dr. McIntyre spoke about something using me as an instrument, I went cold all over. It seemed to me that while I was asleep, some other intelligence must have taken possession of my body and drawn that picture. "'It was your writing,' said Elsa. "'Oh, I'm not going to talk of it or think of it. I'm going to forget it. Don't ever speak of it to me again, Elsa.'" End of chapter 15 Chapter Sixteen of Emily Climbs by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, Driftwood. Shrewsbury, October three, nineteen something. I have finished canvassing my allotted portion of our fair province. I have the banner list of all the canvassers, and I have made almost enough out of my commissions to pay for my books for my whole junior year. When I told Aunt Ruth this, she did not sniff. I consider that a fact worth recording. 
Today my story, The Sands of Time, came back from Merton's magazine. But the rejection slip was typewritten, not printed. Typewriting doesn't seem quite as insulting as print, some way. We have read your story with interest, and regret to say that we cannot accept it for publication at the present time. If they meant that, with interest, it is a little encouragement. But were they only trying to soften the blow? Ilsa and I were notified recently that there were nine vacancies in the Skull and Owl, and that we had been put on the list of those who might apply for membership. So we did. It is considered a great thing in school to be a Skull and Owl. The junior year is in full swing now, and I find the work very interesting. Mr. Hardy has several of our classes, and I like him as a teacher better than any one since Mr. Carpenter. He was very much interested in my essay, The Woman Who Spanked the King. He gave it first place and commented on it specially in his class criticisms. Evelyn Blake is sure, naturally, that I copied it out of something, and feels certain she has read it somewhere before. Evelyn is wearing her hair in the new pompadour style this year, and I think it is very unbecoming to her. But then, of course, the only part of Evelyn's anatomy I like is her back. I understand that the Martin clan are furious with me. Sally Martin was married last week in the Anglican church here, and the Times editor asked me to report it. Of course I went, though I hate reporting weddings. There are so many things I'd like to say sometimes that can't be said. But Sally's wedding was pretty, and so was she, and I sent in quite a nice report of it, I thought, especially mentioning the bride's beautiful bouquet of roses and orchids, the first bridal bouquet of orchids ever seen in Shrewsbury. I wrote as plain as print, and there was no excuse whatever for that wretched typesetter on the Times turning orchids into sardines. Of course, anybody with any sense would have known that it was only a printer's error. But the Martin clan have taken into their heads the absurd notion that I wrote sardines on purpose for a silly joke, because it seems it has been reported to them that I said once I was tired of the conventional reports of weddings, and would like to write just one along different lines. I did say it! but my craving for originality would hardly lead me to report the bride as carrying a bouquet of sardines! Nevertheless, the Martins do think it, and Stella Martin didn't invite me to her thimble party, and Aunt Ruth says she doesn't wonder at it, and Aunt Elizabeth says I shouldn't have been so careless. I! Heaven grant me patience! October 5th, 19-something. Mrs. Will Bradshaw came to see me this evening. Luckily Aunt Ruth was out. I say luckily, for I don't want Aunt Ruth to find out about my dream and its part in finding little Alan Bradshaw. This may be sly, as Aunt Ruth would say, but the truth is that, sly or not sly, I could not bear to have Aunt Ruth sniffing and wondering and pawing over the incident. Mrs. Bradshaw came to thank me. It embarrassed me, because, after all, what had I to do with it? I don't want to think of or talk of it at all. Mrs. Bradshaw says little Alan is all right again now, though it was a week after they found him before he could sit up. She was very pale and earnest. He would have died there if you hadn't come, Miss Starr. And I would have died. I couldn't have gone on living, not knowing. Oh, I shall never forget the horror of those days. I had to come and try to utter a little of my gratitude. You were gone when I came back that morning. I felt that I had been very inhospitable. She broke down and cried, and so did I, and we had a good howl together. I am very glad and thankful that Alan was found, but I shall never like to think of the way it happened. New Moon, October 7, 19-something. I had a lovely walk and prowl this evening in the pond graveyard. Not exactly a cheerful place for an evening's ramble, one might suppose, but I always like to wander over that little westward slope of graves in the gentle melancholy of a fine autumn evening. I like to read the names on the stones and note the ages and think of all the loves and hates and hopes and fears that lie buried there. It was beautiful and not sad. And all around were the red ploughed fields and the frosted ferny woodsides and all the old familiar things that I have loved and love more and more, it seems to me, the older I grow. 
Every weekend I come home to New Moon, these things seem dear to me, more a part of me. I love things just as much as people. I think Aunt Elizabeth is like this, too. That is why she will not have anything changed at New Moon. I'm beginning to understand her better. I believe she likes me now, too. I was only a duty at first, but now I'm something more. I stayed in the graveyard until a dull gold twilight came down and made a glimmering spectral place of it. Then Teddy came for me, and we walked together up the field and through the Tomorrow Road. It is really a today road now, for the trees along it are above our heads, but we still call it the Tomorrow Road, partly out of habit, and partly because we talk so much on it of our tomorrows and what we hope to do in them. Somehow Teddy is the only person I like to talk to about my tomorrows and my ambitions. There is no one else. Perry scoffs at my literary aspirations. He says, when I say anything about writing books, what's the good of that sort of thing? And of course, if a person can't see the good for himself, you can't explain it to him. I can't even talk to Dean about them, not since he said bitterly one evening, I hate to hear of your tomorrows, they cannot be my tomorrows. I think, in a way, Dean doesn't like to think of my growing up. I think he has a little of the priest's jealousy of sharing anything, especially friendship, with anyone else, or with the world. I feel thrown back on myself. Somehow it has seemed to me lately that Dean isn't interested any longer in my writing ambitions. He even, it seems to me, ridicules them slightly. For instance, Mr. Carpenter was delighted with my woman who spanked the king, and told me it was excellent, but when Dean read it, he smiled and said, "'It will do very well for a school essay, but—' and he smiled again. It was not the smile I liked, either. It had too much priest in it, as Aunt Elizabeth would say. I felt, and feel, horribly cast down about it. It seemed to say— you can scribble amusingly, my dear, and have a pretty knack of phrase-turning, but I should be doing you an unkindness if I let you think that such a knack meant a very great deal. If this is true, and very likely it is, for Dean is so clever and knows so much, then I can never accomplish anything worth while. I won't try to accomplish anything. I won't be just a pretty scribbler. But it's different with Teddy. Teddy was wildly elated tonight, and so was I when I heard his news. He showed two of his pictures at the Charlottetown exhibition in September, and Mr. Lewes, of Montreal, has offered him fifty dollars apiece for them. That will pay his board in Shrewsbury for the winter, and make it easier for Mrs. Kent. Although she wasn't glad when he told her, she said, "'Oh, yes, you think you are independent of me now?' and cried." Teddy was hurt because he had never thought of such a thing. Poor Mrs. Kent, she must be very lonely. There's some strange barrier between her and her kind. I haven't been to the Tansy Patch for a long, long time. Once in the summer I went with Aunt Laura, who had heard Mrs. Kent was ill. Mrs. Kent was able to be up, and she talked to Aunt Laura, but she never spoke to me, only looked at me now and then with a queer, smoldering fire in her eyes. But when we rose to come away, she spoke once, and said, "'You are very tall. You will soon be a woman, and stealing some other woman's son from her.' Aunt Laura said, as we walked home, that Mrs. Kent had always been strange, but was growing stranger. "'Some people think her mind is affected,' she said. "'I don't think the trouble is her mind. She has a sick soul,' I said. "'Emily, dear, that is a dreadful thing to say.' said Aunt Laura. "'I don't see why. If bodies and minds can be sick, can't souls be, too? There are times when I feel as certain as if I had been told it that Mrs. Kent got some kind of terrible soul wound sometime, and it has never healed. I wish she didn't hate me. It hurts me to have Teddy's mother hate me. I don't know why this is. Dean is just as dear a friend as Teddy, yet I wouldn't care if all the rest of the priest clan hated me.' October 19, 19-something. 19 Ilsa and the other seven applicants were elected skulls and owls. I was black-beamed. We were notified to that effect Monday. 
"'Of course I know it was Evelyn Blake who did it. "'There's nobody else who would do it.' "'Ilsa was furious. "'She tore into pieces the notification of her election "'and sent the scraps back to the secretary "'with a scathing repudiation of the skull and owl and all its works. "'Evelyn met me in the cloakroom today "'and assured me that she had voted for both Ilsa and me. "'Has anyone been saying you did not?' "'I asked in my best Aunt Elizabethan manner. "'Yes, Ilsa has.' said Evelyn peevishly. She was very insolent to me about it. Do you want to know who I think put the black bean in? I looked Evelyn straight in the eyes. No, it is not necessary. I know who put it in, and I turned and left her. Most of the skulls and owls are very angry about it, especially the skulls. One or two owls, I have heard, hoot that it is a good pill for the Murray pride. And, of course, several seniors and juniors are not among the favoured nine, or either gloatingly rejoiced or odiously sympathetic. Aunt Ruth heard of it today and wanted to know why I was black beamed. New Moon, November 5th, 19-something Aunt Laura and I spent this afternoon, the one teaching, the other learning, a certain New Moon tradition to wit how to put pickles into glass jars and patterns we stowed away the whole big crock full of new pickles and when aunt elizabeth came to look them over she admitted she could not tell those which aunt laura had done from mine this evening was very delightful i had a good time with myself out in the garden it was lovely there tonight with the eerie loveliness of a fine november evening at sunset there had been a wild little shower of snow, but it had cleared off, leaving the world just lightly covered, and the air clear and tingling. Almost all the flowers, including my wonderful asters, which were a vision all through the fall, were frozen black two weeks ago, but the beds still had white drifts of alyssum all around them. A big smoky red hunter's moon was just rising above the treetops. There was a yellow-red glow in the west behind the white hills on which a few dark trees grew. The snow had banished all the strange deep sadness of a dead landscape on a late fall evening, and the slopes and meadows of old New Moon Farm were transformed into a wonderland in the faint early moonlight. The old house had a coating of sparkling snow on its roof. Its lighted windows glowed like jewels. It looked exactly like a picture on a Christmas card. There was just a suggestion of grey-blue chimney smoke over the kitchen. A nice reek of burning autumn leaves came from Cousin Jimmy's smouldering bonfires in the lane. My cats were there, too, stealthy, goblin-eyed, harmonizing with the hour and the place. The twilight, appropriately called the cat's light, is the only time when a cat really reveals himself. Saucy Sal was thin and gleaming, like the silvery ghost of a pussy. Daff was like a dark grey, skulking tiger. He certainly gives the world assurance of a cat. He doesn't condescend to everyone, and he never talks too much. They pounced at my feet and tore off and frisked back and rolled over each other, and were all so part of the night in the haunted place that they didn't disturb my thoughts at all. I walked up and down the paths and around the dial, and the summer-house in exhilaration. Air such as I breathed then always makes me a little drunk, I verily believe. I laughed at myself for feeling badly over not being elected an owl. An owl! Why, I felt like a young eagle soaring sunward. All the world was before me to see and learn, and I exulted in it. The future was mine, and the past, too. I felt as if I had been alive here always, as if I shared in all the loves and lives of the old house. I felt as if I would live always, always. I was sure of immortality then. I didn't just believe it, I felt it. Dean found me there. He was close beside me before I was aware of his presence. You are smiling, said Dean. I like to see a woman smiling to herself. Her thoughts must be innocent and pleasant. "'Has the day been kind to you, dear lady?' "'Very kind, and this evening is its best gift. "'I am so happy to-night, Dean. "'Just to be alive makes me happy. "'I feel as if I were driving a team of stars. "'I wish such a mood could last. "'I feel so sure of myself to-night, so sure of my future. "'I'm not afraid of anything. 
At life's banquet of success I may not be the guest of honor, but I'll be among those present. You looked like a seeress gazing into the future as I came down the walk, said Dean, standing here in the moonlight, white and wrapped. Your skin is like a narcissus petal. You could dare to hold a white rose against your face. Very few women can dare that. You aren't really very pretty, you know, Star, but your face makes people think of beautiful things, and that is a far rarer gift than mere beauty. I like Dean's compliments. They are always different from anybody else's, and I like to be called a woman. You'll make me vain, I said. Not with your sense of humor, said Dean. A woman with a sense of humor is never vain. The most malevolent bad fairy in the world couldn't bestow two such drawbacks on the same christened babe. Do you call a sense of humor a drawback? I asked. To be sure it is. A woman who has a sense of humor possesses no refuge from the merciless truth about herself. She cannot think herself misunderstood. She cannot revel in self-pity. She cannot comfortably damn anyone who differs from her. No, Emily, the woman with a sense of humor isn't to be envied. This view of it hadn't occurred to me. We sat down on the stone bench and thrashed it out. Dean is not going away this winter. I am glad. I would miss him horribly. If I can't have a good spiel with Dean at least once a fortnight, life seems faded. There's so much color in our talks, and then at times he can be so eloquently quiet. Part of the time tonight he was like that. We just sat there in the dream and dusk and quiet of the old garden, and heard each other's thoughts. Part of the time he told me tales of old lands and the gorgeous bazaars of the East. Part of the time he asked me about myself and my studies and my doings. I like a man who gives me a chance now and then to talk about myself. "'What have you been reading lately?' he asked. "'This afternoon, after I finished the pickles, I read several of Mrs. Browning's poems.' We have her in English this year, you know. My favorite poem is The Lay of the Brown Rosary, and I'm much more in sympathy with Honora than Mrs. Browning was. You would be, said Dean. That is because you're a creature of emotion yourself. You would barter heaven for love, just as Honora did. I will not love. To love is to be a slave, I said. And the minute I said it, I was ashamed of saying it, because I knew I had just said it to sound clever. I don't really believe that to love is to be a slave, not with Murray's anyhow. But Dean took me quite seriously. Well, one must be a slave to something in this kind of a world, he said. No one is free. Perhaps, after all, O oh daughter of the stars, love is the easiest master, easier than hate, or fear, or necessity, or ambition, or pride. By the way, how are you getting on with the love-making parts of your stories? You forget, I can't write stories just now. When I can, well, you know long ago you promised you would teach me how to make love artistically. I said it in a teasing way, just for a joke, but Dean seemed suddenly to become very much in earnest. Are you ready for the teaching? he said, bending forward. For one crazy moment I really thought he was going to kiss me. I drew back. I felt myself flushing. All at once I thought of Teddy. I didn't know what to say. I picked up Daff, buried my face in his beautiful fur, listened to his inner purring. At that opportune moment Aunt Elizabeth came to the front door and wanted to know if I had my rubbers on. I hadn't, so I went in, and Dean went home. I watched him from my window, limping down the lane. He seemed very lonely, and all at once I felt terribly sorry for him. When I'm with Dean he's such good company and we have such good times that I forget there must be another side to his life. I can feel only such a little corner of it. The rest must be very empty. November 14, 19 something. There's a fresh scandal about Emily of New Moon plus Ilsa of Blairwater. I have just had an unpleasant interview with Aunt Ruth and must write it all out to rid my soul of bitterness. Such a tempest in a teapot over nothing! But Ilsa and I do have the worst luck. I spent last Thursday evening with Ilsa studying our English literature together. We did an evening of honest work, and I left for home at nine. Ilsa came out to the gate with me. It was a soft, gentle, starry night. 
Elsa's new boarding house is the last house in Cardigan Street, and beyond it the road veers over the Little Creek Bridge into the park. We could see the park, dim and luring in the starlight. "'Let's go for a walk around it before you go home,' proposed Ilsa. We went. Of course I shouldn't have. I should have come right home to bed like any good consumptive. But I had just completed my autumnal course of cod-liver emulsion, ugh, and I thought I might defy the night air for once. So we went. And it was delightful. Away over the harbour we heard the windy music of the November hills, but among the trees of the park it was calm and still. We left the road and wandered up a little side trail through the spicy, fragrant evergreens on the hill. The firs and pines are always friendly, but they tell you no secrets as maples and poplars do. They never reveal their mysteries, never betray their long-guarded lore, and so, of course, they are more interesting than any other trees. The whole hillside was full of nice elfish sounds and cool, elusive night smells, balsam and frosted fern. We seemed to be in the very heart of a peaceful hush. The night put her arms around us like a mother and drew us together. We told each other everything. Of course, next day I repented me of this. Though Ilsa is a very satisfactory confidant and never betrays anything, even in her rages. But then it is not a Murray tradition to turn your soul inside out, even to your dearest friend. But darkness and fir balsam make people do such things. And we had lots of fun, too. Ilsa is such an exhilarating companion. You're never dull a moment in her company. Altogether we had a lovely walk and came out of the park feeling dearer to each other than ever, with another beautiful memory to share. Just at the bridge we met Teddy and Perry coming off the western road. They'd been out for a constitutional hike. It happened to be one of the times Ilsa and Perry are on speaking terms, so we all walked across the bridge together, and then they went their way and we went ours. I was in bed and asleep by ten o'clock. But somebody saw us walking across the bridge. Next day it was all through the school, day after that all through town, that Ilsa and I had been prowling in the park with Teddy Kent and Perry Miller till twelve o'clock at night. Aunt Ruth heard it, and summoned me to the bar of judgment to-night. I told her the whole story, but of course she didn't believe it. "'You know I was home at quarter to ten last Thursday night, Aunt Ruth,' I said. "'I suppose the time was exaggerated,' admitted Aunt Ruth. "'But there must have been something to start such a story. "'There's no smoke without some fire. "'Emily, you are treading in your mother's footsteps. "'Suppose we leave my mother out of the question. "'She's dead,' I said. "'The point is, Aunt Ruth, do you believe me or do you not?' "'I don't believe it was as bad as the report,' Aunt Ruth said reluctantly. "'But you've got yourself talked about.' "'Of course you must expect that as long as you run with Ilsa Burnley "'and off scourings of the gutter like Perry Miller. "'Andrew wanted you to go for a walk in the park last Friday evening, "'and you refused. I heard you. "'That would have been too respectable, of course.' "'Exactly,' I said. "'That was the very reason. "'There's no fun in anything that's too respectable.' "'Impertinence, miss, is not wit,' said Aunt Ruth. "'I didn't mean to be impertinent, but it does annoy me to have Andrew flung in my teeth like that. "'Andrew is going to be one of my problems. "'Dean thinks it's great fun. "'He knows what's in the wind as well as I do. "'He's always teasing me about my red-headed young man, my R-H-Y-M for short.' "'He's almost a rhyme,' said Dean. "'But never a poem,' said I. "'Certainly poor, good, dear Andrew is the stodgiest of prose.' Yet I'd like him well enough if the whole Murray clan weren't literally throwing him at my head. They want to get me safely engaged before I'm old enough to elope, and who's so safe as Andrew Murray? Oh, as Dean says, nobody is free, never, except just for a few brief moments now and then, when the flash comes, or when, as on my haystack night, the soul slips over into eternity for a little space. All the rest of our years were slaves to something, traditions, conventions, ambitions, relations. And sometimes, as tonight, I think that last is the hardest bondage of all. New Moon, December 3rd, 19-something. I'm here in my own dear room, with a fire in my little fireplace, by the grace of Aunt Elizabeth. 
An open fire is always lovely, but it's ten times lovelier on a stormy night. I watched the storm from my window until darkness fell. There's a singular charm in snow coming gently down in slanting lines against dark trees. I wrote a description of it in my jimmy book as I watched. A wind has come up since, and now my room is full of the soft, forlorn sigh of snow, driving through lofty dawn spruce wood. It is one of the loveliest sounds in the world. Some sounds are so exquisite, far more exquisite than anything seen. Daft's purr there on my rug, for instance, and the snap and crackle of the fire, and the squeaks and scrambles of mice that are having a jamboree behind the wainscot. I love to be alone in my room like this. I like to think even the mice are having a good time. And I get so much pleasure out of all my little belongings. They have a meaning for me they have for no one else. I have never for one moment felt at home in my room at Aunt Ruth's, but as soon as I came here I enter into my kingdom. I love to read here, dream here, sit by the window and shape some airy fancy into verse. I have been reading one of Father's books tonight. I always feel so beautifully near to Father when I read his books, as if I might suddenly look over my shoulder and see him. And so often I come across his penciled notes on the margin, and they seem like a message from him. The book I'm reading tonight is a wonderful one, wonderful in plot and conception, wonderful in its grasp of motives and passions. As I read it, I feel humbled and insignificant, which is good for me. I say to myself, you poor, pitiful little creature, did you ever imagine you could write? If so, your delusion is now stripped away from you forever, and you behold yourself in your naked paltriness. But I shall recover from this state of mind, and believe again that I can write a little, and go on cheerfully producing sketches and poems until I can do better. In another year and a half my promise to Aunt Elizabeth will be out, and I can write stories again. Meanwhile, patience, to be sure, I get a bit weary at times of saying patience and perseverance. It's hard not to see all at once the results of those estimable virtues. Sometimes I feel that I want to tear around and be as impatient as I like. But not tonight. Tonight I feel as contented as a cat on a rug. I would purr if I knew how. December 9, 19-something. This was Andrew Knight. He came all beautifully groomed up, as usual. Of course I like a boy who gets himself up well, but Andrew really carries it too far. He always seems as if he had just been starched and ironed, and was afraid to move or laugh, for fear he'd crack. When I come to think of it, I've never heard Andrew give a hearty laugh yet, and I know he never hunted pirate gold when he was a boy. But he's good and sensible and tidy, and his nails are always clean, and the bank manager thinks a great deal of him. And he likes cats, in their place. Oh, I don't deserve such a cousin. January 5th, 19-something Holidays are over. I had a beautiful two weeks at old white-hooded new moon. The day before Christmas I had five acceptances. I wonder I didn't go crazy. Three of them were from magazines who don't pay anything but subscriptions for contributions. But the others were accompanied by checks, one for two dollars for a poem, and one for ten dollars for my sands of time, which has been taken at last, my first story acceptance. Aunt Elizabeth looked at the checks and said wonderingly, Do you suppose the bank will really pay you money for those? She could hardly believe it, even after Cousin Jimmy took them to Shrewsbury and cashed them. Of course, the money goes to my Shrewsbury expenses, but I had no end of fun planning how I would have spent it if it had been free to spend. Perry's on the high school team, who will debate with the Queen's Academy boys in February. Good for Perry. It's a great honor to be chosen on that team. The debate is a yearly occurrence, and Queen's has won for three years. Elsa offered to coach Perry on the elocution of his speech, and she is taking no end of trouble with him, especially in preventing him from saying development when he means development. It's awfully good of her, for she really doesn't like him. I do hope Shrewsbury will win. We have the Idols of the King in English class this term. I like some things in them, but I detest Tennyson's Arthur. If I had been Guinevere, I'd have boxed his ears. 
but I wouldn't have been unfaithful to him for Lancelot, who was just as odious in a different way. As for Geraint, if I had been Enid, I'd have bitten him. These patient Griseldas deserve all they get. Lady Enid, if you had been a Murray of New Moon, you would have kept your husband in better order, and he would have liked you all the better for it. I read a story tonight. It ended unhappily. I was wretched until I had invented a happy ending for it. I shall always end my stories happily. I don't care whether it's true to life or not. It's true to life as it should be, and that's better truth than the other. Speaking of books, I read an old one of Aunt Ruth's the other day. The Children of the Abbey. The heroine fainted in every chapter, and cried quartz if anyone looked at her. But as for the trials and persecutions she underwent, in spite of her delicate frame, their name was Legion, and no fair maiden of these degenerate days could survive half of them, not even the newest of new women. I laughed over the book until I amazed Aunt Ruth, who thought it a very sad volume. It is the only novel in Aunt Ruth's house. One of her beaux gave it to her when she was young. It seems impossible to think that Aunt Ruth ever had beaux. Uncle Dutton seems an unreality, and even his picture on the crepe-draped easel in the parlor cannot convince me of his existence. January 21st, 19-something Friday night the debate between Shrewsbury High and Queen's came off. The Queen's boys came up, believing they were going to come, see, and conquer, and went home like the proverbial dogs with carefully adjusted tails. It was really Perry's speech that won the debate. He was a wonder. Even Aunt Ruth admitted for the first time that there was something in him. After it was over, he came rushing up to Ilsa and me in the corridor. "'Didn't I do great, Emily?' he demanded. "'I knew it was in me, but I didn't know if I could get it out. When I got up at first, I felt tongue-tied, and then I saw you looking at me, as if you said, "'You can, you must,' and I went ahead full steam. "'You won that debate, Emily.' Now wasn't that a nice thing to say before Ilsa, who had worked for hours with him and drilled and slaved? Never a word of tribute to her, everything to me, who hadn't done a thing except look interested. "'Perry, you're an ungrateful barbarian,' I said, and left him there with his jaw dropping. Ilsa was so furious she cried. She has never spoken to him since, and that ass of a Perry can't understand why.' What's she peeved about now? I thanked her for all her trouble at her last practice, he says. Certainly, Stovepipe Town has its limitations. February 2, 19-something Last night Mrs. Rogers invited Aunt Ruth and me to dinner to meet her sister and brother-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Herbert. Aunt Ruth had her Sunday scallops in her hair, and wore her brown velvet dress that reeked of mothballs, and her big oval brooch with Uncle Dutton's hair in it, and I put on my ashes of roses and Princess Mina's necklace, and went, quivering with excitement, for Mr. Herbert is a member of the Dominion Cabinet, and a man who stands in the presence of kings. He has a massive silver head and eyes that have looked into people's thoughts so long, that you have an uncanny feeling that they can see right into your soul and read motives you don't dare avow even to yourself. His face is a most interesting one. There's so much in it. All the varied experiences of his full, wonderful life had written it over. One could tell at sight that he was a born leader. Mrs. Rogers let me sit beside him at dinner. I was afraid to speak, afraid I'd say something stupid, afraid I'd make some ludicrous mistake so I just sat as quiet as a mouse and listened adoringly. Mrs. Rogers told me today that Mr. Herbert said after we had left, "'That little star-girl of New Moon is the best conversationalist of any girl of her age I ever met.' "'So even great statesmen put there, I would be horrid.' "'And he was splendid. He was wise and witty and humorous. I felt as if I were drinking in some rare, stimulating mental wine.' I forgot even Aunt Ruth's mothballs. What an event it is to meet such a man and take a peep through his wise eyes at the fascinating game of empire building. Perry went to the station today to get a glimpse of Mr. Herbert. Perry says he will be just as great a man some day. But no, Perry can, 
and I believe will, go far, climb high. But he will be only a successful politician, never a statesman. Ilsa flew into me when I said this. "'I hate Perry Miller,' she fumed, "'but I hate snobbery worse. "'You're a snob, Emily Starr. "'You think just because Perry comes from Stovepipe Town "'that he can never be a great man. "'If he had been one of the sacred Murrays, "'you would see no limits to his attainments.' "'I thought Ilsa was unfair, and I lifted my head haughtily. "'After all,' I said, "'there is a difference between New Moon and Stovepipe Town.' End of chapter 16